Uh, good morning. I think we need to start. Uh, um, we will start with Mr. Victor Mavindula. Uh, Honorable Pretenberg. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt the proceedings. Um, uh, I must draw to you. Honorable Pretenberg, can you come closer to the mic if you can, please? Sure. <coughs> I want to draw to your attention, uh, Mr. Chair, the fact that there are two people on the list, um, Mr. Shadrach Tabile and Ms. Ponacheha Mokhaladi, uh, who have some sort of connection with um, Ms. Mkubani. Uh, Mr. Tabile is acting pro bono for Ms. Mkubani in the matter. And uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Mukhaladi has worked and still works at the Public Protector's Office, was disciplined in the time that Ms. Mukhubani was a Public Protector. Uh, Ms. Mukhubani decided that the sanction should be dismissal. The matter was overturned in the Labour Court, and so she's still there. Um, I see a clear conflict in both of those matters, uh, an unavoidable and ineluctable conflict. And I believe that that conflict will place at risk this entire proceeding. And I'm sorry to only raise it now. Um, I, I expected um, Ms. Mugabani to recuse herself of her own volition and send somebody else. But the fact of the matter is now she's here. And, uh, and I, I, my concern is that the process, process will be tainted by that fact. Um, You understand that the perception of bias is sufficient. Real bias is not the requirement. And there, there can be no doubt that there exists, the, and there's an ineluctable conclusion to be drawn that, real, that, that at least a perception of bias exists. Uh, and so I, my concern is that the pro proceedings will be tainted and I, I, I'm not sure that we can proceed uh, constituted as we are now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I must say that uh, you have already raised the matter, and I have uh, before Honourable uh, Honourable response that uh, we have uh, asked uh, the parliamentary legal advisors to come and uh, assist us, but it will only be fair also to give Honourable uh, 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 an opportunity. But um, we have been told that uh, the legal advisors will be here in 30 minutes' time. Um, but it would be important to give Honorable Mkwaba an opportunity to say something. Is it a procedural point? Yeah, m maybe uh, just one additional point, Chair, if you'll allow me. Um, Honorable Breitenbach has spoken about a perception of bias, and that is most certainly one of the reasons why, in our view, they must be... Um, well, we, we can call it a recusal, but what we really ask for is that the FF just simply are represented by somebody else. But let me just add, before Ms. Mughwabane then responds, to, to say that the ordinary rules around whether somebody should be allowed to be involved in appointment processes also uh, turns very much on uh, the the relationship. And in the case of the first candidate, it's quite clear that because the candidate is acting in a pro bono manner, he firstly must believe in the case. So it's not as if you receive a brief which you really must then go and present to the best of your ability. If you, if you agree to act pro bono, there is a, uh, I want to say, a buy-in on your side. The second part is, however, that there's from that derived a clear benefit by Ms. Mughwabani because she doesn't have to pay fees. And in the circumstances, that in, 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 in our submission would mean that even if she says that I can, I can distance myself from that relationship for the purposes of these interviews and the recommendation, 
it's not as simple as it is. We must take they, they, we must take note of the fact that there's that relationship which is beneficial to Ms. Mughwabani and which in the circumstance, even if we all agree that she, she might be able to divorce herself of, of that relationship through this process, will render it fatally flawed. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Hon, Honorable Mkhwabani. You know, I wonder why, and um, the DA, I will say that, um, would raise something like this at the beginning of the proceedings uh, when I was going to declare. I think um, even in the last interviews of the Human Rights Commission, there were a number of candidates where one worked with very closely and others uh, knew from the province where I come from. And there was a upfront declaration, well, which uh, Brayton Bach and Horn, Honorable Horn and Honorable uh, Brayton Bach, um, they failed to declare their relations to some of the candidates um, which we interviewed for the Human Rights Commission. But then coming back to um, Advocate uh, Debeila, indeed I was going to declare, and being an advocate and a legally qualified person who believes in uh, the issue of uh, objectivity, that is not going to influence the processes in any way, because what they fail to indicate is that their Honorable Mileham in the Section 194 Committee failed to declare, because you just declare. I, there was a matter in the Western Cape High Court which was appearing before one judge who had a personal relationship or knew the evidence leader advocate Bauer and the person just informed us and indicated do we have any issues for us or for her to hear the matter and indeed believing in the objectivity or any person who's legally qualified that you would be objective, you will focus only on the matter, on the merits of the matter. But secondly, Chairperson, I am not the key decision maker in this particular matter. I am part of the collective, and the question is the decision which will be taken today, it will depend on who the majority wants to appoint um, in this particular process. And uh, secondly, Chairperson, the fact that Ms. Mukhaladi worked at the Office of the Public Protector underwent the process. Uh, it's similar as you being the head of an institution interviewing an internal candidate. And that particular internal candidate, you'll, knew, you'll know all their uh, work uh, ethics and processes, and you will ask accordingly to say, how would you deal with this situation when you are facing this? So I think it's uh, just a, a, an unnecessary issue for them to raise this up front as if I am the decision maker, I will force myself that you must appoint um, Advocate Tibela or you must not appoint or appoint Ms. Mukhalad. So I don't think, uh, Chair, it's, 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 it's fair for them just to, to raise that. And I mean, as the economic freedom fighters, we would want to participate in this process and would might want to make sure that whoever is appointed is somebody who would work for the institution, but for the people of South Africa and protect the people of South Africa. In case anything happens to the public protector, that person will be uh, qualified and everyone who is represented by us here in Parliament would know that a person we believe in and will protect the public is represented. So as you discussed earlier with me, and it is disingenuous for the, um, the, 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 the DA to just raise it, this matter now, because they should have raised it during our deliberations, a short list, to say, but advocate in Kwebana, because, I mean, we work as a team here and as a collective. Now why come back here and just raise this uh, issue last minute? So. I think it's, it's very uh, problematic, Chairperson. Um, um, and I think um, we will have to make sure that whatever decision we take, we take it objectively. We don't push our own agendas 
we just focus on the on the on the people of South Africa. Thanks, Chairperson. No, thank you very much, uh, Honourable Mukwebane. As I already indicated, I think it will be important that uh, this process is not tainted, uh, and we try to be as objective as we can. And that is why I, it's, we have asked for somebody who is uh, a legal advisor of Parliament to to come and say what legally the position is, and uh, after that we can proceed. Um, we have two choices um, which I would like the guidance of the House uh, on. The first one is that we take a risk of starting with the first, with the second person to be interviewed where there are no issues um, as we are waiting for the legal advisors to come or we don't start we wait for the legal advisors to come to advise us on the process as a whole. Um, with what has been raised, it's quite clear that we will have to revise our timelines. Uh, we might not finish at five, we might finish late, late at night, uh, depending on how um, soon the legal advisor comes and what is the advice that will be given to us, then we can have a discussion now based on that legal advice which we think would be objective because that person is not part of us now. So we, we, we know that uh, parliamentary legal advisors are not part of uh, committees, but, but it, we always have respect for, but we have respect for their op legal opinion, opinions. Will that be fine, uh, Honorable? Mola, Honorable Janji, Honorable Ramulubeng, Honorable Jale, in that order. No, thanks very much. And uh, I think uh, let's uh, appreciate that this matter has been brought into our attention. Uh, although one would have preferred that it is actually raised in the close committee meeting, which started at half eight. Now we have, uh, we are pleading on the time that we could have used for other purposes. But I think the directive we are giving uh, is, is, is quite uh, uh, helping in that we need to determine this thing very fast, but we need to be cautious of time as well. So I think it is very important uh, that we start if number two is ready. We can start with them, which legal um, services uh, unit is attending to this matter, as you suggest. And after having been given the uh, legal advice from the Parliament uh, Legal Unit, we are able to discuss and give a way forward as the committee then. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Chancha. Gosh, without any waste of time, Honorable Ngola has uh, covered me uh, sufficiently at this point that we should immediately call in candidate number two, go through that, and by the time we finish, we would have the legal advisor here, which would assist us with number one and number three, in any case. And having listened to Honorable Breitenbach, Honorable Horn, and Advocate Mkwebane, then we reserve the committee deliberations after we have listened to the legal advisor, then we come in, so that we don't waste the, uh, uh, the time in that regard. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Thanks, Chair. I think I would um, echo the very same sentiments by Honorable Nola and Janji um, on us proceeding with the second candidate, because I would also I also wanted to speak on the matters that are brought. So I'd agree with the suggestion that Honorable Janji has made that we wait for the legal rep of Parliament to come in, and after we've heard that then as the committee we can deliberate on the matter. Because I also do agree that we should have used that 30 minutes that we had as the committee to also interrogate this matter if it was brought. So let's not waste time and proceed with candidate number two. Thanks, Chair. Honorable Jaila, then Honorable Breitenbach. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for my comments. 
colleagues. But I only have a question. Thank you. Thank you very much. I only have a, a question, mm -hmm. Chair, uh, that the, the advice that we're going to get uh, from the legal advisor uh, this morning, uh, I want to find out that is it going to cover even, it, 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 it will also give us the understanding of going forward in future. Because uh, if you have to consider the life of what advocate Kebani on, on these issues, so um, she has been involved with lots of people considering the kind of work that she was doing. Uh, I understand this one is in another level, but uh, there will be lots of people that will be coming in this committee, in front of the committee, as, as we continue in, fu uh, for, in future activities of the committee and her being part of this committee. Um, I want to just to find out that uh, it will be the story of the future also. That, uh, because for me, just to declare and, and make everybody aware like as we normally do, it also covers that, but as we say, we will hear also the advice. But now, um, that issue, it should also cover the future activities and the life of uh, Advocate Mkwebani as part of the committee, in terms of her having to, she's been working with a lot of people because of another life, her other life of work. Thank you, Chair. Just wanted to find out. Thank you very much, Honorable President. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, I'm going to confine myself to the immediate issue today. Um, Chair, I don't believe that it should be wise, and it's our submission that it's not wise, to proceed with any interviews until we've cleared up the matter. Because if there is a bias, if there is a perception of bias, and there must be under these circumstances, then that bias taints the entire process. Also, the interviews that follow, that are not concerning the two individuals already mentioned, because the bias spreads to everybody, not some, some for, some against. Uh, the bias exists. The process cannot proceed in the face of the bias. That's the problem. And I understand the issue, and I understand the time issue. And it really is a pity that we have to deal with this under these circumstances while people are waiting to be interviewed. But this process is a serious process, Chair, and a lot of money has been spent on it. And to, to have it set aside uh, on the basis of something that we were aware of, that we could have dealt with, and we didn't, uh, is going to be a problem. So uh, it's our view that we should not proceed to until we've cleared up the matter. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Jale, with respect to your question, uh, I mean, whatever advice we get from the legal services, it forms part of the guidance. But um, facts are not always the same. Um, but it does assist to, it, it serves as a point of reference continuously. Um, so it's always important to um, for, for that particular purpose. We, I think other than that, we'll be speculating. Uh, maybe next time, uh, Honorable Mkwebana will be in the Portfolio Committee of Sports. So we don't know. Parliament is coming to an end. So I think let's just keep it that uh, it's an important information that, we, that always guides committees. The, 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 the legal opinions are, are filed uh, to guide our it's a procedural advice that is given on a particular matter. But any matter related to that, then we, we, uh, even the next committee will make reference to that uh, particular committee. Uh, members, there the, are just these two views, uh, but the majority feels that we can start with the first first uh, with the second person um, we have had what honorable Bredenbach is raising 
which is a, which is a, which is a legal matter that uh, uh, the perception of bias can taint every 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 the, the whole process. Uh, I want to bring it to your attention that uh, if members feel that we still continue, but we should know that the letter was raised. Please raise your hand so that uh, So, members, do we, do we proceed with the second one or do we wait for the legal opinion? I think it must be clear so that it's not it's, it's minuted. Honorable Janji? No, Chair, I think uh, we have listened to the last part of Honorable Brayton, but he's raising a specific issue, and, and we have. Well, you, you can't uh, have a specific issue that becomes a general issue. Uh, and, and so I, want, I would suggest that we proceed with number two. Um, we will come back when we deliberate and, and, and respond to all of those issues. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Chair, I would say the reasonable possibility of bias is not COVID-19 does not just get transmitted because people were seated in the same place. I mean, it's an unfair argument to say because of uh, Mohaladi and Tebeila, now everyone else uh, must be included. The last we checked when the matter was submitted to us, it specifically spoke about, spoke about Mohaladi and, uh, and Tebeila. Hence, we even made submissions to the committee that let's rather take the second one so that we deal with this matter because the matter is specific to two candidates. Now it's, it's, it's reasonable and fair to say now the entire process uh, uh, is, is, is tended with bias. Uh, we have, we've got eight candidates here. So we, we need to proceed with the second candidate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, the majority of you says we need to proceed. Um, but I think it will be fair, uh, committee secretaries, to inform all the candidates that we will be running a little bit late, including the first one that is going to come in. We will apologize to, to him. Uh, Honorable Pretema, are you still on the same matter? Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, we note the decision of the committee to proceed in the face of uh, our advice that it's dangerous to do so, and that the process is almost certainly going to be compromised. Um, and that is the view of the Democratic Alliance. We will proceed in order to not disrupt the matter further. We do so under protest. And again, we repeat our advice that the process is going to be compromised. And we want that to be very clear, and we want the record to show that we have argued in the committee that the process is fatally flawed if we proceed. And if and we, we, we proceed here under protest. I think uh, the views of the Democratic Alliance as espoused by yourself will be noted and minuted. Uh, can we invite the, sec the second uh, interviewer, interviewee? Uh, but can we also alert the other ones that we are running behind? Okay. <coughs> yeah. 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 Oh, it on. Just keep it on. Good morning, Mr. Mabidula. Good morning. Thank you. Is that the correct pronunciation? 
Yes, my Mr. Mavidula. Mavidula. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. you. Let me start by sincerely apologizing to you. Um, firstly, you knew yourself to be number two, and we have just called you, but we also took more than more time to call you than you expected. Uh, we would like to apologize. Certain processes beyond our control have to be dealt with. Thank you. Um, maybe you can have a sip of water so that uh, you, as, a, as, a, as a token of our apology. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. This is the Portfolio Committee of Justice and Correctional Services. You are being interviewed for the position of Deputy Public Protector of the Republic of South Africa. Uh, can you, in five minutes, uh, tell us who you are, your beliefs, and why you are the right person to be a pa deputy public protector? Thank you very much, Chairperson and the honorable members. Uh, maybe if I can just give you a slight background of where I come from. I was born in a village called Chitarreke, somewhere in the northern province, in, in Limbobo a rural village. So I was born there and my umbilical cord was buried there. I grew up in a, I was born in a family where my mother and my father was, were separated when I was only six. I grew up with my stepmother and I went through a lot as a young boy. I grew as a head boy looking after cattle and, uh, and goats and uh, then I passed my, 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 my primary education in the village, and then I went to another village where my father and my mother were staying. Then I went to stay with my mother, who believed much in education. She was also always encouraging me to focus. All of us, anyway, we, are, we were five. We are five in my, from my mother, my late mother, by the way. Then she encouraged me to go to school. She was very much, she believed in, edu she believed in education. So I went to do my high primary education in another primary school, high primary school called Gindigindi. Then I went to Tejinesen High School. From there, I went to, to I went to pass my matric at from Papuri High School. Then I went to the University of Venda in 1990, 1995. I passed my matric in 1994. Then I went to the University of Venda in 1995. Uh, she. Said the, her whole salary for that uh, particular, for me to register at the University of Venda in 1995. Unfortunately, in 1996, she didn't have money to pay for my studies to take me back to university. I was a dropout. I had to come to Johannesburg, or I had to go to Johannesburg to look for a job. I found a job as an agent. I was going around the street of Soweto in 1996 selling. Uh, products, hair products, skin products, and all those kind of things. Uh, from there, I was always eager to learn. I was writing letters, letters to different people whom I thought maybe they could sponsor me or sponsor my education. I was, I was lucky to find someone who then sponsored my education. <coughs> he asked me to choose the university that I can start from. Then I chose the University of Deben Westfield. I went to the to, to University of Durban Westville in 1997. When I was at the University of Durban Westville, he used to pay for my studies for my everything at the beginning of the of the year. He paid my studies. However, I I was I, I could see other students who face who were facing financial exclusion. Then that on its own then triggered my my my, my interest to fight for those who cannot pay. Then that developed a lot of interest, and then I joined the relevant uh, student formation to make sure that we advance or broaden the access to education. Uh, I can say that maybe unlike Tinsualo, at that time it was very difficult to get to, to, to study at the university because if you don't have money, you could not study. But those who are born now, they are very lucky that the, we have NEFSAs that is very broad, that we have NEFSAs that is uh, 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 accepting those who are coming from disadvantaged background. So as a result of that, I, I, I was not there. I, I mean, at that time, those opportunities were not there. 
Then I was forced to join the, 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 those who, were, who didn't have money. So after that, I, I then, uh, after completing my studies, I went to, to work with him for a little bit. But because I wanted to be independent, I decided again to leave him and uh, look for, to, 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 to leave uh, and apply for articles. Then I managed to get article of clerkship from Flasmanser Tennis. After completing my article of clerkship, there were some offers that I can stay, but I decided that no, I can't stay because I was already having offer from IPID. I joined the IPID. I was working for IPID. I was responsible for investigation. I was the assistant provincial head there, responsible for investigation, day-to-day -day running of the of the office, assisting the provincial head. Uh, and then from there, I joined the Commission for Gender Equality. Uh, with the Commission for Gender Equality in Free State, I was still re responsible for the running of the office, managing staff members, and also executing the mandate of the Commission in the Free State province. I was fortunate again to be appointed within six months to join the Commission at the head office uh, in 1997. I joined the com in, sorry in 2007. I joined the Commission for Gender Equality at the head office as a senior complaints officer. Within six months again, uh, I was appointed to act as a head of legal department. When I was head of legal department, I was responsible for all the provincial offices with regard to the legal work, and the, the legal officers from provinces were reporting to the to the provincial coordinators. But on legal issues, they were reporting to me. We had what we call dual reporting. So administratively, it will be to the uh, to the provincial coordinator, and then legally will be to me. So with the Commission for Gender Equality, I was always trying to find a way. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, can you confirm your disclosure made in the questionnaire? Yes, I confirm. Is there anything you think that we should know that you did not disclose there? Nothing. You are comfortable with I'm it? comfortable. Thank you very much. Uh, members, uh, over to you. Uh, each member would have six minutes to interact with you. Uh, it's a question and answer session. They would like to know you better. Honorable Mola. Uh, well, thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, Mr. Ma. <laughs> Mr. Victor. Victor, yes. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Chair, I, I've, I've got I, two, two, three questions. I won't, I won't take too much time. What is your understanding of a fit and a proper person? And uh, how would you then convince this committee that you are indeed a fit and a proper person? When we talk about a fit and proper person, we, live, we need to look at the person's moral values and also professional, uh, 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 professionalism from that person and also qualifications. So those are the, 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 the things that those are the things that we need to consider when we want to determine as to whether this individual is fit and proper. So the fitness of the individual, we have to look at what, who is this person within the community. Are you somebody that when we talk about the public protector, people will be able to say, yeah, this is our stupid public protector. Your values, what do you believe in? So those are that is that is very important to me. And qualification, obviously, professionalism. Yeah, those are the values that have to determine whether this person is suitable or not. Okay. Uh, before you were taken to the interviews, the candidates were subjected to a screening process. Do you think that it is a necessary process, particularly for the benefit of the, how is it important that a person before getting gets appointed to the public protector of South Africa must run through a security uh, clearance process. Uh, I think that is very important because you, the, 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 the country, when you say you have recommended somebody, you have to be sure that this person 
it's a person that the pe uh, people of South Africa will be, will be living. So you, 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 without running, the, checking the background of that person, we always say that sometimes, uh, if you look at what we have, we are doing with regard to the issue of gender-based violence, there are so many people who abuse us, and we don't have a specific register except for education for education, educators. But I think we should have a mechanism to to check to check the background of the people that we deploy, especially in the institution of. The, the, those, those institutions that have to hold others accountable. Because one thing for sure, for me to say to somebody, don't do this, or hold somebody accountable, I must also be in a, a, a person with a person of integrity. So without that, you can't. You can't have the zeal to tell somebody, don't do this, if yourself, you are compromised. So it's important that the parliament must do the background check. Okay. The constitution requires that uh, the, the office of the public protector and, and by extension, the deputy power protector must be independent and impartial. Uh, why, why do you think this, these two features are very important for the execution of the public protector's role? Because if you are not independent, you are likely to prejudice a lot of people that you might be in investigation or be influenced. So there is a need for one to be independent so that you are in the position to apply your mind without any external influence. Okay, sure. I think the change of Thank you. Thank you very much. Honorable Ramuluben, Honorable Jale. Thanks, Chair. Um, good morning. Mr. Victor, I will also stick to your name. Uh, Thank you. Your surname, Mavindula. Mavindula, yes. Okay. Uh, I'm not good with vendors, so I will not even attempt. Um, I hope you, you are okay. Thank you. I would have expected you when you were um, taking us through um, the five minutes that Chair would have given you to introduce yourself to even expand further um, on yourself, but it's, it's, it's okay. Um, my name is Khomotu um, Ramulube. I'm a member of the Portfolio Committee. In your, in your thinking or analysis, um, are you able to identify some of innovative initiatives that the public protector would have done um, to better deliver on its mandate or any achievements or that would you would refer them as successes that the office would have been able to carry through? Uh, the, the, the space of human rights or the space where our chapter nines are operating I, I think looking at the resources that uh, were being allocated, uh, there is a, a need to collaborate so that we, we, we don't necessarily duplicate what we are doing as the Chapter 9 institutions. So I, I think we might be, we are, we are not creating a synergy between the, be, amongst this chapter and institution, for example, sometimes you find that somebody is complaining about a matter that was supposed to be handled by the public protector or by the Human Rights Commission. You find that we are, we are, uh, others, we are, we are handling that together and we are not referring. So I think the strength, the, 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 what is missing amongst the chapter and institution is the collaboration in terms of investigating so that we don't duplicate our investigation. I think that is, that is not uh, enough to me. And I believe that if I'm given opportunity, that is the area that I will look at. And also the issue of outreach and also using the mandate, the, 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 the mediation process, because I understand there is a need to investigate, but where we can resolve complaints or cases through mediation, let us do so. It has been proven that mediation is the most effective process to resolve dispute than investigation, because with the mediation, you are bringing the parties that are not uh, talking to each other. You are bringing them together to find a solution. And as a mediator, a qualified mediator, uh, I think I do have the skills to bring those people together. I've done that before uh, with the Emeritus Commission where I am today. Whilst you are at it, because of your expantiating on certain areas that you would do if appointed, what, 
if you were to be appointed a deputy public protector, um, how will you inspire confidence internally and externally, bearing in mind that also you would have spoken on your mediation skills and some areas that you would do if appointed? Uh, I, I have been, I was appointed, I think, as, as, a, as a provincial manager for the Commission in 2012. And since then, I managed to rally, to rally all staff members behind the objective of the Human Rights Commission in the province. So internally, there is a need, if you are a leader, to make sure that you are accessible. Be the, 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 the person whom people, your staff member or your colleagues can confide on you. They must feel free to tell, them, to tell you how they feel and what, you want to do, what, what they want you to do. Because the most important thing is that uh, when people are at work, it's not only about them report coming to the office and go. You need to know your team. You need to know if Victor is not well. You, know, you need to know if you're, you're one of your team members is not doing well so that you can engage. So I'm that kind of person who, done, who I don't believe on being just a manager. I also put that in my mind that I'm managing people. That's why in my office we are very few, but we, are, we manage to shake the province. So externally... It's a matter of behaving well. You can't, you can't just be a provincial manager of the Human Rights Commission and what you do outside the office is opposite of what you do at the work. We represent this institution even outside our workplace. That is how people will have confidence on you. So if you always think that you are a provincial manager or you are a deputy public protector in the office and when you go out, your people find you doing something that is opposite, to what you are, you, you, what, to, to your work, to, to what you do at work, they will never have trust on you. So the best way is to do things that are appropriate, or even when, when you are outside the office. How would you address a situation when an organ of state ignores or refuses to implement their medial action? Uh, from the public protector point of view, we have a judgment already that uh, if you receive the, the remedial action recommendations from the public protector and you don't do anything, those, those, you can take the report to review, but if you don't, it's binding. So obviously if we realize that, okay, they are binding and you are not doing anything, we'll have to take you to court to enforce those recommendations. So we, we will have to approach the court. What would you think would be the best ideal contribution of the public protector to ensure good governance? The what? Sorry. What do you think would be the best contribution of the public protector to ensure good, gov good governance? Uh, for, for, for the public protector to ensure good governance, yes, we can do that through investigation. There's no, no, no problem with that. But we must also try to workshop our, 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 our public office bearers, uh, and also the, the, the functionaries within the departments to understand, because it's not a matter, I, I don't enjoy just to come to somebody and hold that person accountable. Education, instilling discipline amongst the, 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 the function, functionaries, and also making sure that when you are, you, are, you, are, you are a manager, you also create programs that outreach programs or workshop, you can run workshops with them and all those things. But what is what the most important thing is that the issue of good governance, we might have people who occupy high position, but they don't understand, and we can workshop them through the outreach program Thank as a contribution from our side. Thank you very much. Uh, the next uh, person, Honorable Masako Chale. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Good morning, uh, Mr. Victor. Thank you. I think um, I will be comfortable with that. Your voice is too soft. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, without waste of time, I only have five minutes. My question to you this morning is that um, you'll be working with the public protector as a deputy, and you'll be getting instructions from her. Uh, at some point, there might be uh, a time where you feel that you really feel that the instruction does not sit well. 
what would be your 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 handling your 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 your, your way of handling that relationship between yourself and the, the, the public protector? Uh, one thing for sure is that uh, if I'm appointed, I will be a deputy, not a public protector. Yes. And what is important is that you, you need to understand when we talk about the public protector, it's an individual, unlike at that Chapter 9 institution. So you go there with the mentality that you have your own vision, but she has her own vision, and that is her office. So which means that you must go there with the idea of supporting the public protector. If you go there thinking that you're going to change or to fix her, it won't work because it will collapse the office. So whenever you feel that there's something that has not been done or something that it does not sit well with you, it will be two of you who are senior in the office. Create a, 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 a relationship that you will be in the position even to express yourself without offending her. Because the most important thing is that you don't have to offend somebody, even if you are raising as genuine issues. But if you offend somebody, there can be resistance and your idea can be rejected. But if you raise those issues properly, engage. If it need be, even if, if you feel that this might offend her, even if you, re, you, you, you engage her informally, that this is what I was thinking. Don't, 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 be, impo don't impose as if you are the public protector or undermine her. You have to respect her. That's the key point. Thank you very much. Uh, the second question, you've been given questions uh, by, by the office to answer you have identified some of the key challenges uh, according to the question. And uh, I just want you to elaborate on those issues that you have mentioned here, that you think those are the challenges uh, in relation with the work that you will be doing in the Office of the Public Protector. Okay. The biggest challenge that we are facing as a country is a corruption. And uh, you will agree with me that corruption, as much as we, 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 we understand that it's wrong, we must also understand, go further than that, to think about the impact of corruption on everything that we are doing. No matter how the government can be willing to deliver for our people, but if we still have element of corruption, the money that is allocated to the department, to our people, will not reach our people. So the best way, if we strengthen the agencies that are fighting corruption, including the public protector, as we, we have the, 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 the NDP chapter 14 that's talking about corruption, how we can deal with the corruption. So if we want to achieve the, 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 the goals in terms of NDP, it means that we need to pop out more resources to those institutions, including, including the public protector, because that is where we are lacking. And also try by all means to, to train, because one of, I think one of the challenges with the public protector is the issue of lack of uh, training or lack of capacity dealing with the uh, 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 <coughs> it's just running out of me, but uh, the, the issue of training our, our investigators is very crucial and issue of resources. From there, you will find it's so painful sometimes when you visit the village, you find that there's a school or a clinic that is not completed. I'm coming from, a, from Bulogwane where I'm, we, have a, we have a situation just outside Bulogwane Mangwe where the, 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 the police station is not completed. One day we're visiting the police station and I find an investigating officer sitting, having docket on top of the microwave. But the police station is there. It has been there for more than five, five years. It has not been completed. But we believe that the government is willing to resolve those issues. But individuals might be the problem. And we must ask ourselves, even the issue of encouraging, we must be patriot. If I'm given money that should deliver water to the people of Mulejin, uh, Pulukwane, why should I direct that money to my pocket? Why should I feel that I must get something? So those are the challenges that we are facing. If we can deal with the corruption, you'll find our people accessing all these other socio-economic rights that we are talking about. You will find the reduction of protest, as I've mentioned there. It means that the protests that we are having 
are also created because people are not getting service. And also the issue of non-responsive. We have never bothered ourselves as a country that if there is a community that is protesting, do we even think of going to the community and check how many times they've approached the, the relevant authority with no answers? What is difficult if, for example, people say, we want water, why don't we indicate if we don't have budget for that year? then we budget for that project in the next, for the next financial year. But our, 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 our situ the situation that we are facing is that we will find the community crying, waiting for response for a long, long time. That's why sometimes we find them blocking the road unnecessarily. Yes, uh, in your answer on the issue of corruption, obviously, Sorry, you will be thank you very much. The year is cut. Thank you. Honourable Yeah, thank you, Jay. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> I want to first uh, go back to one of your answers um, to a previous question and ask you just to explain to us as a committee what you meant by factionalism within departments. Uh, sir, I think you misunderstood my answer, Honorable. I said functionaries in the department. There are people we, we have. <laughs> my apologies. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay. Let me then go to your questionnaire um, and specifically about your work as the provincial manager of the Human Rights Commission there on page 11, 12 onwards. I don't know whether you have it in front of you. Um, and say that I form a distinct sense that when it comes to matters, let's say bread and butter matters, and where you, you're involved in mediation, that you've been fairly effective. But what I want to touch base with you is towards the latter part of your, your presentation there, you've talked about the hearings you've conducted. Uh, one in 2022 20, regarding water, in 2016 regarding uh, learning materials, and in 2023 regarding social social cohesion. But your your presentation in that re uh, respect lacks information about the impact and the outcomes. Can you address that? Thank you very much. With regard to the hearing. I must say to you that uh, with our office, very much effective. I, I, I remember, me, just to give an example, during the hearing with regard to uh, water efficiency in the, in the province, in Limpopo, just last year, the report that we have issued recently, uh, while we were sitting in the, in, the, in, the, in the hearing, one of the community members raised the issue of a certain area in outside Pulukwan that did not have water. And what I did immediately, because I realized that this is, this is very serious and it cannot wait, I immediately picked up a, call, a, a, a phone and called the municipality manager just to find out if they cannot deliver water immediately. I can tell you within 24 hours I received a call from the person who complained to me that water is there. So the, the diplomatic approach that I have used, not being arrogant, just polite and indicate to the, to the person in charge. And even the mayor confirmed with me that we are delivering water, that we have a schedule to deliver water in those places. Because there are situations where we understand that some of the, 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 access, uh, some of the access to this rise uh, cannot be done immediately. For example, intervention to deliver tank, uh, water with tanks is one of the interventions before they can put the infrastructure to have pipe water, but we use the tanks. So to me, it was successful. During one of the hearings on bullying, we discovered that there, is a, there was a teacher who was sleeping with the, with the learner. And what we did, what, what, what we did was to work, I, I was working directly with the police. And I got the teacher arrested. I don't want to mention the details, but the teacher was arrested because of the Human Rights Commission. Because I engage with all the stakeholders. When we deal with the issues, I don't just engage with the, with, 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 with the complainant and with the, uh, going to de develop a report. I don't know how the report was going to assist me because the learner was raped and frustrated and the, the evidence was there. I had to have a meeting with detectives in my office that, guys, this is the case, what we do. 
Elena had been raped. Listen to these voice messages. Look at these voice mail, uh, at these messages. The evidence is there. And uh, I was so fortunate that within three days, then the detec detective called me, Victor, we are going to arrest. I said, don't rush, but if you have evidence on your own, because they must also investigate on their own. We don't tell them what to do. We give them evidence, then they will investigate further and then uh, uh, arrest the individual. Yeah. Okay. Let, let me rephrase. A, a, a lot can be said for, for those involved in both the Human Rights Commission and the Public Protector for dealing very hands-on with immediate issues. What I'm looking for is any investigations in which you have been involved in respect of broader issues that can't just be fixed by let's say, uh, talking to somebody to go and deliver water to a specific community immediately. But water provision, for example, is a broader issue. What, what role and what outcomes have you produced in respect of larger investigations rather than dealing with individual specific problems? Uh, when, when, when we conducted the hearing on access to healthcare services in the province, it was, I think it was back then in 2018. We engaged with the, it was the issue was the shortage of ambulances in Limpopo. When I'm talking to you right now, the department have procured 500 ambulances in Limpopo. Simple because our, 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 our intervention, this is what we do at the Emirates Commission. When we are investigating the, 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 the complaints that we want to find the quick, uh, a response or a quick outcome. We also identify the trend. Like, for example, if I can talk about the issue of water and sanitation in the, pro in the province, the trend. So, what we do when we conduct a hearing, a hearing is part of investigation that will lead up into issue of a report. We the recommendation. And then you know patients in the province, municipalities. Most of the municipalities have, 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 they, have, they, have they submitted their plans and we are going through those plans. But what I must say to you is that yes, maybe maybe what I can just add from what I'm saying. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Honorable Pretteba. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Good morning, Mr. Mavidula, did I get that right? Yeah, you got it right. Thank yeah. you. Good morning to you. Um, I just need you to clear up something for me. Um, you say that your tertiary education you studied at the University of KwaZulu Natal and you did a BPROC and a postgraduate LLB. Yes. And you hold both those degrees. Yes, I do have both those. And that you studied there from 19. 1997 to 2001. Yes. Is that correct? 2002. If you check there. No, it says 2001. Would you like to? It's two like? LLB. Yes. From 2000 and 1997. B Pro degree. Yes. Four years and one year LLB. How do you do an LLB? Postgraduate LLB in one year. Uh, that was the old setup. If you re you remember, there was a restructuring of the Lord degree qualifications before they introduced the new LLB. We it's used to have... LLB in my experience, I also have one, it's a two-year degree. No, no, in the previously, if you have done B juris, you were do, hey, if you have done B juris, you are going to do two-year LLB. But if you have BPROC, you do one year. LLB. I take note of your university. Yeah, it's okay. an anomaly here, degree. Okay. Uh, there's been a history at the Office of the Public Protector uh, of, uh, let's say, marginalizing the Deputy Public Protector. Uh, if that were to happen, if you were appointed, how would you deal with that situation? Uh, I don't know how it will happen, but let me just guess. But uh, the, this, this is the issue. I think you will agree with me. Those who have been in the managerial position. Areas we have limited time. Yeah. 
the, the issue is that if you get there and you understand your role as deputy public protector, uh, you, you have to make sure that you go in the heart of the public protector, allocate your work to do. Like in any other office, sometimes people by, be, are being bypassed. You find that you have a, a deputy, but you are giving instruction to the person lower than your deputy because you know that you don't get it. Whatever that she will tell me to do, I must excel to me to get more work from her. But if I don't use results, she won't give me anything to do. Thank you. I'm done, Mr. Chair. <coughs> Thank you very much, Honorable Mkwebana. Mr. Mabidula, uh, ah. um, yes, uh, you have worked with the Human Rights Commission for so many years. Okay, to correct, I also did BPROC, but University of Limpopo demanded, even if you've done BPROC, you do LLB for two years not one year, even if you have uh, be broke, yeah. Um, you have shown successes, and um, it's so interesting to hear you, the impact you've made um, in Limpopo regarding the issue of access to water and, and other service delivery related issues. But then now, um, there's still a lot of challenges in Limpopo, especially in the health sector, the way the hospital services <laughs> Some uh, hospitals in uh, next to Toyando, uh, you'll know their names, where there's no, uh, people are still sleeping on the floor, there's no provision of any um, bedding and uh, food, the quality and everything. Um, maybe in your answer you can indicate how many um, staff members do you have in the office and as well the, whether you have any backlogs in your office and uh, how are you dealing with those to make sure that your impact is felt in, 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 in Lipopo? Uh, yes, I, I agree with you, Honorable, that we still have, we have a lot of challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, with those challenges uh, that we are facing uh, uh, as a province, and the, in relation to the mandate of the Emeritus Commission, I must say to you that we, we, are, we are moving as the Emeritus Commission, and sometimes we do take action where it's needed. I can also indicate to you that uh, we, we, we hold uh, 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 each one from the Department of, uh, of, 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 of Health. I do visit hospitals myself, and more especially when there's a, there are crises, I do go to the hospital. But there are issues that we need to conscientize our people about. Uh, if you go to the hospital and find that the hospital is dead and there's a paper that is on the floor, I, I, I don't want to, to, to protect anyone, but we must feel the sense of ownership as, as, as South Africans, all of us. Let us be patriot. If we understand that indeed there is the, the hospital is dead and I'm being paid to clean the hospital, so we, we, we need to look at those issues. Okay. How do we conscientize our people to rally behind the government to deliver the service that they are supposed that is supposed to deliver? All right. How many officials and uh, how is your structure? I've Just got, in short. Yeah. I've got uh, this myself and then there will be senior legal officer and two legal officers and the advo uh, advocates officer with the human rights officer and, uh, and, and uh, a human rights monitor. And then we have intake officer. We are 11 in number. And you are the final decision maker. I am the final decision maker and since I occupy the, the position. You are the, you are the uh, chairperson of the Human Rights Commission in Limpopo. Exactly. I know, yeah. So how would you deal with the, um, the um, investigator in your office who investigate a matter or there's a supervisor of that investigator they do a shoddy work um, they are not uh, properly investigating and um, they are drafting a report in case of investigation that report the quality is poor they then submit the report for you to sign possibly the report which you sign and you sign that report and then you discover later that that report um, didn't consider information from the state institution. And worse, when you are taken to court, the very same supervisor is not even availing all the records in terms of uh, Rule 53 to the court. And at the end of the day, 
it's your signature, which is on the. How would you deal with that particular supervisor? I, I, I must be honest with you. I, I think there I will be very negligent because each and every report that comes from my office, I go through each and every report and read. I am that kind of person who work even during the weekend. Every weekend since I started my career, I'm in the office. So I don't believe that I should sign a report without going through it. Let's say you read everything, some information is hidden from you. Then uh, I will have to bite the bullet. I will have to take the kick. And uh, what yeah. do you do with that particular official? Obviously, I would have to look at whether it was a deliberate move to conceal the information from me or it was a human error. If it was a human error, of, of course, I, will, I might end up giving that person a warning that you must not do this again. But if it was a deliberate move, I'm very much well conversed, I'm well conversant with the labor issues and I know how to take action. And then how would you deal with an, uh, the very same supervisor who would uh, ignore a court order against the Human Rights Commission? A, a supervisor will ignore the... Let's say there's a, a, a matter you did and the court found that um, uh, you, should, you should have conducted an investigation in a certain way and then that uh, court order is issued, you should be then conducting the investigation, possibly de novo, but that official uh, is given that to do the matter, they just ignore the court order. I, I think that it will, it will be an indication that there's a huge problem in that office if we get to that level. Uh, I don't want to preempt what will happen, but the effect of the matter is that we need to, there is a, what we call performance management in any organization. If it needs me to push you through performance management system, I'll put you through performance management system, but the effect of the matter is that at the end much. I will be responsible. Thank you as very a, much. As a, as a manager. Uh, Honorable Lebold Tuchan. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, good morning, Mr. Mavin Dula, if the interpreter pronounced it correctly. I'm Wilma Neo Druchen, and I use South African Sign Language. Voicing for me is my sign language interpreter, Trudy. Uh, one question with regards to, you know, in the light of your experience in IPERD and the Gender Commission, what is your perspective um, on what is the most pressing human rights issues in South Africa? And if you are appointed as the DPP, how would you raise the most pressing human rights issues in South Africa? I think the most pressing issues, uh, human rights issues, uh, I think is the issue of access to water, the issue of access to health, uh, the GBV that I believe is also a, prob a problem that also impacts on the access to some of the rights that we have in the co from the Constitution. So I, I think, as I've indicated from the beginning of the interview, that the collaboration among the Chapter 9 institutions is necessary and it needs to be strengthened. I know that we have the Forum for Institutions Supporting Democracy, but I, 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 I also think that f from the provincial level, we really need to make sure that there is that collaboration is strengthened because if, for example, we, we, you have officials among those institutions who do not know where to refer some of these complaints, you'll find them doing everything. And we all know that in terms of the law, if you, don't, you, you, are, you are investigating the matter that you cannot even take to court and the court will lambast you for taking a matter that is outside the mandate of your institution, it will expose you. So but we need at that understanding that uh, all the, 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 the chapter and institution need to have this forum so that they can discuss and they can also share experience. We have some of the chapter nine that are doing very well. We are facing the same challenge, for example, the issue of the budget is affecting all of us across the board. So we, 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 we need that collaboration. Thank you. Um, if you are appointed as the deputy public protector, uh, can, can you explain what 
impact, you, you know, you, you are aware of the issues, but can you explain what impact you can make in the office of the DPP? And with that, do you think the public, the public on the ground, knows enough about the office of the public protector? And, and, and if you are appointed as a deputy public protector, how will you create more awareness about the public protector's office to, to spread it to the people on the ground? So I think, I think one of the issues that I will make sure that I engage on is the issue of uh, visibility of the office of the public protector. Uh, I'm, 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 I enjoy much working with the community members. I'm that kind of person who will go straight and conduct workshops in the middle of, uh, of, of, of the community. And also when there are crises. We are not only visible when there are crises, but every time. But the most important thing, the, one of my character is that where there are crises, I have to go there personally, engage with the leadership, engage with the community members, and try to find a solution. So visibility is very much important. You, we, we don't just leave people fighting each other, protesting with no one coming to talk to them. I have been involved in the, for example, the, 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 the shutdown in Malamulel. I was directly involved, and I went there when there was a shutdown. I was there in Mapila, where people were fighting, shut, complete shutdown. I have to resolve that issue with my team, and we managed to find a solution. For the past, for the past 12, from 2015 till today, there's never been a shutdown in Mapila because of the Human Rights Commission. If you go to Mapila and ask about Victor, they will tell you it was Victor. Because I work with people all the time. Thank you, Chairperson. I'm satisfied. Thank you very much, Honorable Janja. Uh, thank you, Chair. How bad do you want to be a Deputy Public Protector? <laughs> it's a tough one, but I, I can tell you it's that... A, it's a very straightforward one. Yeah. Uh, I really want to be a deputy public protector because I identify the gaps that I will, I will go there and fill those gaps under okay. the leadership okay. of the current one. Let's pause there. Yeah. Did you do any research? Yes, I did. Okay, so what, what is the current budget of that office? Uh, 377 in, million. And the programs that are there? Three. Which are those? Admin, investigation, and uh, stakeholders management. Okay, thank you. Have you heard about the... There's uh, the, the case on uh, investigating in, in relation to the Mail and Guardian? No, that one I have not gone So you have not done that research? I've done the research, but maybe that aspect only. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to lie to you. I've not gone through the case. It's a, it's a very critical case law for that office, for anybody who wants to be in that office, but that's your homework. It's my homework, uh, yes. It's going to be your first homework. What's your understanding of the executive authority in the public service? Uh, the executive authority in the public service is the minister. It's with the minister. What's the executive authority in the public protector's office? The public protector. Okay, thank you. Now, towers are delegated to the deputy public protector. Um, in your own view, uh, what would you do the first day if you, are, if, you are, if, you, if you are appointed as a deputy public protector? The first day, obviously, well, I will, after being uh, informed that I will have to start on, on this particular date, I'll get there and I believe that I will be welcomed by uh, colleagues there. And uh, from there, I will wait for the public protector, introduce myself properly, and uh, I believe that she will be aware because I believe after the appointment okay. she will be informed. But I will be waiting for her to tell me exactly what I should do, how they operate, no. and all Thank you. Yeah. Let, let's pause there. Let's proceed to the... Have you heard about uh, the Bangalore principles of judicial conduct? The what? The Bangalore principles of judicial conduct. Bangalore. Bangalore principles of judicial conduct. Have you heard about them? No, not, not, uh, don't. You've never heard about that? No. Okay. There, there are six core values of the Bangalore principles of judicial conduct. Um, I just want you to speak to me to two of those. Mm -hmm. Competency and diligence. Um, 
if you are to be appointed as a deputy public protector, um, where would you start uh, focusing on those two? Uh, I, I think both of them are important. Uh, but when we talk about competence, competence must be supported by qualifications that you have. And also, are you, when we talk about uh, competence again, is, is the question of whether are you able to deliver on your responsibility as the deputy public protector? Are you competent to handle the, 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 the work of that particular office? of which I believe I am. Diligent, you, di, diligent is when we talk about, when you do that work, do you pay attention? Like what Honorable Mkwewen was asking about somebody just sending the report and let it, let it go, and then you realize that I didn't do my okay. work, I didn't Thank go through it. Thank you, let's yeah. pause there. Have you heard about the Kada Asmal report on uh, institutions supporting democracy? Very well, I've gone through it. I was still working for the Commission for Gender Equality. When, when was that transition. adopted? Sir? When was that adopted? The report. I, I don't remember, but it was back in 2000 and, okay. uh, yeah. 2001, that's fine. 2000, yeah. So w just give me one recommendation out of that report that you think is still relevant today. That we must merge this chapter 9 and, and create a superhuman rights board. I think that is, that is where, where, the, where the, the most important recommendation. And it said that also being criticized from the CGE that we are represent, we are represent, we are representing the missing, we are missing the opportunities, the CGE, all, all those, those comments. But uh, yeah, the, the, the most important is to merge these chapter nine institutions. Thank you. I'll pause the chair. Thank you very much. I see no further hands. Uh, Mr. Mabindula, thank you very much for availing yourself. We don't take it lightly. Um, do you think that the interview process was fair? Yes, the interview process was fair. Uh, the, I think it's a learning process to me, and I believe that, uh, yeah, I've done well, and uh, the committee will decide, and that the decision of the committee should be respected. So, thank you. After this, then the recommended person's uh, name will go to the House, then it will go to the President. You will know soon if you have made it. Thank you very much to you and the Honourable Members, Chair. Thank you very much, Your Excuse. Thank you. Um, honourable Members, um, Ms. Zingisa Zenani is here, the legal advisor to, to Parliament. Um, Ms. Zenani, let me start by apologizing to you. Um, you know, I, I know, yeah. Um, Generally, uh, under normal circumstances, we give you time to consider and do your research and to, to give us a well-considered view. Uh, we apologize that uh, we had to call you Hush Hush to come here. It was something that came that was not planned for. Um, but we thought that it would be important that we get uh, legal uh, advice. Uh, that to guide the process. So please uh, accept our humble apologies for uh, for for doing this to you. Um, it was not intentional. So I think you might have been briefed uh, that uh, the issue that we require some guidance on. Um, we have a member of the panel here who was represented by a person who is going to be interviewed. In fact, that person is, rep is representing her pro bono. Um, and there, there's also another person to be interviewed who has worked with that particular member and there were disciplinary processes that were, con that were, were done. So there was an issue of uh, conflict of interest uh, whether that member should recuse, whether the member of the panel should recuse herself or should just declare. Um, um, so we thought that 
Uh, if we can get a guidance, that's legally, are we on a good side to proceed? <laughs> Thank you, Chairperson, and apology accepted. Uh, we received the uh, brief instructions um, relating to um, a recusal or, or relate to, relating to whether or not a member should recuse themselves based on a perceived um, conflict of interest. Um, the instructions that we received were that um, the, the candidate is, um, is a, a practicing advocate and we are made aware now that there is another candidate as well that will, um, that will be interviewed uh, wherein the same member conducted um, a disciplinary hearing against. Uh, the issue of, um, of conflict of interest in terms of um, the National Assembly processes changed. So, sorry, before yes. you proceed, it will be a conflict of interest and perceived bias. Perceived bias. Okay, thanks, Chair. So, as you may be aware, the issue of conflict of interest is, um, is, is governed um, within the space of Parliament by the rules, um, the National Assembly rules, Rule 30 in particular, will say uh, if a member has a personal or private, um, um, personal or private financial or business interest in any matter before a forum of the assembly of which he or she is a member, she or he must, at the commencement of the engagement on the matter by the forum, immediately declare that interest in accordance with the code of conduct contained in the schedule to the joint rules and comply with the other provis provisions of the code. The code um, clause uh, five says that a member must um, always declare such interest and where appropriate, the member should recuse himself or herself from any forum considering or deciding on the matter. Um, the code also says that the member must declare any direct or personal or private or financial interest or business interest that the member or any immediate family or that member or any business partner of that member or immediate family of that member may have in a matter to be considered or decided on before any parliamentary committee or other parliamentary forum of, that, of, of which that member is a member or in which that member is participating. So I understand that this hurdle has already been passed because I, I want to believe that there's already a declaration uh, that is... Not yet. The, the two people have not yet been interviewed. All right, but the rules say that the member must declare. Yes. So it is the responsibility of the member to declare. Uh, uh, furthermore, with regard to um, the, the, the candidate who is, um, who is um, a practicing advocate, uh, the Legal uh, Practice Council Act Section 29 says that the minister must, after consultation with the council, prescribe requirements for community <coughs> service from a date to be determined by the minister, and such requirements may include a minimum period of recurring community service by practicing, practicing legal practitioners upon which um, continued enrollment as a legal practitioner is dependent. So there is a duty on the um, practicing legal pra pra practitioners to perform um, um, community service during the course of their work. So um, there is the, uh, well, the, the, the first requirement is that there must be a declaration by the, um, by the member. Second, if there has been any pro bono that has been performed by a candidate who is a practice, uh, practicing legal practitioner, there would not have been anything untoward um, about it because it is prescribed by the Legal Practice Council. Furthermore, um, um, there is um, quite a few court decisions that have dealt with the issue of, of recusal based on uh, possible conflict of interest. One case that comes to mind is the President of the Republic of South Africa versus Sarfu. Um, just need to check. Um, well, I can, I can, if required, bring the full citation, but basically the principle that we elicit from the case is that um, the question um, that must be asked in circumstances where there is a perceived post, um, 
conflict of interest or perceived biasness is whether a reasonable, objective, and informed person would, on the correct facts, uh, reasonably apprehend that the judge has not and will not bring an impartial uh, mind to bear on the adjudication of the case. And it goes on to further say, uh, the reasonableness of the apprehension must be assessed in the light of the oath of office taken by the judges to administer justice without fear or favor and the ability to carry out um, that, uh, that, that, that oath. So um, a, 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 a conflict of interest must be assessed as against what the case law says. Uh, it, is not sufficient to just say um, we have worked together in a matter as is the case in this um, in this particular case. But there must be that assessment as set out in the court decision that I've read out. Uh, furthermore, the members of parliament also take an oath of office. Uh, and I would like to believe that on the facts presented, we cannot preempt that there is any conflict of interest unless there are any other facts that we are not privy to. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. That is, uh, you, you are done, Mr. Mr. Um, that is our preliminary review, Chairperson, considering the timeline that we've been given yes, to, to, which is understandable. to present the opinion. Thank you very much. That is the opinion, members. Honourable Petemba, Honourable Horn. Thanks, Honourable thanks, Honourable. Chair. Um, clearly, uh, we disagree fundamentally with this legal opinion. Uh, I believe the legal opinion is flawed in its entirety. I ascribe that to the short notice that was given to prepare. Uh, in circumstances where somebody is currently appearing pro bono for a member of this panel, and there's a financial benefit for the member of the panel in that relationship, to interview that person for a job, uh, is, there's not only a, a clear conflict, never mind a perceived uh, conflict, there's a conflict of interest and definitely a perception of bias, and it, it's ineluctable. And it's unconceivable how that cannot be seen in this legal opinion. Uh, again, a member of this panel is going to interview a, a candidate who worked for her, who was disciplined by her, who was terminated by her, and then went to the Labour Court and that termination was overturned and she's still in the Office of the Public Protector. Uh, I disagree fundamentally with respect to this legal opinion. And, uh, and uh, I'll need a little bit of time to consider our position. Honourable Hon. Yeah, Chair, I also wanted to say, while I perfectly accept that we, we actually are putting um, parliamentary legal services in an unfair position, of course, legal advice um, also largely, or the credibility of it, depends on the completeness of the brief. Um, and I would want to hear from, uh, from the representative whether her advice and opinion on the, on the pro bono services would differ. Uh, after I've pointed out to her that the Legal Practice Council, as a matter of fact, um, has embarked on a process of regulating pro bono services, but it is within the context, of course, of indigent clients, where there is then an obligation on legal practitioners to render pro bono services. It's much, with, not to make it too complex, in the, in the old days there was a, a, a practice which one, we called informa pauperis, where the registrar of the court could, once indigent prospective litigants would arrive at the registrar's court, um, issue an informa pauperis. Uh, directive to practitioners on a rotational basis and that placed them under an obligation to assist free of charge. Now uh, it's been brought under the helm of what we know as, as pro bono services, but I would want to strongly argue that that vastly differs from a situation where somebody is uh, litigating in front of an international body, as is the case here, 
and the way the candidate has then seemingly, on the information available to us, stepped forward and said, but I'm making my, my services available you, to you at this international African forum on a pro bono basis. That would mean firstly, and I want you to consider that, that there's clearly a financial benefit to the litigant. Because in ordinary services, of uh, ordin the ordinary course of events, uh, uh, that litigant would have had to pay for it. But secondly, there is also the, the, the complexity that there is more than the ordinary pro bono enforced relationship in respect of the, 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 the candidate who's appearing today, the advocate. If that candidate stepped forward and said, because I believe in your case, I'm going to assist you in a pro bono matter at that forum. That clearly talks to a much closer relationship than would ordinarily be the case for a practitioner, wouldn't you agree? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Mola. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, Chair, I think uh, let's first agree that uh, this is just but one step towards many steps towards the appointment of the Deputy Public Protector. Given how now we're arguing in this uh, committee room, it does seem like Honorable Mkwebana should have recused herself the day where we received the master list and we saw the name of Tebele and Mohalat. Was this a process that she has been involved in throughout? Just part of the, of, of, of the engagement chair is that in the last meeting where we sat and agreed about the shortlisting, uh, Advocate Mkwebana was fully participating in that meeting. So it is quite unfortunate that uh, we are now only discussing the possibility of bias, the possibility or the perspective, the perception of bias, sorry. But I equally find it um, unfair and uh, legally incorrect to say there is a relationship between Honorable Mkwebane and these two candidates, but we say she must completely recuse herself when eight candidates are about to, to be interviewed. To me, that, 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 that argument does not hold water. They say in the worst case scenario, there was indeed a proven perception of bias on her side. In my view, it would have warranted her to recuse herself in the interview of these two specific candidates, not everyone in the list. Lastly, Chair, it does appear from both what Honorable Horn and Honorable Breitbach are submitting that the relationship between Honorable Mkwebane and um, uh, Advocate Tebele and uh, Mohalati is strictly a formal professional relationship. That in the submission, it does not say that beyond this which is submitted, there is a personal relationship between the candidates and, this, uh, and the honorable man. So from where I'm seated, Chair, uh, that this relationship remains a professional relationship the other one from another office, the other one currently. So I would actually submit as well uh, to the committee that let's proceed with the, the NA Rule 30 that says a member must declare a particular relationship they have with that particular candidate. So chair, I just wanted to move that way. And we, we must chair, actually thank uh, uh, Advocate Breitenbach and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Honorable Horn for raising this matter with us. So to are able as the committee to, 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 to make deliberations of, on it, apply our minds, call the legal unit of parliament to come and assist the committee so that we don't proceed 
regardless of what is happening and get to have problems uh, uh, in the near future about uh, what we are engaged in. I think it is important that the committee must thank them, but I think I move with the uh, uh, a submission that we must proceed in line with Rule 30 of the National Assembly Rules that uh, the member involved must make a declaration. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Nkwebane, Honorable Engelbrach, Honorable Janchi. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, before, I think Honorable Ritebach had her hand. Are you still? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, thank you, um, Advocate. Are you advocate? I am, I okay. am not advocate. I'm an attorney of the High Court of South Africa. Okay. Um, you know, the, this agency was unfortunately created by the very same DA because, indeed, um, in the first place, apology to you to be just placed in this position unnecessarily because DA should have raised this query as Honorable Ngola is saying, when we were conducting the shortlist and say this is a challenge we are having. And now even EDA, they just rushed to Honorable Breitenbach or no, Honorable Horn. You know, I was still going to declare because I know I'm supposed to declare. And what is worse is that now they raise this here, taking our time to interview candidates Candidates have been flown in. The state is wasting resources to fly people in. Some of them might have booked earlier flight. Now we are going to delay them. When we change flights, we are losing money. So I think that's also one of the things which um, they should be accountable for. But then another thing, I'm not the sole decision maker in this matter. The matter is a committee decision. When we identify a candidate, that candidate will be the decision of the committee, not me alone. And again, she's misleading the committee who advocate Breitenbach. The Bonamul Mukhaladi was never dismissed. The letter was saying, show cause why you shouldn't be dismissed. That is there throughout the papers. Not to say there was a letter which says, you are dismissed. So that's very wrong of, of her to, to even mislead this particular committee. Who advocate um, Tibela is a public defender, a person who would do any matter anyway, who saw the cause of the public protector and said, I am also doing the work with the African Union. I can do this matter. I've done several matters which he can present himself if he does that. And indeed, I have no knowledge and relations with Advocate uh, Dibela. But the fact of the matter is that uh, they just, uh, uh, but they, she rushes to raise this matter instead of waiting for me and hear from me whether I'm going to declare. And I'm, I was still waiting for her as well to declare because there is recorded evidence which shows that herself has been communicating with Ms. Mohaladi throughout my term as the public protector. So I think it was going to be very interesting as well for her to say, I know this person, I always communicated with her, I'm the one who also gave this information, I raised these parliamentary questions because I, I was engaging with her. So I think uh, uh, the rule date is very clear and I'm not the, decision, the sole decision maker and I'm here just for the people of South Africa to make sure that we identify a correct person. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. Now, before we proceed, I think uh, Ms. Zenani, um, also if you can comment on that one, because I think it's an important principle uh, where a member is part of a committee, not the sole decision maker, if you can touch on that. Uh, no, but when you, you respond, I think I'm still raising uh, issues. Um, it was Honorable um, Engelberg. Uh, thank, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just would like to know from the legal advisor if her name is Sengizwa. 
Um, yes, that's correct. Thank you, Chair. My name is not Zingiswa, it's Zingisa. Zingisa. Okay, and uh, did you work for the public protector while Ms. Mbekwane was um, the public protector? No, I did not. You did not. Okay, I just wanted to clear that. Thanks. Sorry, 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 sorry. I, 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 let's focus on the legal opinion and guidance that is being sought for us to conduct these interviews. Please. Honorable Janji? No, no, Chair, let me, uh, uh, le let me admit that I, I created an oversight on my part. I had intended, before you ask her to, to speak, that uh, we needed her to have a little bit of a listening to us first. You know, there's, there's something called the quick and dirty in research. So we have asked her to come and give us a quick and dirty legal opinion. Mm -hmm. And she had a hit and run kind of an advice. Nothing was presented to her. That on its own, Jay. Um, and, and I think that's unfair. Uh, it's like a window in the corridor who to give you legal advice. So she has come into the meeting, she, she, she needed to, that's the oversight I'm saying I've created. She needed to sit and listen. Because even now, I don't expect that she would have a a, 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 a comprehensive response or a standing legal advice. From where I'm sitting, she's here to listen. I, I just I just want to say that and 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 for that I would want to suggest that uh, we, we 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 give her time chair also to consider all of these issues having listened because we are going to need that um, uh, well considered legal advice in terms of this process um, even when we concluded uh, this matter I I agree that uh, on consistency, we should, we, should, we, should, we should proceed, but subject to us receiving this legal advice, it's going to be important, it's going to help us, and, and so that she is able to apply her mind fully uh, on, on all of these issues. Now, there's, she's just getting sabotage uh, by all of us here. Since uh, Nikki brief, immediately it says, uh, and, and I'm, I'm saying that's not. Uh, uh, and, and, and therefore, my concrete suggestion is that uh, because some of these things that are here are, are not new, we've, we've just I mean, interviewed the South African Human Rights Commission. I sat here and declared on three candidates. Uh, I would have been part of the shortlisting of those three candidates, Chris Nissan, Andre Gam, and, uh, and Gongo Bene. Uh, we, 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 so, and, and I know them very close. <laughs> for that matter, and I declared as such that that's where I, I would have worked with them and so on. And Honorable Kola makes an important point that whatever legal advice we give must be a fully fledged one that starts from the process when it started, uh, and not just picking up a particular issue. Because here, uh, there's the specific issues that are being raised in a very preemptive manner. Because um, it, it's, it's something else when these candidates would have been here, and there would have been no declaration. And, and then you raise uh, some serious questions. So I, I, I don't know if I'm helpful, Chair, but I would want to even, though she's going to respond, and I will take her response as a, uh, just off the cuff at this stage. We need to, to give people that will, will, must give us proper legal advice, uh, space and time for them to advise us properly. Uh, so thank you, Chair. Thank you. I think um, the legal division of Parliament, they know exactly how we operate under normal circumstances. We take their expertise and their legal advice very seriously, and we always communicate with them in time. Um, but it was a serious issue that came in the morning and we needed to get some form of a guidance so that we don't act arbitrarily. Um, we did not, we know that there was not enough time to, 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 to give us a considered view, um, but we do have a sense 
uh, now as to whether we agree or do we disagree with the view, but we do have a sense. I, I think um, we, we can be able to to to, to make a decision. Um, but um, uh, Mr. Nani? Uh, be, okay. Before you go, Chair, I think there's one important other aspect that just yeah. must be put on the record. A formal finding by this Parliament about the Mughalari <coughs> issue. Ms. Ms. Breitenbach will read it into the record. Okay. Uh, thanks, Chair. So, uh, this is an extract from the um, Section 194 report. Oh, from? This is Section 194 oh. report. Yeah. Advocate Mkibani's rejection of the outcomes of the disciplinary process the tenor of her letter imposing summary dismissal instead, and the lengths to which Ms. Mukhaladi and Ms. Sekele were compelled to go to vindicate their rights and secure their livelihoods, caused members to conclude that Advocate Mugani's conduct constitutes either victimization, alternatively harassment, alternatively intimidation against both Ms. Mukhaladi and Ms. Seleke. That is an extract from the uh, Section 194 report. I can make that available to the legal advisor if she so desires. And I understand that in my absence, um, Ms. Mkwebani said that I should declare about Ms. Mukhaladi. Uh, I don't know if I, I don't know if she's here. I don't believe that I've ever met Ms. Mukhaladi in my life. But when she arrives, if I do know her, rest assured, I will declare. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Zanani, I think let's agree that uh, we would not continue to, uh, some of the issues um, you would need to, be, they would need to be part of a well-considered uh, opinion. Yeah, I think there's, informa there's information that you have just heard it when you are here. Um, we did give you a, a glimpse, the committee secretary had spoke to you about what we needed um, and you had to do a quick uh, reading. I think it would be important at least to stick to those things because we do not want a situation where uh, we, will, we will just continue to put you in a very difficult uh, position. Uh, if you can just respond to um, some of those things, but you can give us a well-considered opinion later. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, uh, and um, I just want to, 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 to acknowledge also that some of the information is slowly yes, coming sir. out now. Mm -hmm. Some of the facts were not necessarily um, uh, privy to. For instance, the issue of uh, Advocate Debela currently representing Advocate Mukwebane. We were not alerted to that. We, I, my understanding was that it's, um, he had previously represented, so they know each other from that case. I was not aware that the, um, the, the matter is ongoing, the uh, representation is ongoing. So I would like to look into that, to, to, to be given an opportunity to look into that. I do not know if it will change my stance, but um, I would like to, to revisit that. Uh, secondly, the issue of the disciplinary action by um, Advocate Mkwebane against Ms. Mohaladi. Uh, my preliminary view on it is that it's something that happens within the course and course of, scope and course of work, nothing outside the labor laws of this country unless the judgment, the labor court judge, judgment point out to the issues that, um, uh, that for instance, Advocate Bradenbach is talking about issues of victimization, then maybe based on that, maybe our position would change on that. I do not know. I would have to look into the judgment. I would have to look into the, um, the, the details about Ms. Mukhaladi in the Section 194 report, which you did not get an opportunity to revisit. The issue of pro bono representation, I would like to believe that there is a means test that the LPC applies. Where I am sitting, I am unable to say that Advocate Mkwebana would not qualify for pro bono. That would need to have get facts on it as well. Uh, there was an issue about um, Advocate um, <coughs> Mkwebane being part of the committee, but not necessarily the sole decision maker. 
I believe that the decision that will be taken here, the recommendation will be, that will be taken here will be taken by a collective within the multi-party democratic government that the constitution talks about. So I do not necessarily think that there is a particular individual that is the sole decision maker. I believe that it will be a collective decision that will be presented to the National Assembly. And as um, Advocate Breton Park has pointed out, I would like to revisit the Section 1 and 4 um, report to look into the issues of uh, victimization attributed to Advocate Mukwebane as against um, Ms. Ponatsakum Khaladi. And um, as you have um, alluded to, to Chairperson, I would like to be given sufficient time to prepare um, a proper opinion on the facts that um, uh, have been presented in this room today. Um, just, just for my interest, um, how material it is and how fundamental it is that if she is not the sole decision maker, and the committee proceed that that can fatally taint the whole process if she's the only person. Let's say she is materially conflicted as, a, as an individual. Um, you have a committee of about nine people. Um, how fundamental it is? Uh, that she is not the sole decision maker. If, yes. um, if there is evidence that has been presented that she is conflicted, then yes. I would propose um, that she considers um, recusal. Otherwise, like I said, I do not, um, I, I would like to believe that she's here to make contributions and inputs to the process and inputs that will be taken into consideration for this committee to arrive at, the, at its decision. Now, if she refuses to recuse herself and the process continues, how fatal can that be? <laughs> Well, Chair, if there is evidence that um, there are some candidates that were prejudiced as a result of her be being conflicted, or that some candidates benefited as a result of the conflict of interest, then um, in my view, it will um, affect the entire process. Okay. Members, can I suggest maybe that we have a 20 minutes break and uh, please be around. I will be around, Chef. Thanks. Thank you. Chair, sorry, just for ease of reference for the, the legal advisor, um, the piece that I'm referring to in the report is uh, page 29 of. 64 pages. What? Can you repeat that? I was sorry. The, the piece that I read out is on page 29 of the section 194 report. Just so that she doesn't have to trawl through the whole report to find it. 29. Right. So, can we have the 20 minutes break?
Recording stopped. Uh, can we start?
I, uh, members, I think we should start. So let's let's let, let's uh, proceed. Um, I think, firstly, it would be proper to say, uh, Honorable Mkwebane, having had everything else that has been said, uh, legal opinion, uh, would you still want to proceed to be part of the committee? Chair, I'm representing the masses of the people. Chair, I'm not here as um, Kwebane public protector. I'm here to make sure that I assist the committee. And I still repeat, I'm not the decision maker. I won't impose candidates on you, mm. unless then twisting this thing and saying advocate Breitenbach and, Advo and Horn, Ad, uh, Mr. Horn, they would want to um, appoint uh, Ms. Mukhaladi or because there seems to be the uh, head defense um, lawyers. Um, so it might be tainted also in that aspect. And I still repeat that um, she, 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 she knows her. But Chairperson, be that as it may, I'm legally qualified. I have objectivity. I'll make sure that I assist the committee as best as I can. And I've got no interest in, 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 in any individual. My interest is only making sure that we get somebody who will protect the public. And that's it. And I, unfortunately, I won't even recuse myself because I don't see any need to why must I recuse myself. And I mean, um, DA should have raised this at the beginning and we should have given enough time. And even the recent judgments of the Section 194 Committee, which you must go and look into, the very same thing one was raising about the recusal and the refusal of their member, Mr. Mileham. <coughs> Uh, it deals clearly with what is expected from a member, and I'm bound by the rules of parliament when I'm sitting here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other members? But let's focus on the process going forward. Honorable Mola, Honorable Petenbach, Honorable Mulube. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chair. I think uh, let's. Let's appreciate the legal unit of parliament for committing to assist us at a very short notice. Uh, we, it's something that just got in uh, as we're starting, we we're about to start with the first candidate. So we thought maybe let us not be too rushy rushy on it and uh, taint the entire process. We thought it is important that we attend to it with the most seriousness it, uh, it, actually, it actually deserves. So I think we have received uh, the, the specific matters related <coughs> to what has been raised and submitted to the committee, uh, uh, particularly on the perception of bias and uh, the relationship of one of our members uh, with uh, two candidates. Uh, but uh, having analyzed uh, the, the kind of relationship, I think it was clearly noted that uh, as per the um, National Assembly Rule 30, uh, there must be on record paper, for record purposes or on record a declaration by the member involved. But it, it did seem like uh, that some of the things that have been added uh, in relation to what needs to the specifics that uh, the legal unit of parliament needs to 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 focus on as some of the addendum to the general rule uh, that the general rule is that a member that is actually have got uh, a relationship must declare now there are exceptional circumstances that have been brought in which is an addendum to what we have discuss so which uh, the legal unit of parliament has committed to to assist us with those specific points as well uh, so we're going to give them that time so that they work on that matter but from where we are seated recording in with a general rule that a member involved must actually uh, ensure that make on record declaration relating to what kind of relationship do we have with this particular uh, candidates. So I would like uh, to to propose or suggest in the committee that 
uh, uh, with that having been done, let's let's proceed uh, with the interviews as planned. I remember, we even had to change the first candidate and took the second one, and it has delayed the proceedings uh, 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 very much, and it will affect our time because of the time frames that we have set uh, as the committee to deal with this matter and. Uh, and, and conclude. It does seem like, by the look of things, we are going to finish uh, at midnight uh, today, not as expected. But then, Chair, we are public servants, so we, we commit to stay until the end. Uh, let's proceed now uh, from, um, from uh, the candidate we changed, uh, then uh, we, 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 we proceed with as, as planned. Of course, we'll, we will be awaiting uh, the legal unit to give us extra information from what they have presented to us, uh, whilst we are still continuing with the process. I don't want us to anticipate to go to the legal uh, opinion will bring us uh, the, the worst case scenario or the less case scenario. Let's, let, we, we should not operate on the basis of what is anticipated uh, and, and, and what may possibly be a, a crisis. But let's say from how far we've gone in trying to attend to this matter. We are satisfied, of course. There's still just a particular portion that the unit is dealing with. Let's proceed, Chair. Uh, we'll be awaiting them with hope that they are going to be uh, fast in attending to this matter as they can see that it's an urgent matter that uh, deals with the image of the proceedings uh, entirely. So we will we'll request them to be very much efficient in dealing with the matter so that it eases the committee process as well. Uh, I propose that uh, we proceed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Honorable uh, Bretenbach. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, I want to stress that what you're arguing here is a legal principle and it's not, not personal and shouldn't be perceived as a personal attack. Certainly not intended as well. You're arguing a legal, an, an entrenched legal principle. Uh, we disagree fundamentally with going forward with this process under these circumstances. We would urge you, Chair, to postpone this entire event until we have s certainty on the legal position. Uh, we believe that the process has been fatally compromised, and by continuing it, you're compounding the issue. And by continuing in the face of a legal opinion that is now outstanding, you just placing enormous pressure on legal services to find a way to legitimise the process. It doesn't allow them the room to objectively apply their mind. Uh, and those are our concerns, and, and, uh, and, and, and I, I was under the impression that we were going to wait for the legal opinion and then decide on a way forward. Uh, if what the committee is now suggesting to do is to go ahead regardless uh, well, we can't agree with that, Chair, at all. And we again place our objections on record. Thank you very much. I think up to us, Honorable Ramulu Ben. Thanks, Chair. Um, Chair, I think I want to agree with Honorable Mola. Mola. Um, but before that, I think we are dragging this unnecessary now, Chair. And I agree with previous speakers that if this matter was brought to the committee when we're dealing with shortlisting, possibly would have dealt with it differently, that's one. And two, again, be raised when we had our own closed session at half past eight, we would have possibly not ambushed the legal representation of Parliament, we would have prepared ourselves in advance, but we're here. Let's deal with the merits of, of now. I want to echo the very same sentiments of Honorable Nola that we proceed, Chair, with um, the fourth person to be interviewed while the legal representation goes and to try and assist us further on how we should proceed. And we shouldn't preempt that the process will be compromised before we could hear the verdict, or not necessarily a verdict, but what the legal rep would be 
be giving us after they've gone through their own process. So let's give them space and open room for them to equally do their work because we did ambush them. So we cannot expect them to be bringing a thorough work when they were not given sufficient time. So I think we were all aware of these interviews taking place this day and we should have given this matter attention, especially if they're serious matters that speaks to the legal matters as Honorable Breitenberg would allude to. But outside that, Chair, let's proceed. Let's not hold the process at ransom whilst the legal rep continues with its work. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Jale. Thank you very much, Chair. I think, Chair, I'll be very short. I agree with the previous speaker. Your, your voice is too soft. Thank you, Chair. I agree with the previous speaker's Chair that let's continue. And uh, but want to emphasize that we just go back to the first candidate as as planned, uh, because we are going to give the legal services an opportunity to go back and give them time. This matter will be ventilated maybe in the next phase of of the processes, because at the moment this is the second phase. The first one, the DA should have. I, I agree, should have raised this issue there. And then today we are here, and that there's still going to be another uh, uh, phase chair. Let's just agree that for today, if you continue, I agree with the uh, previous speakers. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable uh, John Chair. No, no, Chair. I think, uh, Chair, without too wasting time, I think. Uh, we, we have correctly spent time so that we, are, we listen to each other. When, when matters are raised, there's no bulldozing. Uh, that's not how this committee operates uh, under your leadership, Chair. Chair, I, I, I am comfortable with uh, um, the points raised, and, and especially that we are giving our legal services uh, time to go and do the, the proper work, uh, having listened to everything else that, that, that we, we have said in, in, in the meeting, for us to receive uh, that legal uh, opinion. Um, as we, 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 we continue to, to, to conclude our work as planned, and when we're done with the last interview, um, we might take a particular approach about subjecting everything else. Uh, to the outcome of that legal opinion. Um, I, I, even before that comes to us, um, the, the idea that uh, an entire process would be tainted is a bit of a stretch uh, from, from where I'm sitting. Um, m matters that have been raised here uh, are very specified and are very clear. Um, it, 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 it's the issue of uh, somebody um, receiving um, benefits uh, was a member of this committee in the form of um, uh, the work that is being done on her, be on her behalf. Uh, it's a matter that you might want to go and look into as to some of the outcomes of the Section 194. The section one and four would have considered a number of issues, um, and 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 you have a candidate here who would have been been a witness in the section one and four would have ventilated uh, not one particular issue, number of issues uh, about a member of this committee who was part of of this interview. But thirdly, the key issue, and I think the the chairperson's questions are critical in that. Uh, at the end, we must take a decision, and 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 and, and how that decision will be affected, um, uh, the fertility, the fertility of that decision, uh, in relation to this particular member, and we would be uh, going through that and 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 and, and watching that. Uh, it's very preemptive. Some of those things might not might not even pertain uh, at, at the end of of the work that we do, um, but I think we. We, we, we have no attitude and, and arrogance, Chair, that says regardless, this is, because we have not come here with a, a briefcase candidate. 
that we want to be appointed. Every body of the seven has got an equal chance of being looked into, asked questions, and at the end, uh, we're going to deliberate as to who out, um, out of those we think is fit for to be the, the new deputy uh, public protector. Um, it's, it's not even a question of uh, using whatever muscle or numbers that you have were going to be influenced by the performance of the interviews for each of those. But we take into account what has been raised. But I, I, I still believe, Chair, that uh, it would not serve Parliament to collapse the process uh, at this point. Uh, but it, Parliament will be served better, or the National Assembly, when we proceed with our work, but we look into whatever um, uh, possibilities based on the legal opinion as to what needs to be the final outcome. So I want to support uh, Chair that we, we proceed uh, as planned. I don't regret that there's time lost. It was necessary for us to, to hear each other out. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, members. I think there is a clear majority view that we need to proceed. Um, look, the legal advisors are not under any pressure to, to confirm what the outcome we want. They must give us a well-considered legal opinion. As professionals, we expect that. I think. Um, uh, secondly, um, the former president uh, Mutlande uh, always said to us, uh, "No party has ever won the battle of ifs." Um, now, the issue is, let's say the. After two days or so, the legal opinion comes and said, and says the process is fatally uh, bad. We we'll have to start from scratch. And then, if they come and say no, we can proceed. Uh, but the issue is that we must decide whether this day is going to be regarded as just as a wasteful expenditure. Um, I think the majority view is that um, let's proceed um, uh, and then we will finalize everything else after the interviews, so after we have heard or seen the well-considered illegal opinion. Um, I think it would be good to give the legal advisors also sufficient time, uh, maybe Friday or so, maybe they might be ready or we give them the weekend. Uh, and then maybe by next week, after the, then we will get the verdict uh, from the legal division as to what we do. But for now, let's just proceed with the interviews as advised by members. Um, uh, and continue to interview, and but we will await your legal opinion um, by Monday, at least if we can get the legal opinion by Monday. Because I think there are issues that are, are going to be beneficial not only to this committee, but to the whole of parliament that were raised here. And we think that they need to be properly researched and we get a proper advice um, 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 uh, from, the, from, from, from the legal division. So it's important that we give you sufficient time. At least sitting with us, you, you are better equipped now to understand what the issues are, uh, unlike in the morning. Thanks, Jen. That's correct. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. That's correct. And we will make the legal opinion available by Monday. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. I think, members, let's proceed. Debele. Yeah, we'll start with Mr. Debele.
is it good day or good morning? Uh, good morning, Mr. Devele. Good morning, honorable members. Thank you very much. We would like to sincerely apologize to you, Mr. Debele. We know that uh, you are supposed to have been with us from 9 o'clock until 10 o'clock. Yes. Um, matters beyond our control uh, just arose. And we had to ensure that we, the process is run properly and we had to take a lot of advices. Um, but uh, we are very, very um, apologetic uh, for, for the delay. We know that it also goes with anxiety. If you, are a, if you are a candidate, we understand, we really understand, and we, we are sorry for prolonging the anxiety beyond what was necessary. Apology accepted. <laughs> and thank you for letting me in. Uh, so we'll just give you an opportunity as a, as a way of saying sorry to you to just drink water. <laughs> Thank you, <Chair. laughs> That is the water of apology. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, can you, in five minutes, tell us about who you are, your belief system, and whether you are the right person to serve as a deputy public protector. My name is Shadrach Devila, and I was born and raised at Ranchaveli in Sukukune, in Limpopo province. And when I was three, my twin brother and I lost our mom, and I'm from a family of six, so I have four more siblings other than my twin brother. So. From that day, we were raised by a single parent, being our father, and unfortunately, we were relocated to our aunt, my twin brother and I, and the other four siblings went to stay with our maternal grandmother. And I stayed with my maternal grandmother for seven years. And then we were returned to our maternal, with my, with my maternal for seven years, and then we went back to join our siblings. Uh, to be raised by our grandmother. So I, I was raised under hard conditions of not having a mom. And uh, there is just one thing I just want to highlight, it's necessary that aspect. <coughs> uh, in my primary school and high school, I only owned school shoes from grade one to grade four. And beyond that, I never had school shoes or a complete school uniform. So in primary school, there would be teachers who are assigned to deal with discipline on school uniform and all this. So I was always called in staff room to say, why are you not on complete school uniform? And I felt prejudiced by then. And I was like, one day I must change this. And then I went to high school. The same issue uh, continued. And I was like, one day I'm going to change this. And then that inspired me to study law. That prejudice inspired me to study law. And I went to University of Limpopo. And I graduated in 2012 for LLB degree. And then I joined the Constitutional Court in July 2012 as a law researcher to the late Justice Tembile Squeya and Justice Fronman, respectively. So I completed my uh, employment with Constitutional Court in July 2013. And then two months before July 2013, I was awarded Health and Human Rights uh, Fellowship to go and study for Master of Laws at the University of California, Los Angeles. And then I completed my master's in 2014, in May. And then upon my return to South Africa, I started my practice as an advocate in July 2014. And from July 2014, I've been in a private practice where I mainly deal with human rights law and constitutional law. Uh, 
and in my practice as an advocate, um, about 95% of the work I do, I do it pro bono. And I've been in my own corner uh, in private practice doing the work of the public protector. And, and I will elaborate on that. Uh, the reason why I'm saying I've been performing the duties of a public protector in my private space is because most of the matters I've been dealing with involve maladministration in public service. Uh, for example, issues of appointment of principals and head of departments in public schools. So I've been involved in quite a number of matters where uh, the school governing bodies challenged uh, the appointments of, of educators, principal and head of departments uh, on the protest that the process was, was not fair and all other things. So I've been involved in those matters on pro bono basis and that prepared me to, to serve uh, the, the people of South Africa. So in, 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 in in my office, I've, I've dealt with matters like uh, the right to education. In, in recently, I, I, I handled a matter wherein an orphan from from Nadala was refused uh, enrollment at a, a public school in Polokwane, and the maternal aunt of the orphan came to our offices, and then for legal services, we we litigated, and she was admitted by a court order. And another uh, recent matter I did uh, pro bono on, on public, uh, so on, on, on constitutional matter is uh, a matter involving a grade 12 learner at one of the public schools in Limpopo. He set for metric exam in December uh, 2023. And then it transpired that his paper one script for life sciences went missing. And that affected his complete results. So when the results were released in January, he was not given the full results. And he went to the Department of Education for about a week on, uh, checking out as to uh, how far are they. And then on the 26th day of January, 2024, she was, he was informed that he can take a gap year. And that is when the principal referred the family to us for assistance. And then we litigated and his results were, re were released on the 31st of January 2024. And he's now studying at the University of, of Limpopo. So I've been involved in quite a number of, of, of matters uh, of maladministration. And for that reason, I, I think I'm, I'm prepared to shift from the small corner uh, where I was only helping those who know about me uh, to a public space where I'm going to serve the whole country because almost everyone knows about the office of the public protector. So I'll be serving a broader public now, not only those who know me. So I, I'll, I'll appreciate the opportunity to serve the entire country and not only those who have a privilege of knowing where I am and what I do. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Tebele, just for my clarity, if you conduct uh, your practice, conduct 95% of cases pro bono, how is it sustainable? How, how, how do the 5% make you to be sustainable of yeah. the people who are paying? Naturally, I'm not uh, a fancy person. Uh, I think that is the first advantage. Uh, and I'm, I'm having a very supportive wife. She's a teacher. And from, from what we bring home, we can take care of ourselves and the kids. So it, it may sound uh, not possible, but I've, 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 I've seen it. It's, it's, it's happening. Uh, I think the most advantageous part of it is that I'm, I'm not a luxurious person. Can you confirm your disclosures, uh, what you disclosed uh, in the disclosure form has been correct and you are satisfied with what you have disclosed? Yes, I, I confirm that I'm, I'm satisfied of the disclosure.
Do you want to add anything? No. Thank you very much, uh, members. Any questions? Honorable Ngola, Honorable Chale, Honorable Engelberg, Honorable Nivold Tuchan, Honorable Ramon Lubeng, Honorable Horn, in that order. Honorable Breitenbach, in that order. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, good uh, afternoon, Advocate Tebele. Good afternoon, Honorable Nora. Uh, are you a communist? I the, don't. The life you are living is that of a communist. <laughs> I don't regard myself as a communist, but <laughs> I, I, was, I was fortunate to be. Uh, raised by a communist. My, my okay. former school principal no, was a communist. That's fine. So. Let's leave it there. Let's leave it there. Have you ever handled um, complex cases before or complex investigations before? And uh, if the answer is on the affirmative, uh, can you just cite an example one of, of one case, complex case and high profile case, if any? that you have been able to handle before? Uh, high profile. A complex Co investigation. Com investigation or, or just a case? It's a case, the investigation. Anything relevant to the question? Yeah. Uh, I've... I, I, I don't... Okay. The... the the one 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 matter I uh, there is there is one matter I I did in twenty I think sixteen and seventeen uh, involving a a student at the University of Limpopo. Uh, that student was studying with the University of Limpopo and then she completed about thirty three modules with the university and then she was excluded and then she was referred to complete two more modules at the University of South Africa. So in that matter, uh, what happened is that upon her return to the University of Limbobo, they told her that she cannot graduate because she's out of time. And then the whole process was a nullity. So uh, fortunately, uh, her sister knows me and the kind of the work I do. So I was invited to come and assist also pro bono uh, because obviously, uh, there is no way a, a student can be able to afford legal fees. So I got involved in the matter, and then we challenged the matter in the, in, in the high court in Pulugwan. So we were, we were successful in the matter, and the, the policy uh, of the, or the rules of the university in relation to uh, that exclusion uh, were declared to be unconstitutional. We have answered enough. Part of how the public protest of South Africa operates is through whistleblowers. Yes. For them to resume an investigation. Do you think that the public protector of South Africa is doing enough work for the protection of whistleblowers? Okay. I, I've, 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 I've went through the, the act. Uh, the Disclosure Act, and I was I was quite worried that I couldn't find anywhere in the Act where it's possible for, example, an employee to report as an anonymous person <coughs> uh, to the public protector. So that was just a, a, a little bit of a con of concern to me, to say, uh, how about uh, the Act? make a provision uh, to cover a situation where I, as an employee, I don't want to disclose my identity, but I want to, to, to lodge a complaint or to report a particular incident of alleged uh, maladministration without my identity being revealed. So I think on that part, uh, that there should be uh, something that to ensure that uh, people can can freely go and report okay. Uh, as okay you, you you say we still need to do more 
Yes. Okay. Yes. No, and that is very much important because it will it will give uh, more courage to employees uh, to, to, to come out and Okay, and I, I, I see in your profile that you are a human rights proponent. Uh, you are a person who uh, practice human rights issues. You have been dealing with human rights issues for a very long time. Yes. Uh, the, whose genesis actually is chapter two of the constitution. So, comparing with the mandate of the public protect in South Africa, how do you think the public protect South Africa should do to help protect and advance human rights in South Africa? Someone spoke about the issue of protest, people protesting about shelters, protesting about water, which are issues that are encapsulated in the, in, the, in the Bill of Rights. So how do you think that the public protest South Africa should help in protecting and advancing human rights in South Africa? I think the first, the first thing is uh, awareness. Uh, the Office of the Public Protector uh, should ensure that there is more public awareness about the, 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 the use of the office and how the office operates. And it must be accessible. So I think there is a need for the, the unit of the stakeholder unit to, to go out through outreach programs and use this uh, outreach of, uh, program officers to, to make it known what, what the work of the office uh, of a public protector do and, and for people to know. And, and the most important thing is to, to avoid delay in investigations because uh, justice delayed is justice denied. Okay. I think sometimes uh, some of, of, of the members of public go on protest because uh, their issues are not resolved timely. Okay. Thank That's you very it. much. Oh. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lack of budgeting. Honorable <laughs> Jalia. <laughs> Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, good morning, uh, Advocate Debello. Debello. Okay. Uh, afternoon, Honorable Member. <laughs> no, thank you. So, uh, no. Uh, just taking after what uh, my colleague was has been asking about these uh, important issues. I just want to find out from you, from the questionnaire that you have been given, they requested that you identify the key challenges that we are having in yes. the country. And the first thing that you have mentioned, it was the issue of uh, corruption within the legal departments yes. of the state entities. Can you elaborate on that? Yes. Um, um... I'm in the, in, in, in the practice of law. I've, I've observed in certain matters where uh, the state is, is defending a claim of 50,000 through a legal process of appointing an attorney and a counsel uh, who at the end of the day will, will, will charge 500,000. So you, you, you can see that uh, there could be a possible or a potential uh, corrupt activity happening there. Okay, or maybe, uh, 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 let's say, for example, the state wants to sue a particular person for a claim of 20,000 rent, and then they appoint a council who is going to charge more fees than the amount claimed. Uh, that should be considered as a uh, corrupt activity. And I think uh, it's about time that the Office of the Public Protector moves into zooming uh, into that uh, particular aspect because there is, there is a lot of corruption. Uh, I don't think every matter uh, in, the, in, in the Office of, of State Organs should be resolved through litigation. There are other processes of mediation uh, which can resolve this dispute without 
uh, pay more legal costs. So that is a, a very serious concern because I'm in that, in that space. I know of that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tebele. Um, <clears throat> the second question is that uh, uh, you have indicated in your CV that, uh, yes, you, you, you have worked at the Constitutional Court. Yes. And then also you have uh, experience you have in, uh, you have res, uh, research skills. Yes. So I just want to find out how are you going to use that experience to make a genuine impact on the lives of the ordinary South Africans, as if you are taken as a deputy public protector. Yes. I think uh, the first thing is the research the research skills uh, would me would put me uh, in a advantageous position. Uh, to have an oversight or, or, or monetary mechanism on the, the investigations. Uh, for instance, uh, how evidence is obtained? Uh, is it lawful, uh, uh, I mean, through lawful processes or not? So uh, I think basically uh, my skill will, will, will help me to have a good monitoring uh, system. On, on the investigations. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, the last question for you is that uh, you, you just indicated that you are more of pro bono than issues of catch. You know? Yes. And um, I, I just want to understand, because you said when you were responding earlier, that now you want to use your skill in a broader scale with the, what you have been doing in, in, in you know, in my private expanding your years. So I just want to find out, you must be have maybe thought of the, the plan that you might use uh, if you are taken in, in this position of a deputy public protector. Can you elaborate on that? On, on the... The plans. Or the plan that maybe is you thought. In fact, as, as you are coming, you, you, you really want to be a public pro, a deputy pro, pro project. Yes. Yes. So you, you have seen all those challenges. So you want to, you, have a, you must be having a plan that if I get to the office, in that office, what is it that I'm planning to do in order to bring change uh, in, the, in, the, in the challenges that you are experiencing as a country? I think that the, the first plan is that uh, I want to make that office known. I don't think it's, it's, it's known enough. I'm, I'm from a rural village in Skukul. Uh, very few people know about the office of the public protector. And programs uh, would be at the forefront of my program. Uh, should I be appointed? Because that, that office serves a very Uh, important role of protecting the members of the public. But the members of the public cannot uh, be set.
about the function of the office. And, and uh, uh, I think the, uh, another most important thing is to encourage those employed in that office uh, to know about the importance of the office and maybe to bring up about incentives uh, as to how to incentivize them to, to be able to, to have courage to, to come to work and to serve the members of public. That, that is not an ordinary office. It's, it's extraordinary office is the objective of being a media, a, 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 I mean, a, 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 a connection between uh, the public uh, and the government. I think it's, it's very much important for, for people to know about that office. I'm Wilma Neodruchen, a South African Sign Language, and this is my sign language interpreter, Trudy, who's voicing for me. You will hear her voice. Um, I 
would like to ask you because I, 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 I am not Right, I'm a social worker. I'm a registered as a social worker. So. To the person who nominated you had a very long story about you being a non bar person and you be non bar I'm assuming that you're not registered with any bar and parts of a bar yes uh, I think thing actually uh, able to go to the uh, question is do it happen to I just want to share uh, the first case my first file has he asked me uh, the best the you said ever inter to have any body relation is bro the are very okay how would you address a situ how would you address any situation when an organ of state ignores or refuses to implement any remedial action that would need to be addressed. How would you deal with that situation? I think we, we have a precedent in the case of Nganda, uh, where uh, there was uh, a, a, a bit of uh, resistance uh, on the implementation of, of the remedial action of the public protector. And then uh, one of the political parties approached the court to say, this, this must be done. And uh, my view is that if, if there is a resistance uh, from the organs of state to Im implement remedial action, uh, proper procedures is that the matter must be referred to National Assembly and for National Assembly to uh, use its own processes to, to have the remedial actions implemented. And if, if not so, then uh, we will resort to court processes. How is import, how, how, how is advocacy important in reaching out to marginalized communities? Because lack of knowledge amounts to injustice in the sense that if I don't know where to run to in, 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 in a case of a need, then I'll remain in the dark. So I think advocacy is very much important. Uh, Access of the office of the public protector is very much important. People must know about that office. Okay. What do you think are some of the successes that the current public protector or even previous had that you are, you know of or are aware of? The, the previous. And okay. It can be any public protector. I think the, the most outstanding is the is the one of of Uganda matter. Yes, because in that matter, uh, 
that decision uh, is, a, is, a, is a clear example of, of the fact that there is a need for implementation of the remedial action and the importance of the, of the remedial action. And, 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 and most importantly, the, the role of the National Assembly in ensuring that there is compliance on the part of the executives. Okay. Are you able to give us possibly a few inno innovative initiatives um, which could assist the public protector um, to deliver on its mandate from your own, your own yeah, initiatives? Yes. I think uh, in, 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 20, in 2011, when I was in, in, in I think, oh, I was, I was still at the university, uh, I was awarded a, 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 an, an award of Men of the Year Award by Brothers for Life and in collaboration with South African National AIDS Council. That, that award uh, was given to me for my valuable contribution to the community. Uh, I had programs which I was doing in high school and at university uh, which are, are very much important. And then I was awarded, uh, okay, the, I think. Did you hear me? Did you understand my yes, question? Yes, I'm coming, I'm coming. Okay. Yes. And then uh, the most important thing about that award was that I was doing that work without pay. So I'm coming to uh, the only members question it's important for the staff in the office of the public protector to be recognized for their As much as you can criticize the employees, I think it's very much important to have maybe an award committee within the office of the public protector to give awards maybe annually on the best uh, province or the best performing employees within a particular uh, province so that they can be uh, uh, motivated uh, sorry uh, uh, And leave. I think happy impulse uh, will result in good uh, outcome. If they are happy, if they are, if they have a reason to go to work, then they will they'll, 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 they'll deliver. And and you may you may take it lightly, uh, light. But if you want to progress in life, you go for the next, and then you produce. That certificate is not monetary, but in terms of 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 of, of uh, uh, motivation, is very much important. Been advised that uh, some not good, cutting off uh, people who are connecting on social media can't follow us properly. That can be added urgently. Uh, Honourable Brach. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, sir. Afternoon, Honourable Member. I, I don't. 
I don't want to ask a lot of lots and lots of questions, so I'm going to make a few observations that I got from your questionnaire that you filled in and your CV. Um, after which I will pose a question and your answer you may or may not um, give comment on observations that I make, make to make it easier. Um, in your documents that you submitted, there is no indication of um, specific investigative skills, um, specialized knowledge, which governs your question at the big corruption. Um, this is of Africa, um, a deputy. The bulk of the public protectors. In of course, uh, let me just. Uh, a number of review applications. Uh, I think I, I, I know something about public administration on, on, that, on, that, on that perspective. So the, the issue of what, what should the public protect had to uh, do to ensure uh, an address of, of systematic uh, challenges, if, if I get the, the question correct. I think the the most important thing is how investigations are done. Because if investigations are slow, that will obviously affect uh, the, the process. So there should be a, a system in place to ensure that there is a speed up of the investigations. and. Uh, if we have 3,000 cases pending, that will obviously affect the new cases. So I think there is a need to come up with a strategy to ensure that uh, cases, are, I mean investigations, are, are completed as soon as possible to allow a space for the new complaints to be dealt with. So I think the issue of time frames uh, and and and. Uh, Case management, uh, for instance, uh, there should be a, a, a committee dealing with the case management in the sense that uh, they should observe which matters are old uh, in the office and then how to ensure that the process, I mean, that the investigations are complete and the reports are issued. Okay, now that's great. Then just my last question, can you quickly give us an explanation of the difference in the scope and mandate of the South African Human Rights Commission and the public protector. The, the South African Human Rights Commission, which is one of the Chapter 9 institutions, is mandated specifically uh, to investigate on, on matters of human rights mm -hmm. only. And the Office of the Public Protector, uh, its mandate is to investigate any possible uh, corrupt uh, activity uh, on the, and, and maladministration on the part of the organs of state. But uh, there, there could be an, an, a slight overlap of, 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 of responsibilities or duties uh, in the sense that uh, a, a a matter of maladministration may go into the heart of a human right. And uh, that, that, that means that uh, a, a, a matter in falling under the office of the public protector may also uh, fall within the jurisdiction of the Human Rights Commission. Thank so you there's, very much. there's a slight over, 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 overlap. Thank you very much. Um, are there any further hands? Well, Honorable Horn. Oh, we're not. Are we still on the list, No, we were not that at oh. the beginning. No, the list was redrafted. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, you know, some parties that happens, we have some victims. Um, but yes, some of them are here. Let me continue. Thank you. Surrounded by them, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Good, good afternoon, sir.
Okay, proceed. Okay. Um, yeah, <laughs> so you you spoke about the the powers and well, really the the uh, powers and authority of the public protector to deal with maladministration, improper conduct in the public space, and and what we want uh, like to refer to as as corruption. When you earlier were asked what would be your two focus areas, you said your first focus area would be access to justice. Can you un unpack for us how in light of that fairly limited authority of the public protector to look into maladministration and as we say corruption, how you will link that to access to justice? Okay. Uh, let, let me, okay, I think uh, I omitted a most important uh, 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 weight in, 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 in the issue of justice, social justice. <coughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate. elaborate. Uh, the matters which are presented before the public protect, most of them involve social justice. <coughs> Uh, but sir, sorry to interrupt you. When you when you unpack your your priority areas, you, you specifically talked about, for example, legal fees, etc. That's not yes. That, that, that's another another part of of, of of justice. Yes. Yeah, but at that point, you said that would be your first priority. Yes. So I'm asking you to explain that answer in light of the the areas of of authority of the public protectors of. So let me make it more simple. Yes, sir. In your assessment, how is uh, uh, barriers to access to justice in terms of our cause caused by maladministration and corruption? How is how is barriers that prevent people from ac accessing our justice system caused by maladministration and or corruption? I, I don't. I don't get the question, <laughs> sir. You said one of the primary, your first primary focus area would be addressing issues of access to justice. That's preventing South Africans from accessing our justice <coughs> system, making use of the avenues available to them. We've now confirmed that you know that the Public Protector's Office has authority to deal with maladministration and corruption. Yes. So I'm asking you, how then, if, if the first focus area will be to deal with lack of access or barriers to access to justice, what maladministration and corruption is causing those barriers which you want to address as a deputy public protector? Oh, okay. Uh, if, if, if I understand the question, I think... Uh, I, my, my point was that uh, corruption and maladministration uh, have impact on on access to justice in the sense that uh, that's why I, I, I wanted to also add the issue of, of social justice in the sense that uh, if you you if a corrupt activity, for example, let's say the distribution of, 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 of housing in South Africa, RDP houses, for example, uh, is, is not done accordingly uh, with element of corruption involved. Uh, those who are supposed to be the receivers of, of, of or the beneficiaries of the housing programs uh, will, not, uh, will, will, will be denied justice uh, in the sense that they may not even have an opportunity to, to challenge certain decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Pridenbach. Uh, thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, Mr. Chabili. Good afternoon, Honorable Member. Um, I see that you have some considerable experience in uh, constitutional law. 
Yes. You have lectured constitutional law at Fitz yes. University. Yes, I did. And um, and you've studied and obtained degrees at uh, the University of California. Yes. So you've done very well for, uh, as you put it, an orphan from KZN. So well done. Thanks. Very well done. Very admirable. Thanks. Um, I presume that you're familiar with the uh, doctrine of stare decisis. Yes. And how do you think that finds application, if at all, in the office of the public protector? Uh, the, the decisions taken by courts uh, in respect of the matters of public protector uh, shall remain binding on the office of the public protector. And unless they are, they are, they are, they are, they are set aside uh, by a higher court, yes. So the Office of the Public Protector uh, must respect all the decisions taken by courts of law in relation to certain uh, issues on litigation. And if you are appointed as the Deputy Public Protector, how will you ensure that that happens? The, the, okay, I think I I would observe the law. You think so? You would do so. Uh, I'll, I'll, okay, I will respect the decisions of the court yes. uh, in relation to uh, that office. Matters taken, uh, uh, I mean, decision taken by court uh, on on issues issues relating to office of the public protect. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, any other hand, Honorable Mkwebane? Advocate Dibaila, how are you? Uh, afternoon, Honorable Mkwebane. Um, I must declare that um, I know you in terms of Rule 30 of the Parliamentary Rules, that you are the one who took my matter uh, pro bono to the African Union. Um, I think that's what was delaying all this process because it was the challenge whether I must proceed to interview you. But then um, I'm declaring now um, that will be part of the record and the decision is taken by a collective, not only me as a member of this particular committee. Um, advocate, um, You've done a lot of work, yes, as far as the issue of uh, maladministration is concerned, and you tried to be impactful in your work. Can you then indicate, um, I think as a follow-up on the issue of um, uh, working in that particular office, being the deputy public protector, being the one who is uh, delegated work by the public protector, especially on issues of service delivery and maladministration, but a lot on issues of um, alternative dispute resolution. How would you then make sure that as an executive, because you won't be a manager in this office, you are going to be at the same level as an executive, make sure that um, the investigations which are conducted in that particular office um, are uh, investigations which when signed or taken to the public protector and also passing through you on some of them, depending on your delegation. Um, how would you deal with the, um, the investigation staff or the supervisors of those staff members who then bring um, the investigation um, reports which are not a true reflection of what actually transpired and uh, not revealing certain information on that particular investigation because it's not you who conduct the investigation, it's them. And on top of that, when the matter is taken to court, not revealing all the records in terms of Rule 53. And in some instances, the very same supervisor um, not um, respecting the court judgment or implementing the court judgment. As the executive, how would you deal with that kind of a matter? 
I think the, the first the first uh, step is at at investigation level. Uh, the moment I, I I realized that there could be some. The person, if you can allow the honourable members to give the candidate an opportunity because they are making noise. To just, uh, I'm sorry to just budge in because I think I'm trying to listen and they are also speaking. Thank you very much. We are protected. Please proceed. I think uh, it's very much important that at investigation level. Uh, I must satisfy myself first that uh, proper things have been done. Uh, and if, if I have a suspicion that things could not have been done properly, uh, I would advise that uh, those issues be rectified uh, to the satisfaction of the Office of the Public Protector and to avoid a situation where uh, reports of public protect are reviewed on, 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 on procedural aspects and then only to find that uh, they are set aside and that amounts to uh, uh, wasteful expenditure. So I think the most important thing is that uh, I'm going to try to ensure that investigations are done properly and both parties are heard uh, before the report can be signed off. But then, um, the issue is you are getting a final product where you are told every information is there, it's provided, but then there's information which is not there. But that's one thing. The situation where there's a court judgment which says, um, as the public protector, you need to um, reinvestigate this particular matter and uh, because all these matters are, are delegated to the executive to, de the, to the staff to deal with and that particular manager or supervisor is not um, implementing that and the public protector is faced with the situation where they violate the court order. The very same thing of respecting the court judgments. I think uh, the appropriate steps should be taken uh, against such conduct. Uh, maybe disciplinary measures should be taken. If, but, but before any disciplinary measure can be taken, I think it's, it's very much important uh, for the purpose of uh, collegiality to, to sit down with that particular uh, employee and, and discuss the issues. And if there is no uh, amicable resolution of the issue, then uh, proper procedures of disciplinary uh, measures uh, then should, should, should unfold. What is your view about, um, because 95% or 90% indeed of the public protector is your um, bread and butter issues, um, they are service delivery related, um, how can we um, expeditiously deal with those matters as the Office of the Public Protector? Uh, and how can we uh, make sure that um, we get the public servants to understand that what is the intention of the Public Protector in the whole process so that they are more cooperative and understand that the Public Protector is there to help them instead of uh, being antagonistic towards them? I think part of the of the question I, 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 I dealt with it uh, earlier on when I mentioned that there is I think the issue of backlog there is a need for case management in that office to to check uh, matters which are old and which are new and how best uh, to deal with old old matters and and the question is what makes this matter to be in this office for two years if this is an issue of investigations then what can be done to ensure that investigations are completed? Uh, case management is very much important in that office. And then... Thank you. Thank you very much. Honorable Judge. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Tebel. Honorable Member. Have you done some research before this interview today? Have I? Done some research. 
for this position that you're applying for? Yes. Okay. What's the budget of that office currently? Uh, I think the, 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 the recent annual report I read is An about 356 million. 350. Are, you, are you guessing? No, it's three, 356 million. The, the last uh, annual. Current budget. I'm asking the current budget. Yes. That's not an annual report. No, no, it's, it's, it's in the annual report. The current budget that ends at the end of this month. You don't know, that's fine. Do you know what are the programs that are there in that office? How many programs are there? Uh, programs? Okay, okay. I'm, I'm, but, but, uh, uh, if, no, programs. Uh, the units, uh, I, I know of, of, of three, yeah, three, yeah, three, there will be programs. Uh, administration and uh, stakeholders and investigations. Okay, yes. let's stay on investigations. The Constitutional Court uh, in, in the Saab and CX matter made an adverse finding uh, on, on the former public protector um, that uh, her methods of investigations were flawed. Are you aware of that? Yes. Do you agree with that judgment? Yeah, I think. I see you smiling, yes, but I'm, I'm yes, just asking yes. a question. Do, do you agree with that judgment? Yes. Uh, that says the former public protector, Advocate Mukwebane, uh, had, had flawed uh, approach on investigation. Yes, I think. You so, agree? You agree with that judgment? Yeah, from the from the reading of the judgment, uh, I, I I I agree that the, there are some loopholes on the investigations. Hmm. Yes. And, and 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 what are those loopholes that uh, you think? Uh, the former public protector would have committed? Uh, not giving a opportunity for, for, for other parties to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tebele. Are you aware of uh, the Mail and Guardian case on investigations, on the approach on investigations? No. Okay. That's, that's your homework. That's part of the research work. Uh, you can do that uh, thank you, and thank some you. other time. It's very important. Uh, it, it informs how investigations need to be approached uh, in, in, in that space. Now, in, in your 95% pro bono, I'm just, I'm just curious and interested. Um, any of the people who've done pro bono for this 95%, including Advocate Nkwebani, have they assisted you at least with some accommodation, booking? Recording in this, progress. Uh, uh, have they? I, uh, less, being, being an advocate, being an exception, I dealt with the most indigent. What, what do you mean, being an exception? That is not indigent. No, no, no. Uh, 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 I'm not, okay, there are, there are reasons why I, I, I did that pro bono, which I cannot uh, disclose uh, before the committee. Yes. But I, I want the, the point I'm trying to. You, make you is, got my question. Eh? Yes. The question is very specific. Yes. I dealt with most indigent people who cannot even afford a file with an attorney. Just a mere consultation. And, so, and, and, and so your answer to my question is all of them assisted you with nothing? Yes. Including Advocate Mkweba. I, that's what I'm saying. I. You did yes, a pro bono yes, for her as well, yes, eh? yes. It's it's here. It's in your papers. Yes. So please don't run away on it. From yes. It. Just answer the question. Yes. Uh, she also didn't give, assist you with anything. No, I no, ma yes. no material, no accommodation, no transportation, and so on. Yes. Okay. Now, in the case you are doing on behalf of Advocate Mkweban, do you have an instructing attorney um, that would, would have instructed you on this, or you just got uh, no, the instructions? From, yeah. from eh? The process in, in the African Commission is different from the South African uh, uh, legal system. Okay. So you'd uh, attain uh, to be. Yes. Okay. Uh, the, the, the Bangalore principles for judicial uh, conduct uh, list six core values. Just want to, to help me with two. They're of core values of conduct. Just help me with two independence and integrity. Yes. And share with this interview panel what's your understanding of the issue of independence and integrity. 
in, in, when somebody says must okay. have integrity, what do they mean or expect? And as well as independence. I think in the in the specifically within the, the space of the office of the public protector is that uh, you must be someone who is aware of the fact that uh, you will be investigating at some point the most powerful uh, people in the country. And when you do that, you must do that without fear, favor, or prejudice. And you must apply the law. Thank you. At all costs. Thank you. Integrity. You just dealt with indep independence, am I right? Yes. Integrity. You, you, you must ensure that things are done in accordance with the legal prescripts and uphold the law at all times. Okay, last year, what's your understanding of the perception of bias? Bias. Perception of bias. Is where, where, when a person, uh, for example, uh, when, when I'm a judicial officer and my, maybe my, 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 my the person I know, uh, maybe I've done business with, uh, appears before me. That's it? Yes. Uh, there could be a, a perception that I may favor that person in terms of, of my judgment. <laughs> yes, but uh, it, it should be actual bias. How do you remedy that? Yes, go, go ahead. How if, if there is a perception of bias that exists. Okay, in a, in a, in a judicial space, uh, obviously, uh, I'll disclose uh, that to the parties before me and then and ask them if they are comfortable to, for me to proceed with the matter. I pause there, Chair. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Advocate Tebele, uh, when you were growing up, maybe as a law student, did you have any aspirations of being a judge? You ask within the given time. Oh, I didn't use even half of my time. <laughs> yes. Yes, I, I, I wanted to be a lawyer, and I also aspired to become a judge. And fortunately, last year I was an acting judge uh, in Limpopo. And in fact, when I started my career, I started my career at the Constitutional Court, and I was inspired by the sense of humor okay. uh, of the judges there. So I want to also end up uh, being a judge of the Constitutional Court, if uh, time so permits. Okay. So when you were doing your clerkship at the Constitutional Court, were you already admitted as an advocate? No, I started in July 2012, and then I got admitted in May 2013. So I was admitted when I was still a, a law researcher then, just two months before. So you admitted I, in 2013? Yes. Yes, because it's important for us to calculate the number of years, because it is in the act. Yes. So that is why I was asking it. Yes, I got admitted in 2013, in May. Thank you very much. Um, did you find the interviews to be f fair? Yes, uh, I found them to be fair. Were the questions reasonable and fair? Yes, you and uh, most in uh, importantly, I think uh, the process is, is, is very engaging and uh, objective uh, to be sure that the candidate to occupy that office is fit and proper person to be appointed into that office. No, thank you very much for availing yourself. And most importantly, uh, you, you were able to speak to South Africans, especially to young people who share your plight that you can still overcome despite you can overcome those adversities. Um, it was a very important message. 
Uh, thank you, Chip. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you for availing yourself. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Thank you, honorable members. Thank you. Uh, members, can we adjourn for lunch? Do we want the full hour or we reduce? Hmm? I just wanted to check, check. G -g 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 given the fact that the, the, the next run they would have waited from that time, are we able to go through and then have lunch after that? So instead of uh, delay, postponing it for another hour. What is the view of other members? Do we take the next candidate? Yeah. Uh, yeah. She's been waiting. Yeah. Do, do, do we take her and then we go for lunch? Yes. Okay. But she might she might also faint because she's hungry. <laughs> so let, so okay. Let's take let's take uh, one the, the the next candidate and we can break for lunch. <laughs> But with this chair, am I fine or is it fine? Yes. Yeah. 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 Six, twenty seven. 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 All these decisions is no more implications for next week. Good afternoon, Ms. Mokhaladi. Good afternoon, Chepeza. Uh, uh, before we start, we would like to, to apologize to you uh, for the delay. Certain things happened which were beyond our control. You have been dealing with serious anxiety. should have been long. And now, uh, we would like to apologize for that. Um, it's a way of apologizing. We are going to allow you to drink water. 
えっとえっとえっとえっとえっとえっとえっとえっとえっとえっとえっとえっとえっとえっとえっとえっとえっとえっとえっとえっとえっとえっとえっとえっとえっとえっとえ Thank you, Chair.、Uh, in light of the, the、uh, fact that African Kabani says that I know this candidate and somehow I have a preference for her,、uh, I have no personal recollection of ever having met this candidate. Would you just please inquire the candidate if she knows me? Because I have no recollection of it. So if I knew her, I would declare, but I'm unable to. But if she knows me, she can say so. So, you've got nothing to declare? No. So, it's fine. Let's proceed.、Um, your values, you are the right person.、Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson. Honorable members, the degree of BB,、um, and I have also, through the years, I have obtained several short courses. That include strategic management, corporate governance, as executive development in the office of the attorney, detailed litigation. I was I eight. So from the state attorney's office, I joined Salga as a labor relations officer. My main responsibilities at Salga entailed representing municipalities at the CCMA mainly, as well as supporting the employer. Component at the South African Local Government Bargaining Council. From there, I joined the Office of the Public Protector as a senior investigator and I progressed through the ranks in the Office of the Public Protector. I possess necessary skills. I have about 23 years in the Office of the Public Protector, 16 of which was at management level. Investigation teams. I have experience in the different key Monday i n v e s t i g a t i o n of the public protectors, that is from investigation of maladministration, improper conduct, abuse of power, breach of allegations of, of the code of ethics by members of the executives,、uh, allegations of undue delay.、Um, additional to that, I spent a period of four years in the c i t s where, and that exposed me to the corporate side of the sector. My r e s i n the c i t s office in t monitoring and my performance of the organization as well as reporting on that, facilitating internal and external. Audit as well as assisting with the drafting of the annual report and also monitoring the various units with regard to policy development. The positive deputy public protectivity position is to provide support to the public protector in carrying out. The constitutional need to investigate, to report, to take appropriate remedial action. The experience that I have acquired within the organization has provided me with sufficient skills to be in a position to support the public protector in carrying out the mandate. Additionally, the, required, the, the responsibilities of the public protector entails oversight over the entire organization, as well as providing strategic direction and policy in the organization. So, the experience me for that. The public protector to make qualified abilities and Direct also, and stakeholder management, 
We collaborate with the state incidents in investigation, FedEight resolution of complaints. The case in point is the initiative that I started with the compensation fund. Historically, we had a high number of complaints that we received against the compensation fund. I embarked on a process where we consolidated on the complaints. We met on monthly, on monthly basis with the chief operations officer of the compensation fund. Currently, on the system, we only have two. Additional to that is, um, I, I, I feel that in terms of leadership, my leadership style, I, it's, it's mainly visionary as well as coaching. I have sufficient experience. I am currently managing a team of about two chief investigators as well as about 20 investigators. So in providing support to the public protector, I, I, I do have the sufficient experience to carry the role of the of the of the deputy public protector. Importantly around leadership, the 2024 definition of leadership entails principles such as resilience, empathy, um, I believe that I do possess the, 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 the capabilities to carry the responsibilities at the leadership. And I can provide over, over the position. Part of the responsibilities uh, um, require in the absolute protect that the deputy can stand in on, on behalf of the public protector in the event that the skills and qualities to, to perform the response service delivery, especially to... to Thank you. Uh, members, any questions? Honorable Master Gojere, Honorable Ramulo Bea, Honorable Khan, Honorable Nobot Tuchan, Honorable Mola, in that order. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Mokhaladi. Good afternoon, Honorable And how are you, sis? I'm good, and you? I'm fine. Yes, my name is Noma Tunda Maseko Chele, member of the committee. I just want clarity first before I, 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 I continue with uh, my questions. Uh, on your CV, on page three, you indicated that uh, your, the name of your employer up to now it's uh, Public Protector South Africa. And uh, you indicate, uh, for example, the, for the period, is, is it uh, from um, 2012? <coughs> So when I count from 2012 to now, it's 12 years. You'll correct me. I need clarity. Yes, I remember. Yes. yes. And uh, when you go to page, same page, paragraph A, uh, also to the one that you spoke to on page 5, which is B, you indicated that you have, got, uh, you have accumulated a total of 23 years of investigation experience in the different roles in the public protector, protector's office. So my clarity question would be, if I add, do I have to add those years or do you subtract from the 23, you subtract 12 or, because here I'm, I'm, I'm a bit confused. Just tell me, because you also indicated that uh, there's this 16 years um, managing investigations, all that. So to me, it's, it's, there's uh, something that I don't understand. Can you please clarify to me exactly? Because okay. if I add this 12 and 23, it gives me 50 something. And then we okay. all that. So okay, uh, okay. Honorable member, I, I don't have a copy of the CV. I can check and clarify. But if I may clarify, I first joined the Office of the Public Protector on the 1st of December 2000 as a senior investigator. In 2004, I was appointed as a chief investigator in the Office of the Public Protector. 2006, still within the Office of the Public Protector, I moved to the Office of the CEO in the Public Protector. And 
in 2012, the 12 years that you're talking about, I was appointed executive manager. Initially, the position was administrative justice and civil service delivery. But later on in 2019, the position was merged and it was called executive manager investigations. So from the 1st of December 2000, I have been with the public office of the public protector. In short, you don't have 32 years experience. No, no, honorable man. Okay, thank you. No, 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 okay. My second question will be, you also indicate in, in your CV that you've worked with the uh, DPP, the former DPP, uh, for how long? Um, I, wa I worked with the former DPP from, what happened was that the former DPP was delegated the responsibility to deal with what you call administrative justice and service delivery members. So as the executive manager responsible for administrative justice and service delivery matters, I worked closely with him because part of his responsibilities entailed oversight over those matters, as well as conducting inspection, both at head office and provinces. So I worked closely with him. It was for a period of three years whilst I was still, but I had not moved from my, my core position. It was something that I was doing over and above my responsibility as executive manager. So what do you take from that experience in relation to <clears throat> this position as if you happen to be taken? Um, what I take from that is the importance of executive oversight over investigations, especially because the executive is based at her office, especially interaction at provincial level. Whilst at provincial level, it entailed inspection to monitor the progress. It also served as an opportunity for the executive to provide guidance in some of the investigations, especially older matters where the investigator found themselves stuck with, with some of those investigations. So what I take from there is that it's very important. It's an important and a critical function in the in the Office of the Public Protector, where you've got different provincial as well as regional offices. Um, with regard to the employees, it's also important because people who are based in the provinces and regional offices, they often feel that they are abandoned. So that ongoing interaction by the executive, it's, it, it, gives them, it gives them that inclusivity and they feel that they are part of the organization not that they are sitting somewhere in the provinces. So taking from there, if I am to be appointed, it is one of the things that I would continue. Maybe I would support the public protector in terms of carrying out that responsibility. The responsibilities of the public protector, it's the key mandate areas are very vast. So if I were to be appointed, it would be something that I would initiate and make sure that it happens with Advocate Malunga, we used to do it on quarterly basis, where we would visit the different, visit the different provincial offices. Okay. And we spend about three days in each and every provincial office. Okay, can I just get, my last question would be, uh, what are the current, current uh, challenges, challenges within the, the public protector's office that you think when you get into the office, you'll start with them, if you are? Um, it is considered as deputy public protector. Currently, the key thing that I would start working on is picking up the morale of the staff members. Um, it is common knowledge that there has been incidents that were traumatic to staff members. There are initiatives and measures that have been put in place, but I think it is important as the leadership of the organization to make sure that we exercise the oversight and we monitor. Even though there are programs that have been put in place, it would be important to make sure that there is that oversight from the level of the executive to make sure that we don't leave some of the staff members. There might be some of them that are taking long to try and adjust and to try and move on. So I would exercise that oversight. The other function that is important, which is a challenge, we receive a high number of complaints, but at the moment, most of the cases are resolved based on investigation. The first step that I would take is to make sure that 
There are refresher training that are conducted for staff members and those who have never been trained on mediation to give them the opportunity and to entrench that culture of resolving complaints through alternative dispute resolution. Alternative dispute resolution is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. So the next one. Honorable Ramulubia. Thanks, Chair. <coughs> Good afternoon. Um, my name is Anthea Chumoto Ramulubi. I'm a member of the Portfolio Committee. Taking from the last question that you were asked by Honorable Chele um, on when you ask if you are appointed to ascend to the position of the DPP, um, what is it that you would do? And basing it from your response on training and stuff. Since you were one of those who were heading at the, whether it's executive level or managerial level, um, investigation and so forth, you didn't think at that particular time you were heading that aspect, you should be able to take investigators to refresher trainings or those relevant training you were speaking about. Okay. Thank you, Honorable Member. Uh, it is part of the program that is in the organization, but over the, the past financial years, we've had resource constraints. Um, I am talking, we, we have received additional funding from CARA. Part of the programs where they, we, we couldn't proceed with programs because of the financial constraints. Since we have obtained CARA funding, it would provide us with that opportunity to, to provide the training. Internally, we still continued to provide the, the, the training internally, but however, it's important that we get the training that is focused and assesses the skill of each and every employee and make sure that it addresses the gaps that each and every one of them has. In you working with the team of investigators um, or leading them at that position, do you have any key successes stories of investigations that your team has done? Um, and if you kindly possibly take us one or two of those successes? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Um, the first matter that I can think of, which is an example of what we call the conduct failure matters, the team investigated the complaint that related to against, the complaint against the Minister of Defense relating to a flight to Zimbabwe. The allegation was that in the flight there were some members of the ANC who accompanied the minister in the flight. We issued a report and took appropriate remedial action in the, in the report. Um, we have received confirmation from the respondents that remedial action is being, is being implemented on that matter. It was not taken on review. Another example of what we call the bread and butter issues, it's a complaint of the complainant who approached the public protector her partner was working for the Department of Correctional Services. He died on duty and was shot. And as part of the policy of the Department of Correctional Services, there is an amount that has to be paid to the dependents of the deceased. But however, in this instance, the complainants lodged the claim, but the department did not pay the dependent paid the matter of the deceased. We embarked on a process, the hybrid process of investigation as well as mediating on the, on the particular dispute. The report was issued last year and it has already been implemented. The remedial action that the public protector took in that matter was that that money should be paid to, to the estate, the late estate account that was paid. So the, the, the matter has been implemented. Thank you. Do you believe that the public protector does give enough support to whistleblowers, especially explaining the two matters that you spoke of? Um, who exposes malpractice and corruption in, in the public service, and this is all institution at large when you receive those complaints? Um, currently, the legislative framework is, is not sufficient for the public protector to, to protect whistleblowers. As a result, part of the proposed amendments 
to to the public protect that act is that there should be more more emphasis around protection of whistleblowers. But however, internally as a public protector, there are steps that we take to protect them, such as we keep the, them anonymous, we don't record their names, and we do everything possible. But but the current legal framework is, is creating a hindrance to us providing effective protection to, to whistleblowers. Are you are you trained to deal with conflict? management or in any instance yes okay have you ever had any conflict matter that you personally dealt with in your workspace okay um generally due to to the nature of the issues that we deal with in the public protector we tend to have that conflictual relationship with the with the complainants in the sense that some of them they approach the public protector where they are already they had been following up on their cases. Some of them, they've already lost their properties and their assets. And some of them tend to, to, to blame us as investigators. And some of them would even insinuate that we, we have taken bribes. So there has been several cases, not really several, not, let me not say several. There has been incidents where some of them would accuse me of having received bribes. Okay. But what is important? Th thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, Honorable Hon. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, um, Honorable Member. So one of the things this portfolio committee invariably and individual members as well is confronted with is, is individual let's, individuals in society who say I laid a complaint with the public protector's office somewhere, um, but one of two things happened. Either I never heard from them again, or they just informed me that my file has been closed. So what should be done differently in order to address that, that uh, perception out there that ultimately the public protector is not willing or able to deal with every single one of the complaints. Thank you, Honourable Member. Um, the most important thing is oversight that needs to be exercised by the, by the public protector and the deputy public protector. Currently, we have a case management system. It's got the element where from 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 where you are sitting as the as the head of the organization or even the manager, you are able to zoom in into a particular case. The service standards in the public protector says updates, feedback must be provided to the complainant over six weeks. So we are able to zoom in and check into the system. But what we we did as part of the good governance last week last year as an organization at investigations at head office, we set aside a day in a month where we say we're leaving everything, we're following up on the cases and making sure that we update all the complainants. Due to the number of the cases that we have at head office, it might not always be possible to provide update in that particular day. But what we do is that we take turns and we move it to the following month. But as, as required by the service standard, it's very important and the case management assist in monitoring and following up on that. And case closures, what happens is that the closure of cases needs to be done at the level of the manager so that the manager takes accountability to avoid the situation where the, the file is closed without the complainant being informed. Okay, so um, one of the, the um, potential amendments to the Public Protector Act that has been mooted over time by some is to criminalize and, uh, a, when, uh, let's say, criminalize a failure to, to uh, implement remedial action. What is your personal view on, on, those, on that proposal? Um, my personal view is it's, it's twofold. It's a yes and a no. What we have picked up as a public protector is what, for lack of a better word, what we call the repeat offenders where there has been several remedial action that has been made against the same entity and they continue to ignore the public protector and not implement remedial action. And within that category, currently what is happening is that before 
a report is signed off by the public protector. We engage the organization and we get their inputs on, on those. So with regard to, to that category, those who are what I call repeat offenders and those that we have engaged and they have confirmed with us that remedial action is implementable, my answer is yes, it must be criminalized. But we have old matters in the organization. Some of those reports date back to during Advocate Madonsela's time, where remedial action is still not implemented. With regard to those case, old cases, my suggestion would be a no. Let's rather adopt the approach of engaging with the executive authority in the different institutions and discussing with them and checking what are the challenges, because some of the challenges might be that the remedial action is not implementable. The, the Act also says the deputy only has the powers, oh, the authority, the functions delegated to it by the public protector. In your, after your 23 years of experience, what's the, the ideal delegation that should go to the deputy? Um, the ideal delegation, in my viewpoint, there are two categories of, of matters, what we call the conduct failure and what we call service failure and the administrative justice. My ideal would be where the delegation for, 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 for service failure and administrative lapses is delegated to the deputy public protector and the public protector can then focus on conduct failure and abuse of power matters. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Advocate Bretemba. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, madam. Good afternoon, honourable member. Uh, in your view, is the institution of the public protector a passive adjudicator between citizens and the state, or does the institution have a more investigative, investigatory role requiring proaction in certain circumstances? And please give reasons for your answer. Um, the, the public protector is not a passive adjudicator. The powers of the public protector, the investigative powers of the public protector were tested in the Malian Guardian judgment, where the court held that the role of the public protector in investigating cases is not of a passive adjudicator. The public protector needs to investigate and follow up and keep on digging until the public protector is convinced that the truth has been told. So it's not, it's not a passive adjudicator, but it's, it's, it, it requires intense investigation to uncover the truth. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Are there any further hands? Oh. Just to, is Honorable Velma? Um, Honourable Janje. Honourable, thank you, Honourable Chair. Um, good afternoon, Ma'am Mongaladi. So I'm using South African Sign Language, and this is my signing to interpreter Francois Daisel. Um, I would like to follow up what you recently said, uh, repeated offenders. Um, if with your experience, and if you say that these repeated offenders, uh, what from your experience do you think that the legislation should be done with repeated offenders to prevent this, that they're doing the same matter over and over and again? So what's your view on that? Thank you, thank you Honourable Member. My view is that they should be held in contempt of the public protector because the remedial action of the public protector is aimed at strengthening governance, is aimed at helping the, the state institution in improving its own internal governance and internal processes. So they should be held in contempt of the public protector and they should be held to account. Thank you. Thank you. My questions as a follow-up. Um, from your experience of many years being in the office, so what's your view of the most pressing human rights issues in South Africa? That if you are full-time as appointed as a DPP, so what will you do about it? Thank you, Honourable Member. For me, 
the most pressing thing is the gender-based violence and femicide. It has been declared as a pandemic. There have been legislative measures that have been put in place to protect the victims. However, the cases are not, decre are not decreasing. Instead, we continue to see brutal, brutal cases of, of GBV. So for me, that is the most important. And it happens to be an area that falls within the mandate of the public protector because a public protector is supposed to investigate those institutions that have been given the mandate to protect the victims, as well as to respond to cases of gender-based violence. Linked to GBV, um, and then other issues as well that has come before the office of the public protector. Where do you see, if you are appointed as the deputy public protector, how can you see how you can make an impact on, to, on South Africans where there are more, where the ordinary people on the ground really know about the work of the public protector? Um, ordinary people, it is, it is important that as a public protector we reach out, especially in the, in the rural areas where they do not have the resources. Yes, we do have measures in place such as the referral app. We are currently introducing what a, a, a please call me service whereby some of those who have access to mobile phones can call us. But however, that is not sufficient. We have an advocacy and outreach program, so we need to go out to the far-flung areas and reach out to, to member of the member of the communities in those areas. Also, we need to partner with Amakosi to make sure that we reach out to, to, to those those vulnerable members of our society. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Liver Tofen, Honorable Chancha. 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 I understand. <laughs> okay, Honorable. Uh, thanks, uh, Honorable thanks, uh, Chair. Thank you very much, Chair. Good afternoon, uh, Miss uh, Revelation. Good afternoon, Honorable Member. <laughs> It's a name that is in my ID, but I... Yeah, I just saw it on the CV. You, you have been with the PPSA for quite a number of years, which is uh, 23 years, with 16 being in a managerial position. Uh, what has been major lessons, experiences uh, that you, 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 you can say they are major? The, the actual image, the lessons learned during this course about um, the institution itself. I think one of the major lessons that has been learned throughout my stay in the organization, I served through the current public protector would be the fifth one that I, that I served with. I think one of the important lessons is that process of transition. Every seven years there is a new public protector that it is coming in. But however, the process of preparing the employees for that change, it's, it has not been done smoothly as, 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 as it should have been done because every public protector that comes, they come with their own vision, they come with their own strategic priorities. But however, in terms of making sure that we prepare the employees who are the key stakeholders in the organization, we prepare them for that, that change in the organization. We have not been doing very well as the organization. Um, the last experience, I think it's, it's a case in point that we have really learned that much as we focus on chasing the numbers, we tend to forget the softer issues, particularly when, when it comes to employee. For, so for me, it's one of the issues that I think 
it's key, it's one of the lessons that I've taken from there. And I think the other thing that I'm noting that is important is that there is resilience within the organization because notwithstanding those difficulties, we still managed to achieve the targets that were set. And we still have people that, that continue to serve. And I think the public protector is one organization where I think people tend to stay longer. Personally, I'm one of those that stayed longer in the organization because on a personal level, it serves my purpose. It is one organization where you are able to assist the most vulnerable at no cost. So some of the people stay longer in the organization mainly because it achieves that purpose where you are able to assist the, the most vulnerable without them having to pay for services. Okay. You, you say in your CV that you have been attending programs that um, uh, are meant to make the Office of the Public Protector accessible. Okay, what are those programs? Can you repeat the question, Honorable? The programs you attended, I think it's uh, page five, programs you attended that are meant to make the Office of the Public Protector okay. accessible. Okay. Accessibility, in terms of the programs that from where I am as, as the core, we have a formal outreach and advocacy program. However, as the core function of the organization, we have to provide support to, to the program because they receive the complaints, we have to deal with those complaints and we also have to make input on their part. But however, from the investigation, to make sure that we get prompt responses from organs of state, we have to engage with them we have to collaborate with, with some of the institutions in, in, in resolving some of the issues. And we need to, as, as, at my level as executive manager, I facilitate those meetings, I arrange the meetings with the different institutions, particularly in areas where we pick up that there is no prompt response. Say so you are appointed as the deputy public protector <coughs> and you make findings and remedial actions against a, a, a a government department, and there is a complete resistance and refusal to implement the remedial actions uh, from the public protector. How would you handle that situation? What would you do? Um, the most, the, 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 the most important thing is to to escalate to the executive authority of that particular institution. If it's a government department, it would be the responsible minister engage with them and try to find out what are the challenges. Um, recently we have a, a case in point. It is an investigation that was concluded in 2019. It involved various areas. It's, it's, it's a, it was a housing complaint in the former Bupitazona area. The area is called Mawiga, Mabupani, Mabupani, Harangua and Winterfeld community. There was a remedial action that was taken by the public protector, but however, it took very long. It was not implemented until the complainants approached the portfolio committee. And what we did was to have an engagement with the, with the respective ministers, as well as the institution. I convened a meeting of all. Firstly, there was a meeting that was held by the public protector with the respective ministers. Following that, there was another follow-up meeting at my level with the different accounting officers. And as I'm talking, there is implementation of the, of the remedial action. The only challenge that we have is that one of the parties had decided to take remedial action of the public protector on review. But we got commitment that even though they are challenging some of the principles in the report, they are implementing some of the remedial action. So for me, it's important that there needs to be that engagement and understand what are the challenges and see if it's possible to unlock those challenges. Okay. What is your understanding of a fit and a proper person? And are you a fit and a proper person? Um, fit and proper talks to, to your, your conduct as a person whether you are an honest person, whether you have integrity. So with regard to that, I believe that I'm a fit and a proper person. I'm honest, I have integrity, so I believe that I'm a fit and proper person. Thank you, Chen.
Thank you very much, Honorable Mkwebani. Honorable Janji. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, 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 Ms. Mukhala, do you have seen how many about four public protectors? Five. Uh, five. The current one is number five. Okay. So now you want to be a public protector yourself. <laughs> You're tired of this thing of welcoming them and do that. Let's get there. The you put my public protector. The cutie. <laughs> That's so a way now to... I've applied for the position of deputy. Okay. Now public so you like I, I know this space now. I I I must apply now to be a public project. Is that, you came here for that? Um, I applied for the position of deputy public project. I'm away. Yes. You, so that's what you want now. <laughs> yes. You no, you no longer like this 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 investigation job that you're doing as oh. as EM investigations. I like it, honorable okay. member, but I feel that the experience that I've gained in the organization okay. can be of, of value at, at the level of the of the deputy public protector. It would be part of... No, no that's My fine. We can well. pause there. Uh, let's, let's pause there. I want you to help me um, so the, the Bangalore principles of uh, judicial conduct, they speak of six core values. I just want you to help me with two of those. Uh, competence and diligence. What's your understanding of those two okay. core values? Uh, competence, competence and diligence. Competence and diligence, my understanding of that is that the principles were mainly developed to regulate the ethical conduct of, of, the, of the judges. So if I take it in that context, my understanding of that is that you should competence, you should be competent to carry out the, 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 the functions of the position for which you are, you, or you are holding. Diligence, you should serve diligently in that position. You should be committed, you should be driven to, to, to the position that you are occupying. Okay, thank you. Let's, let's pause there, just, just perhaps to take the, the, the issue of diligence and competence further. I, your name is Punachekho uh, Mukhaladi Ageri. Is that your name? Honorable, honorable name. Okay. So, Pomchek or King? What is Pomchek? So you, you have a certificate here that you have brought. That's written Pomchek Revelation Mohalad. And you've made copies of that. It's sent to everybody else. You got it from the University of Johannesburg. Is that your other name? No, Pomchek. honorable member. The name was spelled in, incorrectly. I've been following It's incorrectly spelled. Yes. I've and been... yet you're reproducing that and, and, and it's not... And I'm trying to deal with diligence and competence. Mm. So this is what you do. Uh, this, is no, this is not your name, but you spread it. Mm. So what, what should I take from that? Um, would, would somebody then come and argue and say, then you could easily uh, transmit issues to court with these inaccuracies if this is what you can do with your name? No, honorable member, it's, 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 it's not a reflection on my, my conduct, uh, honorable member. Like I said, I've been trying to, to correct it with the relevant institution. I didn't get it. I'm still waiting to get the corrected copy. And it was an oversight. I should not have included it or I should have included it with an explanatory note. In the in the peg. Yeah, because there's no yes. explanation. No, it was yes. Otherwise, I accept it. But 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 it's not a reflection on on my conduct or my competency. Or so so you do you pay attention to detail? I do, on our and, and 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 so I when you you do that, but I should accept this. <laughs> member. You do pay attention to details, but you want me to accept this this the puncture or thing. Um, I do pay detail to 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 okay. attention to Let's, detail. Let's proceed. Let, let's go back to the investigations. And, and thank you. you uh, you've taken my question out, the Mail and Guardian. You've, you've ran with that. But let's, co let's conclude on it. Um, the, the Constitutional Court um, made an adverse uh, finding on the former public protector. And you would have been in that space uh, uh, during that time of flawed investigations, I thought. Do you, do, do you know, are you aware of that? Do you remember that? Yes, but, but maybe, Honorable Member, if you can maybe be specific on the particular investigation. It's a SAP and CX matter. Yes. So I you were part of that team that would have, uh, you were in that no. office. 
I was in the office, but I was not involved in the investigation of that matter. Okay. So do you agree with the, with the Constitutional Court uh, uh, finding on that? I agree with the Constitutional Court finding. Okay. Let's quickly move. Uh, Chair, uh, Honorable Mukhalad would have come in front of uh, me as a chair of the Section 194, uh, and so I want to pose a question. So do you perhaps, uh, now that you are here in front of me now here, do you think that, that there's a perception of bias or conflict of interest in that regard? No, Honorable Are you Minister. comfortable that I would uh, be part of this committee? Yes, I am comfortable. Thank you. Honorable Mkwebane would have been your, your public protector, and there would have been a DC uh, that involves you under her. Do you think it's, uh, uh, she should uh, recuse herself from this uh, interview? Look, um, it is something that I have reflected on, but I, I felt this is a parliamentary process. Um, from the Section 194 inquiry, I testified of my interaction with the Honorable Mkwebani. And one of the conclusions that was drawn by, by the committee was the manner in which Honorable Mkwebani dealt with the, with the outcome, the, 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 the sanction from the chairperson, where rather than taking the sanction of the chairperson, and implementing it as per policy, the Honorable Mkhabani decided that she wanted to change that sanction from a, the, the, the warning and the suspension without pay as, as, as was ruled by the chairperson. And that was notwithstanding the fact that the disciplinary policy was clear. For me, I feel f fairness, I, I, I feel that but it's, it's dependent on the committee. I think what gives me, me comfort is that she's not the only member of the committee. There are other members of the committee, but, but for me, it's something okay. that I have reflected on. But I think for me, what's important is that I, I believe that Honorable Mukwebani is, 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 is a professional. She would be in a position to exercise that Thank judgment. You. But it's something that concerns me, Honorable, okay. Honorable Let, let's, let's pause there. Your parting, your parting shots. Mm -hmm. What's your understanding of uh, the perception of bias? Uh, Perception of bias um, simply means in, in exercising, in, in, in making the decision, you are not, you are not, you are not impartial. You are taking, you tend to lean to, to one side rather than being impartial and being objective and dealing with the facts in front of you in an objective and a reasonable manner. Just the last, last. So that that finding of oh, that. Chair. Okay, thank you, Chair. Yes, no, we have exceeded the budget. <laughs> Hola, how are you? Good afternoon, Honorable Mukabani. Okay. Good day, Mukai, Honorable Member. Isn't it strange, you are Honorable Member? <laughs> you are Honorable Member. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. Uh, I used to call you public protector, yes. now he's honorable member. I am yeah. in that space where I need to show the respect and call you honorable yeah. member. I must delay, apparently, uh, delay because um, I can't interview you because I disciplined you. Uh, so the parliament um, allows me to declare that I worked with you as a senior investigator in the public protector office up until I was your public protector. So indeed, um, as a true honorable judge, I'm part of the collective and I would want what's for the public, which I would ask you to repeat always what was the intention of us as an office if we deal with cases like this. But then, I've got Recording only five minutes. In, um, in your budget, you will assist gate uh, promptly. If appointed, my priority will be to ensure that these cases are investigated expeditiously and reports with appropriate remedial action are issued. So um, the question is, um, there were reports or investigations uh, which you did, like the PEU investigation, for instance, which take took four years um, to, to investigate and originally 
it was a service delivery matter which was supposed to take 12 months. So how would you then change? And it's not only that we had to change from service delivery to how would you change that as now the executive deputy public project? Maybe before I respond, if I can clarify the example that is cited by the Honourable Member, Peo was never classified as a service delivery. From the beginning, that the complaint was lost by the Freedom Front Plus. It was an issue that was related to, to, to procurement of smart smart meters by the city of Tsoi. So it was, um, your voice is too low now. Uh, okay, I'm saying to clarify, the, the particular matter that is cited by the Honourable Member, it was never a service delivery. Okay. From the beginning, let's say it's a conduct lost. failure, it's supposed to be done in 24 months. So it took uh, 48 months. How would you make sure that you speed up the investigation? Um, part of the challenges in the Office of the Public Protector is resource constraints in organization. Uh, the last time I checked, there were 248 people that are in the structure, but they are not funded. To expedite that, it means I have to use the limited resources that I have. So to make sure that we expedite some of those investigations is to assign them to teams. But the challenge that we have is trying to balance the volumes versus taking a team to try and work on a, on, on a matter. Okay. So, then the issue of the complainants who come to the Park Protector as a last resort. Um, how would you make sure that you empathize with them, especially those who are facing um, of lost hope in the system and those who you said they might accuse you of being um, corrupted or paid a bribe when you were giving an example of conflict, like Abunya Taylor? How would you make sure as the people protector now you behave differently to that? Whilst at that, I've got only five minutes, if you can also address the issue of um, the FSB investigation where you failed to hold the officials reporting to you um, to do proper investigation, submitted an incomplete record to the court in terms of Rule 53, and uh, after that, even the case, Yaga, um, this, uh, uh, the ESCOM matter where the rabbi matter, where you failed to make sure that um, the court order is implemented on time. Now you are the public protector and executive. You are facing this challenge. How would you deal? You must allow her to respond. I think the question is I just wanted to deal with and then it's, it's yeah. fine. Make sure that you deal with active members. Who are or who are doing uh, those things? Okay. Thank me. Since my entire stay in the office of a public protector, I am accessible to all the complainants, even those that that would come to to the office for research with Mr. Nyatel. I mean, there are several matters complaints of Mr. Nyatel that I investigated. I personally, in those cases, I would personally update the complainants just to make sure that I try to address that perception that. I might be biased or the matter is un being unduly delayed. What it helps is that it, it explains the challenges that we are experiencing. So if I am to be appointed as the deputy public protector, I will still continue to operate from that principle where I would be easily accessible to those complainants. If they come to the office, I would be accessible and be able to attend to them. The FSCA matter, it happens to be one of the matters that I was charged with and without having to, to reopen the, the disciplinary hearing that happened, I just want to put certain things into proper perspective relating to that matter. Firstly, when I was appointed to carry the additional responsibility relating to the GGI, that investigation was 18 months old and I was not invest in, in, involved in that investigation. When I came on board, the notice Section 79 notice from the correspondence that I picked on the file. It was as due back in July, and I joined and took over responsibility in November. So it was already long overdue. Thank so, you very much. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions for members? <coughs> Not so far. Uh, Ms. Mukhalade. 
Thank you very much for availing yourself. Um, do you think that uh, this interview was fair? It was fair, Mr. Do you think the questions were fair? They were fair and relevant to the position. Thank you very much. And also our apologies uh, for starting late. Uh, and thank you very much for availing yourself. We really appreciate it. Thank you. But I think there's one question that I did not ask you. Uh, can you confirm your disclosure made in the questionnaire? Yes, I confirm it. And uh, do you feel that you've got anything to add? No, I have nothing to add. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I, can I take the water? Yes, yes, yes. It's, it's, our, it's our present. Okay. Yeah, but, uh, members, the time is 2 o'clock. What time do you come back? Members, members, can we can we come back at half past? Half past two.
Recording in progress. Obre. Recording in progress.
Recording stopped.
Testing, testing one, two. Are we audible on the, on the Zoom platform? My token hear us, please. S12A. Good afternoon, Advocate Mulesha. Honorable Chair. I think your mic is okay. recording in progress. Let me start by sincerely apologizing to you. Uh, there were issues that were beyond our control that caused the delay, but we know that uh, it's really unfair on you to wait for so long. We sincerely apologize. Uh, that's why we are giving you a present to drink water. <laughs> <laughs> it's a way of saying we are sorry. Thank you. Uh, in, uh, let me also declare that um, I have met Miss Advocate Malaysia. We are from the same region of Egorulen, but we are not friends. We are not anything except that. Um, Advocate Mulesha, in five minutes, can you tell us about yourself, your values, and why do you think you are the right person to be considered for this position? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I do think that I am a, 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 the right person for the position because I'm fit and proper to do the job. And I'm basing this on my um, ethical standards that I ask up to. I am, I am an admitted advocate of the High Court and I'm duly registered with the Legal Practice Council. Um, 
on the role of non-practicing attorneys. I have I've passed my attorney admission exams in 2000, um, and I've been in the legal field since for 22 years, and 16 of which are in the senior management field. So, firstly, in terms of the, I I am a leader that. Um, that leads by example. Um, I am fair and I ascribe to the values of um, the values of transparency, fairness and um, responsiveness and I've, I have very high standards of integrity and this I, has been, I have is proven by the track record that I have in the institutions that I have served in the public service. So I've been in the administration of justice for the longest time. In the NPA, I was there as a prosecutor. Part of the things that I was doing there was the was prosecutions. And when you are a prosecutor, you then also have the the opportunity to lead investigations. And looking at the mandate of the Office of the Public Protector, I am well equipped with that. I also was um, a legal advisor in the police. I was the head of IP in Gauteng. I was also a um, legal advisor in the social cluster, which I think a lot of things or challenges that the Office of the Public Protector have to deal with relates to the social ills um, and issues of service delivery. So I am well equipped with the challenges that people are faced with within the social cluster as well. I am a leader that um, that ascribes to the um, to you know, a leader that ascribes to understanding your team. So I work with the team very well, and I ensure that I am empathetic. Uh, I listen and assist and respond accordingly. I have. A bit. In addition to that, a number of um, diplomas that uh, were meant to equip my skills, one of which is a diploma in investigation in, in criminal justice and um, forensic auditing, uh, cyber law, so that I'm able to equip myself with the changes um, in the with with in, in with the changes of the fourth industrial revolution. I also uh, am currently doing my MBA. I believe that I am a person who is fair, who is impartial, who is um, who is able to take decisions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Can you please confirm the disclosures that you made in the questionnaire? Yes, I confirm that everything that I've put in the questionnaire is in accordance with um, my I agree with them. Thank you. You want to add anything? No, there's nothing to add, Chair. Thank you very much. Members, over to you. Uh, can I note hands? Honorable Jale. You can start. I think uh, they will start uh, Thank you transitioning very from break to... Thank you very much, Chairperson. I'm not sure if maybe I'm also, I also have to join you in... in your, the your voice is too low. I always forget my apologies. <laughs> I was saying, Chair, I think uh, for safety, let me just declare that uh, O Mama O Moleshe is also is coming from where I come from. But uh, he's coming from Egoruleni. So I'm coming from Egoruleni. So, uh, but I've not worked with her. I don't know her. So I don't want, because you declared and then, because you're coming from the, we're all coming from the same area. 
So how are you, uh, uh, Advocate? I'm, th I'm well, thank you, uh, uh, Honorable Chair. You, uh, don't mind, no more at Mom Chair. It's fine. <laughs> uh, my, my first question, uh, Advocate Moleshi, to you is that can you please, in, in, in just in short, two or three lines, the role of uh, the uh, office of the public uh, protector and in line with the vision that you have applied for. Thanks. Thank you very much. In the conduction service, uh, so occasion on maladministration, inappropriate activities that are done by those institutions. Secondly, the when the public protector investigates, then they need to come up with a remedial action. We and also they need to report to Parliament. Uh, on, on, provide reports at least once a year to the, to the and the role of the public protector is really to uphold the constitution of the country and ensure that the the, the constitutional democracy is upheld. Um, secondly, the yeah, you said two lines. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. It's fine. <laughs> So the second question would be in your, your questionnaire that you have received from from our side, you indicate that um, on the question of the challenges that is faced by the country, uh, you are saying it appears, I'm just quoting from page eight, but you remember because yes. it's something that you have written yourself. It appears that uh, we are progressively losing care that should restore its dignity, <coughs> equality, and freedom of South Africans. Can you explain the statement? Yes, thank you very much, Honorable Member. So, I have been serving in the public, in the, in the, in the public service, and once my department, for example, appeared before the public protector, and it was mainly because and it related to the issue of uh, access to services, where the people of Alexander were complaining about the office, the fact that they don't have an office in Alexander. And, and, and now they were expected to go to Johannesburg instead of having access to services to where they are. But I think a lot of it has something to do with the way we communicate with the communities, you know, how responsive is government. And I'm talking from a level of technocrats, uh, that uh, you find that most of the time there is no response to the communities, there is no communication in terms of how far we are getting to resolve issues. And I was really basing on the basis of that. And some of them relate to the cases that the Office of the Public Protector have dealt with, where, for example, a person doesn't have a birth certificate for a child and it's taking forever for people to get. And I'm saying it is the, 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 the role of the Public Protector is to protect those that are vulnerable. And it, therefore, we need to maybe take a moral compass as a country, as the technocrats, to ensure that we are able to address the, uh, the, the, the shortcomings of how government is perceived by the people of South Africa or how they conduct themselves. Okay. My last question. You want to be a, a deputy public protector, and uh, obviously you will be rep reporting to the public protector. But I just want to find out, in, in, in a situation where you differ with the public protector, uh, in views in, in relation to your work, how would you handle that? Okay. The role of the deputy public protector is to support and assist the public protector in in in, in achieving the vision and the role 
that the mandate of that office. As such, one, you would have to conduct yourself in such a manner that you want to achieve that role. So the first thing would be to talk to the public protector and indicate, and I think there should be candid uh, conversations where you are able to say, this is how I see this. But again, how you see things has nothing to do with personalities. It has a lot to do with the, what the constitution requires of you and the principles of legality. So if that which you believe in and you would like the public con protector to, to consider is legal and is in line with the spirit of the, and the objectives of the constitution, then you can engage on them and you can d have uh, frank discussions and find a way forward. Thank you. So I would approach the public protector. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Advocate Molesha. Thank you very Chief. much, Honorable uh, Mola. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, good afternoon. Afternoon, Honorable. Yeah. You indicate in your CV that you have worked for various departments. That's correct. Uh, including the NPA and the uh, IP. So, have you ever been involved in uh, private legal practice? No. I have not. Okay. You say in your introduction that uh, you think you are uh, equal to be a public protector because you are a fit and proper person. What is your understanding of a fit and a proper person? My understanding of a fit and proper person is a person that ascribes to high moral values and, and integrity. Um, so one, what is important is that you, when you get into the position, you must be competent enough to be able to do the, the job. I feel that I am competent because of my one, my academic qualifications, you know, my work experience. You know you are competent or you feel it. I know. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Yes, I know that I am competent because of my qualifications, because of my work experience. And uh, secondly, as an admitted advocate, firstly, the, the High Court declares you as a fit person. <coughs> I have never had any adverse findings against myself in terms of how I conduct myself. I've always uh, conducted myself in high regard and with the utmost integrity. And that is why. Okay. I believe I'm <clears throat> you, you, you worked for IPID and uh, NPA, uh, whose uh, central role is to run investigations. In your in your working there, have you ever handled <clears throat> a, a highly complex investigation or a high-profile matter? Have you ever been involved in such kind of investigations? Yes, I had. Um, I think the first one I can mention is, actually, I was the person who started the investigation about uh, against the former um, General Mruli. The informer informed me of the of the facts that were known to her and we then looked, because it was a cold case, it was so many years that there was nothing happening. We looked into the matter and I took the decision that this is the matter that IPID will investigate further. Unfortunately, I did not stay long enough to conclude the investigation. However, what I know for a fact is that there was a conviction in that matter and I, I believe that that was a matter that one could have <coughs> You know, been scared to deal with, um, given the the environment. I also have done other uh, cases. I think I okay. think the one you have the Thank one you. example is quite enough. Thank it's you quite much. enough. It's it's indeed high profile. Thank you so much. Uh, the PPSA operates, uh, does an investigation, and. Uh, does its own findings and remedial actions against a particular uh, uh, depart uh, government department. Fortunately, we have worked uh, in a number of government departments. Uh, so, 
then that department whose remedial action is imposed against it refuses to implement the remedial actions of the public protector. Now, as a deputy public protector, what role do you think you would play to ensure that those remedial actions are implemented? Okay. First of all, the remedial actions of the public protector are, are, are binding and enforceable immediately. So no organ of state should be refusing to implement those. And that's based also on the <coughs> case law. Um, so one, what I would do, and in the case law, maybe to be specific, um, the, the, in the matter of the EFF uh, versus the speaker of um, the National Speaker of, 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 of the Speaker of the National Assembly. Of the National Assembly, yes. Uh, the court find the, that you, the, 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 the public protector remedial action of findings are binding and therefore the National Assembly could not have taken a different decision to say that you no, know, they, they do not uh, accept those. But more importantly, I think the recent uh, case that relates to that would have been the, the, the case where, I think it's the uh, Minister Pravin Gordon, where he was objecting to the findings of the public protector and the court find in that case that you can you have two ways to deal with the findings of the public protector. One being that you can take them on review, but whilst they're on review, they are still enforceable. So the only way to stop them is through an interdict. And so um, we will therefore, if I am appointed in the position, demand that we get progress on the implementation of the findings unless that particular <laughs> entity has taken as, as, as is in possession of an interdict that stopped the implementation of the findings. Thank you. Okay, because you worked for, for IPID and uh, NPA, I am quite confident that you know what a whistleblower, whistleblower is. Yes. Uh, so, do, do you currently think that the Office of the Public Protector is doing enough in protecting whistleblowers? I think that there's, they can do more um, in terms of ensuring that they protect the identity of their whistleblowers, but also to tap into the avenues that they can use, whether to put a person on a witness protection uh, processes uh, so that that person is, is covered. Um, it depends really on the merits of each case. And, and, but the, in terms of the act, which is the Disclosures Act, um, they, they have to protect those witnesses, the Office of the Public Protector. That's their... Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Honourable Horn. Thank you, uh, Chair. Good afternoon. Afternoon, Honourable Horn. Um, so, since, well, for about the last 10 years, you've been in the employment of what we can actually say is the executive. Correct. Um, so, how will you prevent a situation where you, because of that muscle memory, uh, act in a deferential manner to the executive if you are appointed. Please come again. Honorable. How will you prevent the situation where you will defer constantly to the executive if you are appointed as the deputy public protector? I think, Honorable uh, Hon, it's about your um, the leadership qualities that one has, because. If you one you need one we need to create a culture in any organization of trust in the way we conduct ourselves between ourselves. So if we are open and discuss uh, matters, then you are able to to resolve on the issues. However, it can get beyond the fact that people can talk. So you have to look at what remedies you have in law. In this case, if you're the deputy public protector, you could approach the, the portfolio committee, this portfolio committee, and um, indicate your challenges on the matter. Uh, and, and, and find, but the, the, the reality of the matter is that um, whilst the, the, the powers are with the public protector, there is a 
the reason also why they should be a deputy to support and assist the public project. And thank you. So in the question there, under the question what you understand to be the key challenges faced by both our country and what you do, we do to the Office of the Public Protector, you begin by saying, noting the decisions of the Public Protector wherein I was involved as a civil servant. So in, in what matters were you involved as a civil servant? Honorable Hon, it's the example that I spoke about of um, where the Department of Social Development was called in for an investigation relating to the, the failure by the department to have what we call a service point or a, a services to the people of, of, of Alex. And I think as much as the, it is a common cause that the, the, the are challenges to get accommodation in, in, in in Alex, a lot maybe could have been done by the department in terms of tapping into partners, like having an office at court, because we actually did have <coughs> offices at court for probation officers, but maybe we could have used the very same space that was provided as an intake office of sorts and be able then to have or have decentralized services where social workers go to the communities themselves and do not wait for clients to come to them. So I thought that's where I, I, I was saying that it's important that you don't lose touch with the real issues of the people on the ground. Thank you. Okay, and, and you, you, you also linked that to progressively losing care <laughs> which is all well and fine, but then if one looks towards the, the uh, let's say, the powers of the pu Office of the Public Protector, it's all about maladministration yes. and corruption. So how, how would you Link. then be able to, to force the government to care more? I think in, in terms of um, the administration of justice, um, one needs to be fair. So if a department has a legal mandate to deliver on, and I think that's where the issue of care for me comes in, is that then they need to ensure that they deliver it in the manner that which, which was an envisage by the legislation itself. Earlier on, I did touch to the fact that um, the you find that there is no responsiveness. So a person makes a complaint to a department and there's no, or an application to have an ID and it's just quiet. And for me, the care comes there. So we need to ensure that we cultivate a culture of care, but obviously it's not something that is outrightly a mandate of a public protector. However, if you foster relations with other government entities and maybe have regular workshops on the importance of customer care, then you, you, you can so not all of these things, the public, the, 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 what the public protector can do, only relates to what they can enforce, but it can also be fostered by the relations they have with the various government departments. And so that's, that's where really the issue of care for me came in. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Breitenbach. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, Madam. Afternoon, Honorable Breitenbach. Um, <clears throat> there's been a history in the Office of the Public Protector to marginalise or sideline the deputy. Uh, if you're appointed and that trend continues, uh, how will you deal with it? Honourable Breitenbach, um, it is important that when one takes an oath of office, understands what is their mandate. And I want to believe a public protector or even a deputy public protector, when they take that office, they should firstly put the interests of the people of South Africa before themselves. So the, and therefore it is important that there must be clarity in terms of what are the various roles that would be delegated to the deputy public protector upfront. And I would, really maybe as I, if I get appointed, request from the onset that we don't have those black lines. And also equally so, 
I need to understand that I remain accountable to the public protect. So I can't go on my own and do my own thing. I have to always come back and consult. So communication becomes key. And it is in the manner that I would conduct myself. It will make it very difficult for any public protector not to work with me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Honorable Engelbrecht, then Honorable Nebot Strochen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good, old, good evening, no, afternoon. <laughs> no. Good afternoon. <laughs> Um, so in your CV, I see that uh, you have quite extensive um, experience in the public sector. Yes, sir. And, um, but should you be appointed as Deputy Public Protector, this will be a new thing for you. Um, obviously, not operating in that space before, except for five years, maybe in IPED, with similar yeah. type of things. Now, in your view, is the institution of the public protector a passive adjudicator between citizens and the state? Or does the institution have more investigatory role requiring proaction in certain circumstances? Um, please provide the reasons for your answer. Okay. So definitely they should take a proactive role and that's why in one of their programs they have stakeholder management. And so they need to be proactive, and, I, and I'm thinking about it that having, having led your legal services of various departments, part of how we approach our legal services was to be proactive, put governance structures in place. So where there's a need to have your memorandum of understandings in the way that other entities will deal with, it becomes important that you have that. So. As much as it's a passive one, it can be perceived to be a passive role, but there's a bigger role that the public protector can do based on the constitutional objectives that needs to be achieved by that office. Not everything can be enforced by a finding or a remedial action. Thank you. Thanks. Then, um, last question. The bulk of investigations done by the public protector um, relates to service delivery failures from various organs of state. Um, what do you believe the public protector can or should do to address reoccurring and systemic service delivery weaknesses within the state? The the public protector would have to hold the various government entities accountable to the findings that they make. For example, if you look at currently what is happening, especially at local government level, the public protector would have findings and they are not implemented. So there needs to be a mechanism of following up on those findings and ensure that the Office of the Public Protector is assertive in ensuring that the, their findings or remedial action that is put in place is implemented. And this can be achieved through getting quarterly reports from the various municipalities that they, they find, they are find in the, sorry, that they, they, they need to report back on the findings of the public project. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. And thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, Ms. Um, Moleshi. I'm um, Dr. Wilman Yadruchen. I'm using South African Sign Language. The voice that you hear is a sign language interpreter, Francois Daisy. Um, I would like to know from your perspective, what is the most pressing human rights issues in South Africa, and how will you address them as um, a deputy a public protector? Thank you. The pressing matters uh, currently are two. The uh, service delivery um, issues, as well as issues of governance. So one 
would really focus on the governance because most of the maladministration is as a result of failed governance. So how I would address that would be, again, I did mention earlier on, it's important that you, the, the Office of the Public Protector strengthen its uh, stakeholder management role. And to that extent, you can want, we can host things like your symposiums and targeting the various areas, spheres of government. For example, SALGA is responsible for local government. We can partner with SALGA to ensure that we are able to get to all the various municipalities across the nine provinces and be able to emphasize on the importance of governance, on the importance of service delivery as it affects the ordinary people of South Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my second question is, what do you think and what's the role um, of the public protector and what impact it will have on the uh, people of South Africa? Do you think ordinary people on the ground knows about the role of the public protector? Thank you very much. I do think Ordinary South Africans know about the role of the public project. However, I think for most of them, it's about the question of accessibility to the services of the public project. Um, yes, the public project has offices in all the provinces, but I think a vigorous uh, stakeholder engagement needs to happen where there is a drive to educate and ordinary South Africans about the role of the Office of the Public Protect. And in that way, one will be able to get the people uh, to be able to engage with that office better. Because honestly speaking, the role of the Public Protector perhaps is bigger than the things that are in the media space. Because it assists the ordinary people. I, I know of some of their achievements, for example, which relates to a person that did not have a, a ID for over seven years, and this person could not even be employed. And what then happened is that the public protector took up the matter. Subsequent to that, there was even an order for uh, um, redress that was for, for that person. And those are the things that really, I think, has a bigger impact to an ordinary South African in, and, and the spirit upon which that office of the public protector was established. Thank you. You know that accessibility you just mentioned is that the offices are not accessible to the ordinary people and your role, if you are appointed as a deputy public protector, how can you work better to make sure that um, people that you know, are in remote areas have access to the public protector's office? Thank you very much, member, Honourable Member. I think we, the, the, there's a need for, again, it goes back to stakeholder uh, management, to partner with other government entities. Because I will give you an example. Even in the most remote areas of South Africa, you will find at least a court, a court building in the, in the district. And one would have to then ensure that maybe we request the courts or even public halls where we go and have outreach programs and bring the services to the people as the Office of the Public Protector uh, per region and say that you know you have a, a, a drive for a couple of months to say in this month we are in this province and these are the key areas that will be there to take, to take the cases of the ordinary members of, 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 of community. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Honorable Mkwebane. Good um, afternoon, Advocate. Afternoon, Honorable. Um, yeah, um, just to put you at ease that if you are appointed, all those proposals are there in the Office of the Power Protector. 
MOUs with traditional leaders, drop-in points where people can lodge complaints, accessibility is not an issue, MOUs with courts where um, outreach officials are going there and, and they're doing all those um, issues of accessibility, mobile app to lodge complaints. I understand uh, the current PP promised that there will be a please call me app. I don't know whether that is operational, but she said it will be operational soon. So I don't think it's an issue of um, problematic. Are we at rural development yes. currently? I see that um, there's still a lot of challenges um, which are the uh, still inadequate land reform. Uh, various, uh, your, your programs are not reaching a lot, again, is limited access. What do you think, um, let's say now you are the power protect, uh, deputy power protector and a complaint is lodged as far as that matter is concerned. How do you think it needs to be resolved? That's the first one. The second one, insufficient rural development initiatives. Uh, the department failing to promote or supporting um, the, in fact, the, 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 the small-scale farmers. Thank you very much, Advocate. Your Honorable Member Mkwema. Um, maybe just to give an example of, um, firstly, my role at social development, and I'll come quickly back to agriculture. Mm -hmm. and I, I don't group. have time, my, my, my advocate. Uh, okay, but, but I do want to, to communicate yeah. the fact that mm. The issue of rural development has always been at the apex of government planning and what needs to happen is the implementation of that. So at social development, part of the portfolio I had was infrastructure development and what we did specifically was to build service point and bring services to the people in the rural nodes of Gauteng. And, um, and unfortunately, I'm limited to Gauteng. And I will only speak of Gauteng because I work for Gauteng government. And we had built your ECDs, your uh, um, uh, office space in, for example, Kwasol Kulum. If you go today to Kwasol Kulum, you'll find an ECD, you'll find office space for social workers. If you go to the West Rand, same thing. If you go to all the rural nodes. So even in agriculture, um, it is important that generally you would say farming all, is in the rural areas anyway by, by nature of, of, of uh, your, time, your time, town planning. So what is important, the issue of land reform is the national competency of it's, it's a national competency of the provincial competency. However, national Department of Agriculture and Land Reform nationally have offices in the regions where they have they now have uh, meaning in the in the provinces and the regions where they have service points for people to come and say what is it that you you, you require a support on by okay. government. Yeah. So that we'll use that. use that because they'll stop me. Okay. Um, the issue of how many people are you um, managing currently? Direct, direct reports or the entire... Direct reports, especially at the uh, executive or mani management level, senior management. Okay. Um, it's the, the transformation unit. Just how many? At the moment, it's, it's two. two. However, there were seven. All right. Yeah. So... Uh, and I see your experience as well. You have a lot of experience in public service. Yeah. How do you deal with, the, as a deputy public protector now, with the um, uh, executive manager who fails to make sure that the investigators are properly investigating the matter? The matter is then brought to your attention to the public protector, not uh, taking into consideration all the information, misleading that every information has been taken into consideration. Honorable Member, it's twofold. You could be dealing with a performance management issue and you could be dealing with a misconduct. So how do you deal with it? You would have to look at the facts in front of you. Okay. And if the facts in front of you points toward a misconduct, then there must be consequence management. Right. And if it's about performance management, again, there's a process to develop that person and then you, so that you, and you, you put that person on terms to perform so that you are able to deal with them. So um, the issue of remedial actions, I hear members and questions being asked. You are a deputy public protector. There are remedial actions which are not implemented. Mm -hmm. I think um, 
when you are there, make sure that you compile all of them. The office supporting institutional uh, democracy in the speaker's office, actually members of parliament, are the ones who are supposed to take their responsibility of holding oversight over those executives. Secondly, is for us as parliamentarians to make sure that they report, I like what you say, it be compulsory for them when they report, like how they report in the AG. They then um, come and public protector and say, this department has failed on the following in front of the portfolio committee. So I think that is very critical that if you are appointed, that's what you need to, to be focusing on because it's not your responsibility to be running after the executive to do that when they account to, to, to parliament. Then the issue of um, the case um, which um, made sure that uh, the remedial actions are binding. Uh, I think um, how would you make sure that um, the institution is, okay, let's leave that because you are the deputy public protector, service delivery related matters. Meeting more with communities to, I see you specialize in alternative dispute resolution. What more experience would you bring into the institution to resolve those um, service delivery related matters? Okay. Um, advocate, uh, sorry. Honorable okay, member. That, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Honorable um, Kwebane, one of the things that I like, for example, if you look at the three metros, um, in fact, even here in Cape Town, the big metros have an ombuds office. Okay. Yeah. And you also have some municipalities or government departments having a customer service designated portfolio. So it would be a, a prudent that we with those officers so that on the cases which I would say are the quick wins, they can be to the department and they provide report on the progress. And then you would have resolved the matter instead of bulking up all the work and wanting the office of the public product to follow on everything. Thank you. What's your understanding of section six? Any other hand? Honorable <laughs> Jack. Uh, Ms. Mulesh. Yes, Honorable. Um, the MBA, you're currently doing. Uh, are you doing that part time, full time? It's part time. So, how many years? How many years the part time MBA? It's uh, it's supposed to be between. Okay. So this you, is you, you this know is my where, final year. Where I'm going since 2021 what's happening? Oh no! <laughs> but that's what <laughs> no, no, 2021 no. till present. Okay. So you have got a three-year MBA. Right? No, it's not like the BA way. You you, it's online first. So what? Uh, Just a bit more in in August 21. Sorry, okay. we have this full year. So my year always ends in. Um, you want to be public protect. That's correct. So, prayers, have you done any research for this office that you will be in? Yes, I have. Okay, what's the budget of that office? The budget of the office earlier, 2023-2024. Okay. They make it Which is, um, that is, that is, you qualify. Uh, funded on the investigations. Um, do, do you know of uh, the Mail and Guardian case on, on an approach and method on investigations? Yes, I do. Uh, Please uh, just share with us what what it, what does it say? So the Mail and Guardian case, the the um, 
the the way media um, reports a, a series of just, reports. Just, mainly just summarize for us uh, the, the what does it direct uh, that office or any investigators to do? It directs that office to focus on the mandate that they have. But more importantly, it directs that office, it's a mail and matter, uh, it directs that office to... Uh, you, Are you guessing? No, no, I'm not. You, you, you broke my thought there when you stopped me, sorry. Uh, so, the, 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 what, what, what happened is that in the mail and garden case, then there was this, the, uh, can I please just give a background a bit so that I'm able to talk to the legal question? Yeah, come here with us at the time. Oh, okay. will not be with yeah, us. Later, right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Honorable uh, Member. So the, the mail and garden case, is the, the, the principle there was related to the Ipaja. Um, no, that's old Mishma. Uh, okay, let's leave that. That's your homework. No, the mail and uh, the case. Okay, uh, all right. I, I'm giving you homework on that. That's fine. Uh, Thank you. Let, let's leave it. Um, let's let's go back to the very first thing you said here. Yeah, you said you fit and proper. Correct. And Honorable Nola would have uh, traveled the journey with you to a certain point. Uh, yeah, of, of the six uh, core values of from the Bangalore principles of judicial conduct, mm -hmm. propriety is one of those. Yes. You, you've tried to, to, to say what you understand it to be. I want you to share with us what's the authority of that because the constitution doesn't define fit and proper, but there's a case law that begins to, to describe that. Do you know that case law? So the the Bangalore, the the Bangalore principles, firstly, um, are the principles that no, are. I'm, I'm there. I've, okay. I've, I've just taken out propriety. Yes. And I'm, I want us to speak about fit and proper. Yes. Leave now those principles. Yes. Just focus on fit and proper. And I want to understand uh, you to help us with the case law on the fit and proper, because the constitution doesn't define it. Mm -hmm. So there's a case law of, of state versus non Jiva and others yes. that, that stipulates mm -hmm. uh, th those kind of issues. Mm -hmm. That's your second homework. Yes. No, can I please respond? Please do. Thank you very much. So the issue of propriety and in the matter of uh, Advocate non Jiva uh, talked about the competences of a person to hold office. And the competencies, competencies will be on your ability to do that, but also on the character of the person, the attributes that that person holds. Mm. And that is why I, I, I am saying that I am fit and proper, because I am qualified, one. Two, I have conducted myself in a manner that which is uh, w with the highest integrity and the highest standards of uh, values, ethical values. Thank you. Thank you. We have four principles governing the, 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 the institution supporting democracy, mm -hmm. human rights, public protector, and so on. Mm -hmm. There are about four of those. Yeah. Any one of those that you can just share with us? It, uh, principles the sections of Sections 181. Uh, fairness. Um, the... It's the issues of fairness one. Uh, you must be fair and you must be impartial and you must be enjoy English. Uh. Okay. So we will yeah. finish those as comment? part of the Thank, Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any further questions? Uh, none. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Advocate Mulesha. Uh, do you think that the interview was fair? I do think it was fair. It's a little bit rushed, though. <laughs> thank you so much. Rush or rough? Rushed. Um, yeah, I, I, I believe that it, it can only be fair if I'm able to articulate myself and maybe bring a context, because even the interpretation of statutes you must take it in the spirit and the context of what was the, the object of the matter. Thank you. Were the questions fair? Yes, they were fair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for availing yourself. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>
Excuse me. She's a magistrate. Now what's the other one? The other one is Okay. I take off my time right. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon, Honorable Members. Uh, let me start by apologizing to you for, for the delay. Uh, uh, it was something beyond our control, which cropped up. And it just pushed every body backwards. So we know that you are highly affected. And you are supposed to have started at two. We sincerely apologize for all the delay and the inconvenience caused to you. Thank you. We would offer you what as a as a form of saying sorry to you. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, can you, in five minutes, tell us who you are, your values, and why you are the right person for the position? My name is Lindy Wemkeze. I am 38 years of age. I uh, values um, good uh, Christian values. I am the principal of Ubuntu. I have empathy and always uh, conduct myself with integrity. I have a Bachelor's degree in law, diploma in labor law. Any of the high court, the stages of beginning thereof, I am um, in regional court. Is, uh, uh, making two legal reports, I realized position for admission in terms of section 24. Which is I had to in place a business and practice as a whole. I then had an opportunity to act as a magistrate and I did so for a period of two years. Uh, before I was permanently appointed. I have uh, been so appointed for um, four, four years now. In my position as a magistrate, I still uh, am dealing with the rights uh, of the people uh, insofar as it relates to access to courts. I am expected uh, to conduct myself uh, in, in line with uh, uh, principles of independency, impartiality, with dignity, and to ensure quality service. All this, my skills uh, and experience that I have acquired uh, in the 10 year plus uh, in the profession, 
makes me someone who understands uh, the value of the Constitution, the need to uphold the Constitution, protect the Constitution, its value, make sure that there is accountability in how state affairs are handled. I am in the circumstances, in my opinion, a fit and proper position, a person, uh, a fit and proper person for the position of the Deputy Public Protector. Thank you very much. Can you please confirm your disclosure made in the questionnaire? Uh, during my uh, time at the University of Limpopo, I was in, uh, involved in uh, student politics and there, uh, when I initially um, contested, I had uh, contested as an independent candidate. I uh, then got uh, elected to serve in the Law Student Council. Um, the year that followed that, there were then elections and I became part of the SRC for the entire institution. There were student protests, um, as you may know, uh, it's common. Um, earlier in the year, there would be issues, including issues of exclusions uh, at institutions, be it financial or academic. Sorry, sorry, Advocate Mkiz. I think that information you know. Yes, what, what is it that yes, you Can like you confirm to? that you, everything that is there? Everything. I do confirm the yes. contents of my question. Yes. And then do you want to include anything that you feel it's new and is not included in that question? Yes? Nothing at all. Thank you very much. Uh, members, uh, Honorable Mola. Uh, well, thank you, Chair. Sabona. Sabona. Mrs. Miss, Miss Mkiz or Mrs. Mkiz? Mrs. Mkiz. You say you confirm and know about this uh, question? Yes. And was it answered by you? Yes, it was answered my, by myself. I typed it. Are you the one who answered uh, question 3.3? Uh, if you can remind me what it pertains. Have you ever been arrested, and imprisoned, fined, charged with a crime, or investigated for a criminal offence, either in or outside South Africa? And your answer is yes. Yes. And, and, and uh, it further says, if so, Please provide details and the status of the matter, and we have not done it here in the in the question. Is it not included? It's not here. Uh, perhaps for for clarity oh, purposes. I think it's here. Uh, oh, I think it's here, but it it's is just there. Down. Okay. okay. You can you can okay. briefly. Can I it. briefly? Yeah. Okay. That is in fact what I was explaining uh, when I was asked if I confirmed the contents. I wanted to clarify that one issue uh, because I believe it's one issue that stands out. That in fact during my time at the university, involved in student politics, and during these protests, I was arrested as a result of being a member of the SSRC. Uh, we, we, I was in custody for uh, almost nine days. Uh, before getting bail of about 3,000 rands. We attended the matter in court for a couple of months, but the charges were later, uh, um, the matter was removed from the court roll. There wasn't enough evidence, and subsequently, uh, myself and other students uh, proceeded with uh, legal action against the state. That's fine, that's fine. I think it answers the question. Uh, you, you have a qualification in labor law. In labor law? Yes. As your, as your first qualification. That is correct. Uh, how vast is your knowledge on mediation? Now, uh, with my experience at the Legal Aid, you'll understand that the Legal Aid uh, is, uh, deals a lot uh, with criminal matters. Yes, they do get uh, an odd uh, divorce matter here and there, but the basis of their work is criminal work. Now, criminal work is investigation orientated. Too often, matters come to court uh, uh, and uh, uh, we engage, uh, would uh, at that point in time engage in a process of mediation to resolve issues uh, between the parties and have an agreement uh, uh, of sort. I understand and I have been engaged in the process of mediation. Okay, a standard question. What is your understanding of a fit and proper person? A 
fit, fit and proper is, is not only limited to the qualification. Um, the fitness and properness of a person must uh, be objectively evident. It is in the qualification they possess, the way that uh, uh, they behave, the, the demeanor, uh, uh, and understanding of the law. Okay. Say you are appointed as a deputy public protector. You run an investigation on a complaint, uh, and to and, and complete it, have findings and remedial actions. Then an organ of state refuses, blatantly refuses to implement the remedial actions. What is your next step and what is your next duty as a deputy public protector? As it relates to the implementation. The implementation of the remedial actions. Uh, it has been decided in courts that uh, remedial action is binding. Okay? It's, it's not optional, cannot be done away with or avoided. Uh, as it relates to matters that pertain to the executive members, um, there is a plan, um, I believe section 44 there, uh, that uh, uh, speaks of the enforcement of the remedial actions in the sense that um, the president, upon receiving any such report, uh, looks at it, considers it, gets comment on same, and then returns to the National Assembly uh, to table it uh, and, and say what is the plan or how it is going to be enforced. There are monitoring systems within the institution of the Public Protector South Africa. These uh, monitoring systems involve a, a manager who is appointed to follow up on the uh, implementation of remedial action. The such officer issues uh, reminders uh, and follows up if indeed uh, action has been taken. I also appreciate and understand that the Act, the Public Protector Act, is uh, rather mum when it comes to the issue of uh, implementation. And in my observation, uh, in order to be able to enforce uh, these remedial actions for the benefit of the people, there is a need, uh, perhaps for an amendment, to include uh, a, a conflict. Uh, I mean, I mean um, the failure, you know, to, to deal with the failure of not uh, implementing remedial uh, action in the criminal sense, uh, similar to contempt, if you like. Okay. You are a judicial officer. Uh, I'm sure you know about whistleblowers. Do you think that the Office of the Public Protector is currently doing enough in protecting its whistleblowers. Again, that uh, too speaks to the Act. Uh, the, the Act does mention that the uh, public protector uh, 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 does get involved in issues of whistleblowers, but doesn't in fact grant the actual power uh, of protecting these whistleblowers. So you reckon that uh, at least there must be a Thank legislative you. amendment? Thank yes, you. I believe so. Thank you, Chair. Honorable Ramolube. Thanks, Chair. Good afternoon, Advocate Lindue. Good afternoon, Honorable Member. In your, in your view, would you explain to us the mandate of the public protector? The public protector in the constitutional dispensation has a unique position. Uh, she is the watchdog, if you like, an overseer. She shows that there is accountability uh, uh, in public administration uh, uh, for the benefit of the people. Do you think there is enough advocacy 
um, with relate to the work of the public protector is of um, communities, especially the most ones. Look, with the recent development in jurisprudence, there is more knowledge uh, people are talking about the public protector. We know about it. Uh, uh, in, in the and so on. Uh, uh, so that, that's the basic uh, of it. But there is a greater need to ensure that there is uh, more accessibility to the protector. Have you ever handled any like, investigations or high profile cases? Well, uh, not so, so much investigations. And I must say, um, it is objective. Um, in I were to think in private practice uh, on the chart uh, to like representations, uh, SARS or the taxpayers they submit information um, that is incorrect and in turn receive um, the money and it was a lot of money. The 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 case involved the Criminal Procedure Act and had uh, 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 elements of of the tax laws of the country. I was successful. My client was not found guilty as there wasn't enough uh, evidence against them. Okay. What do you think would be, if you get appointed, your contribution in making sure that the public protector offers and enables good governance? I think to even be in the office of the public protector well, for me, it is more of a calling. Uh, you need to be human rights centered, you know, in the good of the people. And if given the opportunity, uh, I would work hand in hand with the public protector to ensure that the objectives and missions of the institution uh, are realized, thus making an impact uh, being available to people. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Fort Tuchan, for by Honorable Horn, and the Honorable Jan, Honorable Masego Chale, Honorable Bekebach, Honorable Emil Bracht, in that order. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, Advocate Mkise. Good afternoon, Honorable Member. Uh, my name is Wilma Neo Druchen. I use South African Sign Language and voicing for me is my Sign Language Interpreter Treaty. I'd like to know um, what is your perspective on what the most pressing human rights issues are in South Africa and if you should be appointed as a Deputy Public Protector, how will you um, face those issues? Human rights are, are a fundamental part of our constitution. I personally am passionate about social justice. I recognize that there are many uh, social ills or, or, or injustices. Um, Perhaps if I can um, have that question again, it's you, you were asking my perspective about human rights. I'm asking you to name what do you think are the most pressing issues um, with regards to human rights in South Africa today, currently. What are the most pressing issues affecting human rights? And if you are appointed as a DPP, how will you um, reach them or solve them? Of the pressing issues affecting uh, human rights, if I were to identify a few, I believe uh, it's the right to a dignified health service. Um, 
uh, our people uh, are struggling as it relates to health. Uh, this with regards to the state of hospitals, including the lack of service or even the standard of service that they experience there. Uh, I feel that is one of the issues that need to be addressed. Um, in recent times, we have seen on media how um, there's, there's even doctors uh, with, who are qualified who should be in the system and assisting to take the pressure uh, and thereby realizing this right, uh, who are unemployed. Those are uh, some of the issues uh, uh, that I think are important. Now, if appointed, how will I realize this uh, issue of human rights? Uh, it still speaks to the accessibility of the Office of the Public Protector. Um, as and when an opportunity arises itself uh, uh, in events uh, uh, on the media using radio, uh, I would take part uh, in the role of informing and educating people about their human rights, um, uh, how to enforce and, uh, and how, uh, in fact, they should be enjoying uh, protection um, or of such rights. Do you feel that the work of the public protector so far has made an impact in the lives of the ordinary people? In the lives of ordinary people? Yeah. Yes, I, I believe so. And public awareness about the Office of the Public Protector, do you feel the people on the ground know or do they need more information to go out to be more aware? And uh, there is a need to do more, to be accessible, to be in the ground there with the people, understanding their problems, even before complaint stage. Uh, uh, that way we would uh, uh, ensure uh, that these rights are realized. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Honorable Hon. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, Honorable um, Member. I also want to uh, latch on to your comments around social justice and, and human rights. I've noted that in your questionnaire you, you also... Um, stated that in your view social justice or a lack thereof is one of the key challenges that must be addressed through the through the office of the public protector but can you maybe firstly just state in terms of the constitutional provisions around the public protector what is the the areas of functionality the what can the public protector deal with? The public protector is concerned with the uh, investigation um, uh, of uh, administrative action, uh, conduct or lack thereof, maladministration amongst other issues, <coughs> to investigate, report on, on such, and uh, give those remedial actions. Mm. That is the mandate of the public protector. Thank you. And, and would you agree that, that we have if one looks at your answer in, in paragraph 2.2 .2 on your questionnaire, talking about social justice, um, human rights issues, um, gender inequalities, that we have in this country the Human Rights Commission and the, and the Gender Equality Commission. So don't you think if you use the office of the deputy public protector to primarily try and address social injustices that you would be duplicating the work of those constitutional bodies? Um, indeed, it is so that there are these institutions under Chapter 9, including uh, one for gender uh, uh, and, uh, and for human rights. And without uh, overlapping the work of the public protector, there is a need uh, for these section nine, uh, chapter nine institutions to have a somewhat working relationship and understanding. This was also uh, dealt with in the national development uh, uh, plan to say there is in fact a need for these institutions to work together. Um, to, to, for me to consider uh, social justice or even the rights of disabled women and children um, is but to speak uh, to 
to the constitutional duty to ensure that the rights in the constitution are protected first as a citizen uh, of the country and, and someone who is uh, an officer in an office that gives an opportunity to address issues uh, that relate to the constitution. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Jane. Good afternoon, Honorable Member. Um, I only have two questions for you. Your voice is too soft. Gives me time to drink my water. Oh, no. Oh, God, they must get a raise on me. Thank you. So, um, the only one question, to, uh, I have two questions for you, and the only one you have al already answered it uh, on, on, on the questionnaire, but I still want you to uh, give me more information on that as to why. Honorable Chair, we are struggling to hear you. Am I still? Okay, so Okay. Uh, my question would be why you believe you are the right person to serve as a deputy public protector? Besides my skills and uh, qualification, I was born and raised in the southwestern township. I, underlie, I understand uh, inequality. I understand uh, poverty, I understand uh, the lack of service delivery. And it would give me a great honor to play a role in the realization of, of rights in holding uh, office bearers accountable and doing a diligent uh, job. I believe I'm a suitable candidate uh, based on all of those. Uh, but a follow-up question on that, yes. how would you think you do that because you, if you are employed as a deputy, public protector, remember there's a public protector, you are a deputy, correct. Yes. so can you explain in, in, in line with your, your, the position that you are applying for, mm -hmm. deputy public protector? Okay. Well. Uh, this is a follow-up to the first question please. about, uh, if, please repeat it, let, let, so I get uh, the I'm just saying because you were giving me what you would do, what you think you are able to, why, you're explaining why, I'm why you think that you are a, yeah, yes. but now, I wanted to find out because you were telling me as if uh, you're playing a role of a public protector. Is that know? what it sounded yes. like? It sounded like that, okay. but uh, because I wanted you to stick on the, yes, it's part of that, but I also wanted you to explain to me in line with as a deputy, Okay. if you happen to be uh, okay. uh, yes, employed on The that. deputy public protector is there to assist the public protector. I understand that her functions, uh, uh, or rather the, the work is delegated by the public protector for the deputy public mm. protector. Mm. Therefore, I believe for all intents and purposes there needs to be a good relation between the two offices uh, to assist where, whenever um, they, there is a need and, 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 and deputize uh, the public protector as far as uh, she enables me to do so. Does it answer your question? No, it's fine. Okay. That's fine. So now you know that you are you are applying for the position of a deputy public protector. public protector. Yes. So in in in, in the middle of uh, uh, your 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 work, if you, uh, you you get the opportunity of being employed on this position, there will be a time where maybe there <coughs> is a misunderstanding, or maybe in terms of the relations. Uh, between yourself and the public protector, how would you handle that? Maybe if there are some things which you don't uh, understand each other, or you you feel that you know this is a way out of your own way of doing things. 
there is hierarchy everywhere. I mean, there's the president, there's the deputy president, mm -hmm. uh, and the reason for, for that is to have a balance and perhaps for accountability reason. Uh, I don't know what kind of problems I can't preempt that might be there. But I do understand that because of hierarchy and the duty of deputizing, uh, there's a need for us to work in a harmonious uh, way, to respect each other, where there are issues we should be able to sit down, uh, more especially as women sit down, we, we are able to uh, converse and talk about our thoughts and, 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 and so forth. I, I think that would foster a good relationship, that we be open to each other, that we discuss uh, issues and iron them out. I mean, uh, in any workplace, uh, you are there to work and, and, and not for personal issues. So there, there should never be a room for personal vendettas uh, or, or issues to be identified in any other way uh, except uh, work-related. Thank you very much, Advocate. Thank you. Advocate Thank you. Advocate Mkhiza, is there a specific reason why you, why you are saying more as women? Because the issue of the purity, yes. it's it, it could have been two men, it could be a man and yes. a woman. So why specifically two women? And and I, I understand clearly that in fact, uh, whilst a, a the office in the office or for this post, it must be a South African who is either male and female. I was mainly just highlighting that fact, you know, that even better as women uh, uh, known to talk and uh, or. Have have the ability to, to talk, uh, it should come with ease uh, that we are able to sit down, iron out issues as it relates to the office uh, with respect and dignity. Thank you. Honorable Mkwebane. Thanks. Uh, Advocate Mjani. Siapi Mjani. I I understand you dealt with a number of um, cases, and you said you will, you're driven by a desire to achieve social justice, dignity, access to basic services, and to deliver quality service. Uh, how many judgments have you issued, and those judgments which have an impact on uh, social justice since you were a magistrate? Well, I'm a magistrate in the district court, and we deal mostly uh, with criminal matters. Uh, you want to know which matters have I dealt with that affect uh, or relate to social justice? Dignity, access to basic services. Uh, uh, I mean, to deprive one of, of ownership uh, uh, of their property speaks to dignity. You are taking something that is of, of, of theirs. Um, I can, if, if, if to mention one. Okay, and then before, as it, yes, other cases before, and which as it relates, have an impact, yeah, and as it relates justice. to dignity or even the uh, the rights of women and children, because I did uh, mention that, and that would speak to domestic violence matters. I've had a handful uh, of, of of cases. Um, that I have dealt with, and, and those uh, generally affect the rights of women um, and, and children alike. Okay, you spoke about amending the Public Protector Act to deal with the issue of uh, enforcement. What is your view about the role of Parliament to hold the executive to account? Because they are the ones who are supposed to make sure that the remedial actions of the Public Protector are implemented. Uh, please repeat the question. Uh, you what is the role of Parliament? Yes, in holding the executive to account if their departments are failing to implement the remedial actions of the public protector. <clears throat> Uh, unless otherwise, I think I had mentioned earlier on um, that uh, in line with the uh, Executive Members Ethics Act, um, there's a duty there. Uh, for the president to hold uh, members accountable, have plans on how to implement remedial action, amongst other things. Mm. But the president, president is not a member of parliament. 
but I was referring to members of parliament because executive account to, to parliament, but I, I get your, your, your gist. Then, considering the issue of the deputy power protector, would you as deputy power protector write to outside stakeholders and dispute what the public protector um, has said or the decision which the public protector has taken? while doing my duties as a deputy public protector, or would it be when I am acting in the position of public no, protector? No, you are doing your duties. The public protector is there, you are not acting. You go ahead, uh, the public protector is issuing a media statement or responding to something. You go ahead and write to state attorney or any other mm. outside person and say, this is not the situation, this is the proper situation, or this is not what you know about. No, I don't think that is uh, correct uh, or, or should be done. I don't believe it's the correct because it, it speaks to undermining the uh, public protector who is the overseer of the institution and or head of the institution, uh, if you like. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Mkeze. Good afternoon. You are the magistrate. Yes, I am. So you want to leave the bench? Yes, I'm looking Why? to to expand uh, my experience, my knowledge, um, and and to do a, a greater good. Okay, let's pause there. So currently, have you had any reviews? None. Okay. Do you have any partly had matters? I do have. How many? Matters. Um, I, I, I can't say exactly, but I, I have quite a few, and I can explain. Just give me a figure. You, you, these are partly matters that are adjudicated by you. Yes, that is At correct. At least you should be having a knowledge of how many. Uh, plus minus 10 matters. Plus minus 10 partly yes, had. In the criminal court. And you know that the norms and standards. Say I how, know that. How, how, you know the norms and standards indicate how many you can have partly had matters. Yes, because matters must be finalized uh, within certain yes, time frames. Yes. yes. So why is there such a, a big number of partly had matters? I can explain that thoroughly. <coughs> there are stakeholders, even at the level of courts, these include your station commanders uh, who must oversee that, you know, dockets are in court, investigations are done timelessly, and so on and so forth. Then there's a support staff of the court with a court manager that oversees interpreters, stenographers, and other role players within the court. The frustrations that come uh, with ensuring that everything is before you for a matter uh, to proceed are serious. Dockets do not come to court on time, investigations take long to be uh, finalized and in fact the very reason why I have uh, 10 and more uh, matters pending on the roll is because I am constantly pushing that dockets be here and I try by all means to hold stakeholders accountable. Thank you. So so with, with the 10 and more partly ma had matters, am I right is that, that, that that's the reason why you, you want to leave that space? No, basically. not at all. Because you you want us to have a deputy public protector that is not able to complete her work. Not at all. Um, if if uh, we say I have, say for argument's sake, 10 matters, I, I have within a short space of time been able to finalize 40, 40 matters. Now, it, it depends on how you look at it. That's my next point. So what is your finalization rate per month of the matters? With the frustrations that yes. I've uh, uh, already outlined, yes. uh, I, I can say 70%. Okay. Let's now go to what you are praying for, okay. the deputy public protector. Do you know the, the case of the Mail and Guardian on investigations? Yes, I am familiar with it. What is it? What is it? So just, the, just briefly Briefly, the uh, principle that stands out there for me is that when conducting investigations, you must do so with an open mind. An open mind is an inquiring one. You must ensure that the truth is in fact arrived at. Thank you. I will leave that. Um, so you have done research on this office? 
This office. Yeah. The uh, PPSA. What's the budget of the PPSA currently? The budget of the PPSA is around uh, 370 million rands. Okay. My last point, Chair. Help me with the, a distinction between these two. The, 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 the Chapter 9 institutions are governed by the following principles. I just want to, to, to help you with me with two that I need to. Okay. It says these institutions are independent and subject only to the constitution and the law. Ne? Yes. The second one says chapter nine institutions are accountable to the NA, National Assembly, and must report on their activities and performance of their functions to the, to the National Assembly at least once, once a year. So I'm confused here. It says they are accountable to the constitution and the law and here. Uh, so help me. What is the difference between the two? Um, uh, please repeat your question. It just there at the end. I, I, I was what, it, what is the difference between these two sentences I, I read for you? That they are independent and subject only to the law, but also that they must account to the national. I, I, I think uh, even uh, an institution such as the uh, public protector, uh, who is the watchdog, like I, I said, uh, even they need to be accountable to somebody. Thank you, Ms. Nkiza. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Advocate Thank you. Please, I think just one follow up. Outstanding, do you have outstanding judgment? Yes, I do. How many? Um, uh, perhaps two. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, madam. Good afternoon, madam. Um, You've been a magistrate for around uh, four years now, right? Appointed permanently for four yeah. years. Uh, and so you obviously had your eye on a career in the judiciary. Yes. Why do you want to be a public protector? Um, I, I mentioned earlier on that uh, having been in the office, you'll remember from my CV that I had been a, a magistrate acting for that matter for two years and then subsequently the four years, that's about six years. Mm -hmm. and and uh, having seen um, the work uh, of the uh, office and, and generally what is expected of me, I feel um, there's a need for me to do even uh, bigger things, uh, to move on and develop uh, my skills and make an impact in the lives of South African citizens. I feel um, if I were to stay too long, um, uh, I, I would be somewhat stagnant and, 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 and not grow, uh, and I'm still very young. Yes, that, that, that may be so, but of course there's a career path in the, in the magistracy and in the judiciary. Yes. Um, which is certainly making a contribution to South Africa. Yes. Uh, why do you think that being the deputy public protector would be better? Uh, it gives me a greater scope. Uh, it, it, uh, being with the public protector uh, gives me a greater uh, scope in the sense that I, I get to uh, be involved in the investigations uh, of the matters and subsequently write reports, uh, thereby giving implementation, uh, uh, action to be implemented. This different from uh, being in the judiciary. In the judiciary, I, I sit, I don't even get to hold the docket. Um, matters are presented before me. I listen to the facts. I then apply the law to the facts uh, uh, on a balance of probabilities beyond reasonable doubt. I then arrive at a, a, a finding. I'm sorry, in which circumstances do you apply the law to the facts on the basis of a balance of probabilities in a criminal court? At a criminal court, you, you look at the elements of the offence and you see if the uh, crime or offence has in fact been approved. I see. Thank you. Um, you are familiar with the doctrine of story decasis? Yes, I am. Uh, and do you think that that doctrine finds application in the uh, workings of the Public Protector's Office? The doctrine speaks to uh, following precedent. Um, that decided uh, cases should serve as a guideline, um, uh, even in other matters. Um, 
as it relates to the public uh, protector's office, I think indeed uh, decided cases play a major role uh, in the operations and, and, and subsequent plans uh, of the institution because they will then give a guideline on how to conduct investigations, um, uh, implementing and enforcing um, a remedial action amongst other things. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good afternoon, Mr. McKeese. Good afternoon, Honourable Member. Um, would you agree that in investigative skills as well as specialised knowledge of public administration or some of the required skills for a, to make a success of this particular job. You say that investigation skills and? Specialised knowledge of public administration. It's just a yes or no. No, sir. You don't think so? I don't think so. Given that, no. given the scope of the public protector in terms of the constitution, the job, the job description, Look, if you can stay, stay uh, it like it, that. As it relates to the constitution um, or, or maybe the supporting legislation in the form of the Public Protector Act, the requirements uh, to qualify for the post. No, no, I'm not talking about those requirements. Yes. I'm talking for someone, uh, your personally, that would make you successful in this job. It would be a requirement to know something about public administration with governance, organs of state, <coughs> and investigations, investigative skills. That's what I mean. It's not something that's minimum required. It's not that. Um, you should have a knowledge of investigations and uh, a specialized knowledge of public administration. Yes. Okay. So now in your CV, it is not stated there, but now I want to give you an opportunity yes. to tell this panel that you do have those skill set that would make, should you be appointed, the success of this okay. job. As it relates to uh, investigation skills, um, having said that I haven't been with the legal aid and subsequently in practice and, and, and dealing with uh, matters uh, of different kinds, I have learned to uh, mediate, which is also one of the strengths uh, needed in the Public uh, Protector uh, Office. But ultimately, as it relates to uh, investigations, the very fact that uh, as a defense attorney, uh, I would, uh, when representing my clients, uh, evaluate the evidence, see if there are loopholes, guide and advise my client. That speaks to a certain skill about the gathering of information, seeing if it's applicable and how it can be used. And for that reason, I think I am somewhat knowledgeable in, in the um, umbrella of uh, investigations. Now, specialized uh, knowledge uh, of public administration, there's leg legislature uh, uh, in place uh, that I read and understand, and I think it, it shouldn't uh, be too difficult for me to understand, um, uh, even if, even without a specialized qualification in, in, in and such. Thank you. Uh, are there any further questions? Well, thank you very much, uh, Advocate Mkisa. Uh, thank you for availing yourself. Thank you, Chair. Uh, did you find the questions to be fair? Yes, I, I, I did find them very fair. Was the interview fair? Yes, it was fair. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for availing yourself. Uh, you are excused. Thank you so much. Thank you, honorable member. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, there was a, a suggestion from the secretary that we would take a five minutes break. Thank you.
Mas, é, a história, a história, a can we just after the last person just deal uh, five minutes with correspondence? Okay. Just before we adjourn. I think if you if you look at your, your emails, there is an email from the speaker. If you can read it so long so that we can yeah, so that we can have a discussion um, around that email. Okay, first so I just talked to you. Yeah. Thanks. Good afternoon, uh, Advocate Tibanyana. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, Honorable Chairperson um, and members. Before we proceed, we'd like to apologize to you for the delays. Uh, you should have been interviewed at quarter past three. Uh, for matters beyond our control in the morning, uh, it has delayed everybody. But we would like to sincerely apologize for the inconvenience caused. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 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 in five minutes, tell us who you are, your values, and why you are the right person uh, to be considered for the position of the deputy public protector? Uh, thank you, Chair and other members. Um, I'm a human rights activist uh, at heart and a public servant at heart. And almost all my working life, I've been in the public service, committed to the advancement of our crucial democracy. Um, and I do have uh, relevant qualifications, two uh, master's degrees, uh, as well as an LLB, and I got admitted as an advocate in South Africa, as well as in Lesotho, uh, around 2003. And uh, I have a long experience, really, uh, in Chapter 9 of the Human Rights Commission, and currently I am at the Office of the Chief Justice as, a, as Head of Legal Services. I'm also in the board of SABC, uh, as a, and I sit in three committees, the Governance Committee, the Social Ethics Committee, as well as the Human Resources Committee, which I chair. And uh, the reason why I'm here is that I really just want to co contribute uh, in strengthening our personal democracy, but also in helping the public protector to be uh, much more effective, as well as to overcome some of the challenges it has had. And I'm saying this in view of the current challenges the country is having now in terms of, uh, you know, uh, realizing the values and the aspirations of our people as far as the question is concerned, but also addressing issues like poverty, uh, maladministration, poor service delivery, corruption, as well as good governance in many institutions. Uh, that, that's really my passion. Uh, if you look at my studies, that's what I've really been focusing on as well as my numerous academic publications in this area. And I also work with civil society. I've got strong links with civil society, and I think that will also be a benefit uh, uh, to, to this position. And of course, my commitment really to, to fight to protect the whistleblowers, which I still think that are quite crucial in the fight against corruption, uh, maladministration, and basically everything that the public protector does depends a large, to a large extent on whistleblowers. And the more we protect them, the better. That's why I'm here. Thank you very much, uh, Advocate Stipanyana. Uh, can you please confirm your disclosure made in the questionnaire? Yes, Chair, I did sign the disclosure in the questionnaire. Um, is there anything that you want to add? Uh, nothing outside the question, Chair. Thank you very much. 
uh, members. Uh, uh, is there anyone who's got questions to so Advocate Panyan? Uh, Honorable Horn. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Chair, we obviously know Mr. Tipanyane um, as a committee, both some of us from the time he was at the Human Rights Commission and then uh, when he also now applied for the position of the public protector last year. So I really want to ask one question of you, Mr. Tipanyane, and that is that from our experience and our previous engagements, it's quite clear that you have a big presence. Um, and at the Human Rights Commission, one would want to say that that presence, ultimately, while you were the CEO and not one of the commissioners, led to some tension. Now, in, in, in the... In the in respect of this specific role, you're applying to be the deputy public protector. And um, historically, that office has experienced more or less in respect of each one of the public protectors and their deputies some form of, a, of, of tension. Now, as I say, with your, your big presence wherever you go, how will you contribute to that not ultimately um, impacting negatively on the office of the public protector if you are appointed. Thank you, Honourable Member. Uh, it's really about maturity as well as understanding uh, what is the role uh, what is required to play. I currently work under the Secretary General for a year of the Office of Chief Justice. This might be a bit younger than me, and there will be no problems. Uh, in the SABC, I work under the chaps and deputy chaps who are younger than me, and there are no problems. So it's really, um, you know, how one uh, interacts and, and addresses issues. And also, it's very important that, you know, one must ensure that there is team spirit uh, and the cooperation between the two. So the act is very clear. I have to carry out uh, the instructions. Now, I'll only do work assigned to me by the public protector, and I have to respect that. She's been appointed by parliament over me, and I think I'm mature enough to, to deal with that. And I think my experience has shown that. Now, of course, uh, where there are differences, there will always be differences, and one has to uh, put those out in a very respectful manner. But I must say, even at the Human Rights Commission, I've worked under two female CEOs. Uh, so I've learned, I've, I know how to work under people who might be, who are senior to me, but might be younger than me, uh, in terms of age, as well as uh, academic qualifications. So it's really about uh, humility. And I, you know, if you saw in my question, I said, you know, I'm getting old now, and I think I'll mail it. And there's also a lot of maturity. Uh, one is to understand that it's not about me, it's about the interest of the institution at heart. And I know the current uh, public protector I've worked with there was the commission around issues of whistleblowing. Uh, late last year, we were together at an awards for whistleblowers, so I have no problem with that. It's all about the job. It's about putting the country and institution before our personal egos. In any case, we'll appear before this committee if there are any problems. Thank you, Honorable Horn, Honorable Ramulubia. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ma'am. Um, should you be appointed as the Deputy Public Protector, how would you seek to influence the strategic direction of the PP PPSA? Well, it's really about understanding the, the mandate uh, of the Public Protect and its vision, understanding uh, its uh, uh, annual performance plan, and, and, and also, you know, going through the report, uh, one has picked up a couple of challenges uh, which have to be addressed. Uh, I can enumerate a few of them. You know, one, for example, is that uh, there's a very low response of the, resp of the reports of the public protector, and actually there is even a, a view that maybe the act must be amended, similar to the, one of the Human Rights Commission, where you know entities are required to report back within a certain period of time by law, in terms of what they've done to implement that. The other one is about the financial independence. You know, where do we really locate the financial 
uh, sources of the PPZ through justice or through parliament, the access parliament. So those are some of the issues which have to be addressed. But also, you know, uh, in view of the past, we really need to restore the public trust in the public sector. It's very important. And that's what we need to work hard uh, in, in addressing that. So those are some of the issues uh, which one has to look into. Uh, how we deal with number of co complaints in a faster manner than we are doing. How we utilize technology, uh, especially now where you know we are, we, are we are facing massive budgetary cuts. How then do we address that? And lastly, as I've said in no, my document. I have limited time. Um, when answering to Honourable Horn, you made mention whistleblowers yes. um, in your session in previously working with the public protector or the current public protector. Do you think the public protector gives support to whistleblowers, enough support in that instance? Well, they are mandated to do so, but uh, I don't think uh, we've done enough as a country, even as institutions, to really protect and support whistleblowers. I know in the report they have dealt with a case, uh, successfully so, of, of a whistleblower. So yes, they've done some work, but I honestly think that a lot more could be done. What do you think should be done? What would be your recommendation to address the regress of that well, two sure things. The act is still there, but the act is not being fully uh, implemented by government departments. Whistleblowers continue to be victimized, many of them, uh, without much, uh, you know, intervention. But two, the act itself, you know, does require a, 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 an amendment. So basically, the, the public protector should be focusing on how public bodies execute their, their act in protecting whistleblowers. Uh, uh, so that we at least we can have more people encouraged. So one will actually have a, a clear focus where we monitor how public, I'm sorry, government departments are dealing uh, with the act in protecting uh, whistleblowers. Because there are whistleblowers all over the show, but many people are scared to come out because they get victimized. And when they get victimized, they have to pay for, them, for themselves in dealing with court issues where they lose their jobs, you know, so many things. So there's still a very, very huge, I mean, I'm part of that movement. That is one of the biggest concerns that we are not being adequately protected or supported as whistleblowers. So we need to look at how we implement the law and strengthen the law. But, but also work with other bodies, Human Rights Commission, uh, AG, and so forth. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nibot Jochen. Thank you, Chairperson. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Advocate. I'm Wilmane Jochen. I'm using South African Sign Language, interpreting for me is Francois Deisel. You know from your experience and your advanced experience on human rights, but I would like to know currently, in today, what is the most pressing human rights issue um, in our society? If you are appointed as a deputy public protector, how are you going to approach those issues? Um, I would say three issues, really. Uh, issues of corruption, poverty, and then gender-based violence, as well as, uh, maybe uh, not to be biased, uh, the support we're giving to persons with disability who are still struggling, really, to make sure that they are adequately represented uh, in, in all spheres of our society, whether it's Employment Equity uh, Act. I mean, where I work now, you know, most government departments are still battling to even pass beyond the 2% uh, uh, requirement. So I guess the public protector can also do a lot more to check how government departments are really addressing the issues of persons with disability, but as well as the other three matters I've mentioned. Gender-based violence is actually quite a big thing in our country. Uh, basically, it, it deprives almost 50% of, 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 of our population of adequate space under the sun. Thank you so much. Um, the work of the public protector, do you feel it's making an impact um, on the ordinary people on the ground? Well, if you look over the past, uh, since it ex existed, yes, I mean, I think uh, the public protector has really made a, a massive contribution uh, in terms of good governance as well as addressing uh, maladministration. 
However, you know, there are still gaps there and there. If you look at the number of complaints, they are getting about 5,000 plus. Um, a lot could be done, really. Uh, if you look then at the, the challenges out there, you know, uh, the issues of service deliveries, quite bad. We, we can't blame the public sector for that. It's not really their role, but is to ensure that those who are responsible uh, deal with that. So I guess if you were to look at it, depends where you look at it. If you look at the current situation, you might say, well, they're not doing such a good job because we're having these massive problems uh, of uh, service delivery, uh, poor governance and stuff like that. But if you look then at their record in terms of their size, they've really made a, a massive contribution uh, in our country as far as uh, the mandate is concerned. They could do better though. Thank you so much. Um, people on the ground, do you think they know the role of the public protector or do you think more information should be made available to um, the ordinary people and how can that be? Well, um, again, it depends, you know, there was a time when public protector was at highest level, <laughs> now lot down, so it's seasonal, but certainly, uh, you know, we do need to uh, publicize the work of a protector. We need to make it more accessible. And I guess that's why uh, the third program of Pulp Protect is really about stakeholder management. Uh, we need to do more because really we're here to serve South Africans and South Africans should not be sitting at home with problems uh, and, and, and having nowhere to go. So definitely we need to be more accessible uh, and get more South Africans to address these issues. But also I think we need to get government to fully appreciate its mandate so that at least we minimize the number of violations uh, of the constitution, we minimize incidents of poor service delivery uh, in that regard. Otherwise then the challenge is that you get South Africans basically signing off to say this constitution is the promise, it's not working for us. And that's why public protect was created, to strengthen national democracy by making sure that these problems are being addressed. So if we were to look at the survey done in November. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Mola. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, Advocate Vagnane, you make mention that you are a human rights activist and have got vast experience and knowledge in the human rights um, Commission. Uh, now, in terms of mandate, what is a significant difference between the Human Rights Commission and the, and the Public Protector of South Africa? Well, the mandate, the, the difference really is in the mandate. So, if you look at Section uh, 182 of the Constitution, that the Public Protector uh, has the power to investigate. Uh, uh, any conduct in uh, state affairs and public administration, uh, which is alleged to have, uh, uh, you know, which is which is alleged to be improper, or result in uh, uh, prejudice or impropriety. Now, so so both of them have been created to strengthen social human social democracy but through different methods. So the Human Rights Commission looks at much broader issues of human rights, whereas Public Protector is focusing a lot on the state because the state is quite crucial in giving effect to our constitutional democracy, Section 7 of the Constitution. So in that sense, one could say, while they are both uh, human rights bodies under the Paris principles, uh, like Gender Commission, Public Protector, is, I'm sorry, so Public Protector has a, a, a much narrow focus focusing on uh, state power from an administrative point of view. Even though, of course, some of the issues which they will look into are also human rights. So, for example, we did a joint hearing with, with, with the public protector uh, in the Alexander situation, you know, where they were looking at an, one aspect of maladministration, we're looking at, you know, to, to extend the extent to which housing and other issues have been addressed. Okay. And that's why in some other countries in Africa, both institutions are one. Okay. Uh... The appointment or, or any election of a deputy in, 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 in whatever aspect comes with a natural feature. Natural feature of looking also into the future. 
because you are appointing a deputy, and therefore part of what must be a focal point perhaps is to uh, have a, a, a picture of the future. I think you get me. Uh, now you are 61 years old. Uh, do you think you represent that future? Well, uh, I don't want to argue about judges going on until 75 years old. Uh, I won't get there. I mean, for me, really, my, my really being coming here is basically just to bring my support and experience to make sure that the future is a better future. Uh, that I support the public protector and we generate and we encourage uh, lots of young people to raise their hands and become future public protectors. I, mean, I could be dead in three, four years, who knows? So I cannot, you know, that, yeah. So uh, my role really is just to help and facilitate uh, at my age. Chair, thank you very much. I'm done. You look surprised. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Good afternoon, um, Mr. Tipanyan. Um, I have only two questions for you. And the first one is that why do you believe you are the right person to serve as a deputy public protector? Well, well, who's really? Yeah, Mar Excuse. I doubt that Honorable uh, Ebola heard you. Yeah. Well, I would say on an objective standard, um, I've been the CEO of the Human Rights Commission two terms. I've been head of research. Uh, I've lectured law. I'm working for the Office of Chief Justice. I'm a board member of SABC. Uh, without being arrogant, I think there are very, not many people who have the kind of experience uh, which I have to bring into this organization, especially at this point in time in the history of our country. Uh, so I, I think I really am. And also, as I was saying earlier on, my, my commitment to human rights, good governance, I've not been associated uh, with issues of bad governance and propriety. It's not me. Uh, and I think I bring a lot of integ integrity. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at my CV, I mean, having been a researcher and academic, I think that will also be a very useful contribution over and above my practical uh, experience. I've worked, I'm, I worked for, I'm working for government department. I did a short-term contract for Justice Department last year, organizing a conference for them. Uh, I've worked with civil society. So I, I think uh, I'm well-rounded and uh, committed uh, to basically help. Uh, so I think on an objective standard, I should really be out of the top, unless it's something which I don't know. Okay, thank you very much. Um, second one, um, I just want to find out, having all that experience that you've just uh, alluded to, I just want to know how are you going to use that experience in uh, assisting the public protector? You know that there are issues in terms of the department, the institutions, uh, uh, not responding well when it comes to the re remedial actions uh, from the office of the, of the public protector. How would you use that experience that you have to yeah. assist them? Yes, a apart from my earlier <coughs> issues about the need to amend the law, I think it's also about encouraging, it's about stakeholder management. Uh, you know, because, you know, if you look at Section 181, um, all organs of state have a responsibility to enhance or to support and protect the integrity, the dignity, and impact and effectiveness of this body, Chapter 9. And therefore, I think one needs to raise greater awareness uh, on government departments that, you know, we do need to support the work of the protecting this outcome is for the good of all of us as South Africans. So, yes, uh, laws would help, but I think the change of hearts and attitudes is really what matters the most. And I think we need to work a lot more harder on that. But also, you know, to get the public to support us, the public should also uh, not allow uh, the disregard of the report of the public protector, because we are saving the public at the end of the day, and it's our constitution. So those are some of the issues which really we need to work hard at. Uh, you know, as I'm saying, uh, win the hearts and minds of everybody. 
to uh, strengthen our personal democracy. So a lot of campaigns will be required, really. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any further questions? Um, Advocate Chipanyane, good afternoon. Good afternoon, ma'am. I have to declare as well, I was reporting to Advocate Tipanyane when I was working at the Human Rights Commission um, as a researcher, senior researcher. So um, I need to be upfront and report that, Chairperson. We are required to do, to do that. I think that was one of the causes of the delay. So not only the two candidates, but even this candidate um, was my senior or was my supervisor. Okay, um, Advocate Dipanyan, I see in your um, motivation or declaration, you are saying, um, maybe let's start with this issue of Section 181, uh, failure to implement uh, remedial actions. What do you think the role of Parliament is? Because they are also an organ of state, and West um, Section 42 of the Constitution is very clear what their responsibilities are to help and support the, the, the public protector in that respect. Yeah. I'll start by saying, you know, over and above Section 181, Parliament itself has a constitutional mandate to have an oversight over how the executive branch of government performs and call it to account when necessary. So I think Parliament itself should also have a greater focus on how the executive branch of government and its uh, agencies is basically giving effect to its obligations as far as public protect is concerned. What's your view about um, implementing the same way as requesting the Auditor General to come and present the audit outcomes of that department before they can um, approve the annual performance or the, the, the annual report, uh, that Parliament should also be doing that, that public protector should come and present that so that that institution can be held to account. How many reports were issued? How many they failed to do that? That is the primary function of Parliament. Chapter 9 bodies are just there to assist Parliament in doing its work. So a partnership, uh, between those two entities was very important. But as I'm saying, I think, you know, like we in the Human Rights Commission did, we had the act to be amended to ensure, to, to insist that once our reports are done, uh, uh, the responding government entity has a certain days to get back to us to say, how are we implementing that? So that, that will help. But you are correct that, you know, Parliament bears the primary responsibility to ensure that the executive uh, carries out its obligations. Yes, the, the, the Human Rights Commission Act, I mean, it, it has that enforcement, but I mean, remember then the issue of legal costs and litigation costs. So I was just thinking about where you, you wouldn't be spending any money to enforce or to force people to implement. The other issue in your motivation, you said you um, assist the public protector you will ensure that the working environment for staff members in the public protector is conducive. The past events have traumatized many staff members and a lot of healing needs to, to happen. Uh, what do you mean about that? Well, uh, I did follow a little bit the impeachment uh, the, uh, hearing <laughs> and where a number of staff members you know, from public protector came to testify for and against. Okay. Uh, so it means, you know, in order to make organizations run more effectively, you need a team spirit. Uh, because, you know, so those two camps need to work together for the good of the organization. Uh, Will you, as Deputy Public Protector, work with a staff member who assaults complainant, and especially old um, uh, pensioners, like how Mr. Samuel did? Well, who was convicted by a court? If a staff member assaults a, 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 a member of the public, that staff member does not belong to the Chapter Nine bodies. Period. And then another staff member, Debucho, who violated the internal communication policy, receiving a communication which is critical, sharing it with staff members, 
and was found to be um, not uh, proper. So I'm just saying, no. as an executive, would you allow that well, behavior? Only yesterday the IC fired a staff member who leaked information. So I think we need to... Up. So if there is proven evidence that a, a, a wrongdoing has happened, we need to enforce it as an institution. I mean, this is, we're, we're, we're here to uphold the values of our country uh, and, and, and the law. So things like that, if they've been proven, uh, you know, unless, evidence, yeah. uh, unless someone had a gun on his head, you know, uh, then it's something else. But and as I'm saying... senior executive uh, failing to implement a court order, which then leads to the public protector having to pay costs. So those are the issues. I'm just saying, as the executive, Let's not just uh, yeah. maybe repeat the narrative as if people need healing. Those are the facts where you as the executive, you'll have to deal with those kinds of things. No, certainly I'll have to do that because that's what the public protector stands for. That's what the court stands for. And if I don't, uh, I'll be here before yourself to explain why have I not upheld the law. Uh, you know, last time I was asked, uh, you know, the public protector uh, is only subject to the constitution and the law, and it must do its work without fear or favor and without prejudice. So those are the values which we have to uphold. And if we don't, then, uh, you know, we'll have to be dealt with by the portfolio committee with okay. no mercy. Do you think you made any impact to the public when you were the CEO of Human Rights Commission? Because there were um, allegations, especially from the EFF, that you are not protecting uh, the vulnerable, um, especially um, who are subjected to racism. Well, I'm a little bit lost about that. Uh, in the first term of, the, of my term as, as, as the Human Rights Commission CEO, we appeared before the Kara Asmal Committee. We had 65% public approval. We were held by Parliament unanimously as one of the leading champions of human rights. In my second term as the, human, as the CEO from 2017 to 2015, we raised the public profile of the Commission to 400 million rands. It's only when COVID happened and other things happened that's when it began going down. But even when I left, we still had 62% uh, performance rate. You dealt with racism within the public protector. I mean, you were appointed to deal with the alleged racism um, within the institution. How would you change, or what would you do? Because you remember the senior manager who was accused of racist behavior towards the subordinate. Yeah. Yes, the deputy public protector, because that senior manager falls within service delivery. How would you make sure that such incidences are not happening? Yes, I think every person who works in a Chapter 9 institution needs to live by the values of, the, of those bodies. And, uh, and if we don't, so racism is definitely, a, it goes against the founding values of our, of our constitution in terms of Section 1. Thank so, you. Uh, then the issue no, of... Thank uh, you. Okay. Honorable Mukwebane. I've already given you a few seconds about the Thank you very much. Any further questions? For me? No. Oh, okay. Can I? <laughs> Take Honorable Janji's questions. <laughs> <laughs> Unless Honorable Janji expressly gave us your... She must leave you the question. <laughs> Honorable Janji. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll be quick, uh, Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Tipanyane, good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, you have you done uh, some bit of research for your prayers for this office? Uh, I tried <laughs> within uh, the time available to me. Oh, okay. What's what's the current budget for that office in this current financial year that ends? 2023, 24, or 20, 24, 25? This current one. Current. Um, let me just check now. Uh, sorry, I'm just getting confused in numbers. Because uh, in the last the annual report, uh, 2020, 2023, it was 400 million uh, with additions from justice. 
and uh, for the current budget, it must be 377 million, somewhere around there. Okay, uh, thank you. And it's been reduced, I think, for the next financial aid. Okay, thank you. And it's made up of how many programs? There are three main programs of the public protector uh, administration, investigations, and uh, strategic, uh, what do they call it now? Some, sometimes, sometimes they say complaints, sometimes they say strategic management. Those are the key programs of the... Oh, that's fine, thank you. Let's, let's stay with the investigations. Um, are you aware of the Mail and Guardian case on investigations? I've read those two thoroughly. <laughs> uh, just share with this panel the, the key principles of that. Open and inquiring mind. Uh, I think that's what came out uh, in the case that, you know, um, if, if we conduct investigations without an open and inquiring mind, uh, without trying to get to find the truth, then we're not doing anything. Uh, it was the High Court and then uh, confirmed by the Supreme Court of Appeal. No, thank you. Uh, let's proceed. The, the Constitutional Court would have made an adverse finding uh, on, on that office, uh, on the Saab and CX matter, uh, on the South African Reserve Bank. Oh. Your voice is becoming softer. Okay, softer. on the South African Reserve Bank and CX matter, and and made the, the the point that the the investigation method is flawed. Um, as a deputy public protector, how would you assist uh, to help um, fix that? Can me to think, I lost the judgment some time ago. Let me remember what happened. Oh, yeah, I remember now. So, uh, what happened there, including, of course, the, the personal cost orders, which uh, were then, you know, successfully appealed to go back. But the court was raising, raising the issue, which we, we raised last time, that public protector must act within the law and, uh, and the Constitution. So, in the Sarah's matter, uh, the public protector was found to have exceeded her mandate by trying to subpoena uh, SARS when the, the law did not allow that at that particular time. That you know, you cannot. I'm, I'm referring to the South African Reserve Bank, SAP, and Sorry. CX matter. Sorry, I'm, I'm confused. Yeah, you're, you're, you're mixing them. <laughs> yeah, that's why I was SARS. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, the Reserve Bank again was the same issue that uh, you know, you should not um, exceed your powers uh, and make findings which are not provided by the law. Uh, and the law was very clear. Uh, you're, while you have a mandate uh, as a public protector to investigate anything, but you cannot go against another law which does not allow you to do that. So it was a similar principle with the SARS case. Sorry for confusing you. Thank you. Let's, let's proceed and go to the next point. I want you to assist me with the, what is the key difference from these two sentences that I'm going to read to you. Two? The two sentences that I'm going to read to you. And, and, and it, it's, uh, it's under chapter nine institution, the principle that govern those institutions. Uh, the first one says, these institutions are independent uh, and subject only to the constitution and the law. And the next point, uh, 5.3 says, chapter nine institutions are accountable to the National Assembly uh, and report on their activities and performance of their functions to the National Assembly once a year. Help me, what's different between the two? Or is it the same thing? Well, there are both provisions under Section 181 of the Constitution. Uh, that, you know, one, because I mean, in any case, you can't have uh, bodies which are not accountable to anybody. Uh, so Parliament is accountable, we're accountable to Parliament. But it does not mean, therefore, it's a contradiction to us being only accountable to the Constitution and the law. When we report to Parliament, we are reporting on how we have carried out our mandate, how we have used public resources. But Parliament cannot tell us what to do except through an act of Parliament, because we are independent. So uh, it might appear to be a contradiction, but it's not a contradiction as far as I'm concerned, because at the end of the day, Parliament represents the people of this country, and we have to be accountable to them because we're using their monies, we're implementing their laws. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? Uh, none.
Thank you very much, Advocate Tupanyana, for availing yourself. Uh, do you think that the, the interview was fair? Uh, it was better than last time, Chair. <laughs> Sorry? It was better than last time. It was better than last time. It was better than last time. <laughs> 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 it, it was fair. <laughs> this one, it was fair. This one was more fair than the other one. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, no, thank you very much. And maybe it's fair because I'm used to the committee now, so I guess maybe it's, it feels different. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you come for the first time, you are very uncomfortable, and yeah. you think all questions are being stones that's being thrown at you. So that's correct. Um, so thank you very much for really availing yourself. We don't take it lightly. And once more, apologies for the delays and the inconvenience caused. Thank you. And just to say, Chair, I spent many, many days reading on uh, the principles of legality. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Chair. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just keep it on. Good afternoon, Chupesi. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? Sorry, sorry. Um, I was saying, let me start by apologizing for the delay. It is as a result of what happened in the morning, which was beyond our control. Um, but we understand the inconvenience that it has caused you, and we would like to apologize. And you are supposed to have been interviewed at quarter past four. So we would really sincerely apologize for for the, this late uh, start uh, of the interviews. Thank you. So as a token of our being sorry, we would like to offer you water. <laughs> I've already sipped. <laughs> Thank you. It was expropriation without compensation. <laughs> Um, can you, in five minutes, tell us about yourself, your values, and why you are the right person to be the deputy public protector? Thank you, Chair uh, Good afternoon, uh, honorable members. I am an ad admitted advocate, and uh, I've been in the legal profession for a period of 25 years. I've practiced as an attorney, and uh, I've also uh, joined the NPA, where I've gained prosecutorial experience. So I've got both criminal and civil law experience. Uh, when I joined the NPA, the Directorate of Special Operations then, or the Scorpions, I had the opportunity of leading complex commercial investigations. Um, that is the totality of my experience. I hold the values, um, I consider myself as ethical, person with integrity, 
and honesty. And with those values are all I hold. The African values of Ubuntu, where in terms of which primary amongst others is to respect people. And if one is able to respect people, then you, you are able to respect human rights. With that experience and legal qualifications and the personal traits, I submit I am a fit and proper person to be appointed to the position of the DPP. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Can you please confirm your disclosure that you made in the questionnaire? Yes, I do. Is there anything that you want to add? Maybe to, uh, to put certain things in perspective, I have declared that there is a negative rating, a credit rating against my name in the form of net bank. Uh, that came in two strange ways. In the first place, it is a default judgment. That means I never had the opportunity to defend the matter. The, uh, the judgment was taken without me being served with the summons. I then had the opportunity, if that is the case, I can apply for a rescission of judgment. Oh. I could have elected to apply for a rescission of that judgment, but I did not because one of the defenses if you apply for a rescission of judgment is you must have a defense. It was a debt owing. So I could not say I don't owe the debt. I would have said I, I didn't get the opportunity to respond to the summons. But ultimately, I would have settled for an offer of settlement or agree on terms. So rather, when I became away, I, I spoke to the, the creditor, and in terms of not proceeding in executing that judgment, otherwise I'll exploit uh, the defenses that, I mean, the opportunity of having it rescinded, but I rather agree on the settlement terms. So, then we agreed on that part. But lastly, the other part, which was strange, um, I only realized the net bank did not receive the payments I made. And it was unknown to me that I was making payments to a closed account. That is why they proceeded. When, when the matter was referred to the attorneys, then the account was closed and I proceeded to pay into the, to that account until I became aware that a judgment has been taken. Now, how did I get to know about payments into a closed account? It only became known to me last year. When I made the same mistake, I was supposed to pay into my wife's account and I paid into that old account. And when I said, refund me, then my banker said, there is actually more than the 5,000 rand you want. And it appeared it was the payments I made that never reached NetBank. That's the judgment. Okay. Members, are there any questions? Honorable Master Wachele. Good afternoon, Honorable Chair. I also have uh, one or two questions for you, but I think it's, it's a question that you asked. Honorable Chair. Is the question that you have answered in, 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 in the questionnaire that you, you received? Uh, I want you to elaborate or also um, 
talk to that response that you have given us. It is a, a question uh, talks about why do you believe uh, you are the right person for this position of the deputy public protector? If maybe you can uh, elaborate on that. At the risk of repeating myself, I've stated that I have the requisite qualifications. I have the necessary personal traits or qualities, such as integrity, accountability, and uh, a sense of fairness. And with those values, my personal values of upholding and paying allegiance to the Constitution, then I consider myself as appropriate for the candidate that should be appointed because I am acutely aware that our democracy was not attained on a silver platter. It was through sacrifices. And it is only fair and good that it should be strengthened and supported. And that is where my conviction lies. Thank you. Thank you. What is uh, the mandate of uh, the Public Protective Office? It is to strengthen and support democracy and ensure good governance in public administration. You, 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 you want to be a public uh, protector, a deputy public protector. There are challenges that uh, uh, the country is experiencing currently. And uh, it, it is one of the questions that you were offered to, to respond to on the question too. So you mentioned a few of those. Yes, uh, I did. Uh, uh, with the experience that you have, how do you envisage that uh, you use that experience in order to assist in, in, in the office to deal with those uh, challenges? I have mentioned, I think I mentioned about three of the challenges of our country. One being poverty, um, crime, corruption in particular, as well as the lack of uh, service delivery. In my experience, it is more on the application of the law. So my contribution as a DPP would be the proper interpretation and the application of the law as it relates to those challenges. If one looks at, I think I mentioned, that if you look at poverty, for instance, the DPP or the public protector does not have a program of uh, poverty alleviation. But the government has institutions that are set up to deal with those things, and they are based on law. So mine is to ensure that I hold those institutions accountable and deliver on the promises. Thank you, Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Honorable Mola. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, good, uh, it's good what now? First in the afternoon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you are a Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions. That's correct. Uh, who has served the prosecuting authority for a number of years now, with a vast experience. That's correct. Uh, you mentioned, amongst other key problems in the country, as crime and corruption. 
Why are you leaving the prosecuting authority? Because it is my belief that uh, that is the most potent sharpshooter against the two problems as compared to the mandate of the public protector South Africa. Um, it is so that um, the NPA is at the forefront of um, or dealing with corruption or the prosecution of corruption. And as much as the public protector has that mandate, but it would be more limited in the sense that if you would discover uh, impropriety or corruption, you would uh, refer it uh, to the NPA for prosecution. I think the reason why I would leave the NPA is for personal growth and uh, take on a new challenge and serve the country in another capacity. But I'm still within uh, the service of the state. Uh, that, that is basically the reason. Okay. In uh, page five in the questionnaire, when you are asked why do you think that you can be a better deputy protector, you mention amongst the things you mentioned there, you said you are a fit and proper person. That is correct. Uh, what are the features of a fit and proper person? I have alluded to those uh, qualities. <coughs> a fit and proper person, there is no definition in our law. Our courts haven't defined uh, fit and proper, but they have uh, considered certain factors, uh, factual and value and make it value judgment. But the qualities would be the integrity, which I submit I hold. It's uh, scrupulous honesty and accountability. Those values I do hold. I hold them not because of uh, you, you go to school in order to acquire those but you grow up and they are intrinsic in you as a human being. And I hope those values. Okay. Thank you. Njeng Wom Chuchi is on experience that is more than 20 years. Have you ever handled a complex case or a complex matter? Or have you ever been involved in a complex investigation or a high profile case? Uh, if the answer is in the affirmative, would you please share that uh, with the committee? I have um, been involved in the prosecution of a complex commercial matter. In fact, I've, I've, uh, the first matter I, I dealt with involved the administration, the Western Cape administration then. It was a matter that I dealt with while I was in the DSO in the Scorpions. It was quite a complex one, and I have also led a complex investigation and prosecuted that matter in the High Court. Um, it involved fraud against the South African Revenue Services and a common fraud statute three uh, contraventions of uh, company laws. So it was uh, that I've done. I have also been part of the prosecution of a high profile matter, the one that was known as the travel gate. I was one of the prosecutors in that matter. Okay, last, the last one. Because you are from NPA, I am sure you must be very familiar with the protection of whistleblowers. Yes. Uh, do you think that the public protector South Africa 
is currently doing enough work in ensuring that whistleblowers are protected? Well, I would say it's uh, doing enough, but I would not apportion that solely to the public protector. I think the problem is in the legislation itself. The loopholes are in the legislation. One, uh, for instance, is that if a person, a whistleblower, is ultimately dismissed because the law does not prescribe dismissal. So if a person is dismissed, then the law or the, the Protected Disclosures Act provides that the person can go through the courts or the CCMA. And that employee would be on his own or her own. So that is where the one of the loopholes. So that one cannot apportion to the public protector. So you would propose a legislative amendment to that effect? The, the considerations of uh, legislative amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Breitenbach. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, uh, Honorable Breitenbach. Um, you say that you were part of the prosecution team for the Travelgate matter? That is correct. Did you lead any evidence? <laughs> I did not, um, but we entered into 105. There was 105. Uh, 105A. Agreement. Section 105. 105A. Yes. Okay. And who was the lead prosecutor? Jan van Fieren. Okay. Uh, while you were with the Scorpions, what rank did you hold? I held both. Uh, I joined the DSO as a senior state advocate, mm -hmm. and I progressed through the ranks. I became the deputy director of public prosecutions. Okay. And uh, can you tell me about one matter that you, you yourself prosecuted as the lead prosecutor and what the facts were? Just very briefly, please. Um, one is the, it was called NISEC, but it is the Cape Provincial Administration, where there was uh, fraud involving um, the cash paymaster. I prosecuted that um, for the, there was manipulation of the contracts leading to the award of the tender to the cash paid master. That is what I prosecuted. And the quantum? It was in the, I think seven, it's quite a substantial amount, I think 350 or 75 million rand, I think. 75 million? Yeah. And the uh, sentence? Um, it. No, no, no. There was no conviction. There was no conviction. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, madam. Honorable Horn. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, sir. Good um, afternoon, Honorable Horn. Firstly, just want to clarify something with you. In your questionnaire, you say that you obtained the BPROC degree from the University of the Western Cape in 1993, mm -hmm. and then the LLB from the University of the Western Cape in 1994. Yes. But if I have a look at your, your CV as supplied to, to the committee, uh, I see certificates for a BPROC Indeed, in 1993, but the Baccalaureus Legum only in 2004. That, that must be an error on my part. So my the error is then on your questionnaire? In the questionnaire, yes. Uh, then I want to go to also to another part of your questionnaire. Um, You've already referred to, to that, uh, I think, in, in some of your previous answers, the fact that you think that um, 
unemployment and poverty um, is, is um, some of the biggest issues that is facing our country and which must be addressed via the public protector or in your capacity as the deputy public protector. Um, what in terms of our constitution is the functions of the public protector? Um, the functions of the public protector is to uh, to strengthen <laughs> and support constitutional democracy. I understand that that's broadly the function of all of the chapter nine bodies. Yes. But in chapter nine, the constitution, in in fairly simple terms give the public protector the authority and the duty to deal with specific matters that, that's, that's correct. that can hamper our constitutional democracy. Which are those? It's, one is maladministration mm. and the failures, uh, which would be the impropriety. Those are the issues that uh, the public protector can actually get involved in. Okay. So if you want to be a crusader uh, around unemployment and poverty, how would that align with the constitutional role that has been allocated to the office of the public protector? The, the constitutional mandate of the public protector is to investigate maladministration, the failures um, to deliver on those services. All right. Service delivery, it's within the mandate of the public protector. Now, if there is a finding, non-delivery of the services, it is within the mandate of the public protector to bring to the awareness of the people that should have received those services that you're not getting services. It is within the mandate of the public protector to hold the institution that is supposed to deliver on those services, to hold that institution accountable. It is in that aspect. And then one last question, if I have time. Is every failure, uh, let's say, a, a failure to be able to deliver all services on the part of government invariably caused by maladministration? Not necessarily. Uh, I wouldn't say that. There's quite a number of uh, factors uh, that affects non delivery uh, hence, it would be incumbent on the public protector to engage the institution or the state organ that is not delivering to exactly establish what the, the blockages are. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Honorable Horn. Honorable Neuwurstruchen. Thank you, Chairperson, and good afternoon, advocates. Uh, I'm Wilma Neo Druchen. I use South African Sign Language. The voice that you are hearing is uh, my sign language interpreter, Trudy. Good um, I, you, You've answered the first question I wanted to ask, so I'll go to my second question. Do you think that the public protector is making an impact on the lives of the of ordinary people and if you are appointed as the deputy public protector how how would you m make more sure that there's an impact from the public protector side on the people of south africa yes i think it does i mean the public protector does make an impact on the lives of our people that there's more transparency and um, 
the remedial action that the public protector takes, they actually contribute to the corrections of the wrongs. And in that way, the lives of our people are impacted. Mine would be to fortify the gains made by the public protector and move forward. Thank you, thank you. The public awareness or uh, ordinary people on the ground knowing about the work of the public protector, do you think that is enough or what more can be done to ensure that information and awareness goes down to the public about the role of the public protector? I think there's more that can be done um, in reaching out to the communities, it is a constitutional mandate of the public protector to be accessible to all communities. And one way I would think I would do that is to work closely with community-based organizations. Uh, that is where the people are. It's not... Um, for the elite, in which case people with smartphones, they would be able to access or know about the public protector. But there are certain areas where you would need to go have public awarenesses uh, and make the public protector known and the services that it renders. Great. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Advocate. Thank you, Honorable Mkwebana. Thank you, um, Mr. Bunguzana. Afternoon. Good afternoon, Honorable Mkoban. Um, the issue of uh, whistleblower uh, protection. I remember there's one case we did as public protector um, of Cheryl Zondi, and there was a report which was issued because um, I think it's Section 10 which uh, says um, the victim or the whistleblower should be protected in such a way that you might as well protect them, not remove them from their habitable space, but you can protect them in other way, uh, manner, which the NPA failed to, to, to do because that's their responsibility. So when you speak about amending the whistleblower <coughs> legislation, what, what is there to amend? I actually highlighted one example. Um, the protection, I mean, this act deals with, for instance, if we look at an employer and employee relationship, okay. it protects the employee or supposedly protect that employee from victimization. And when that victimization takes place, the employee is on his or her own. That is the example I made. And um, so there isn't adequate protection. Okay. There isn't protection even after the court proceedings. There is no counseling uh, provided for in the act. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The issue of uh, the Section 105A agreement, how did you do that with the case you've mentioned? All right. Um, how in the sense, Yoguchi, did you just sign an agreement that, okay, you'll pay so much and then nothing is happening, or there was a, a, a kind of saying, uh, you are accepting this responsibility and therefore um, we allow you to pay so much? It is in the nature of the Section 105A, uh, 105 capital letter A mm. agreement that there must be an admission on the part of the accused. Of guilt, ne? You admit guilt. Now there is this ABB matter of the NPA where ABB was never obligated to admit guilt, 
but they just offer to pay money. I am not conversant with the facts of the ABB matter, but it is highly unlikely that the court would accept a plea if there is no admission of guilt. Okay. Because ultimately it's a guilty plea. All right, that's what happened, I'm just telling you. The backlogs of cases, because it's the same thing which is happening in the power protector, how would you make sure as the power protector that you deal with backlog matters? Because that's what currently in the district court, there's 26,000 backlog cases, regional court, 24,000, mm. high court, 306 backlog. And I mean, similar applies to the private protector. You find that there's a lot of matters which needs to be dealt with. What strategy would you bring on board to deal with those? One, I would come with prioritization of matters. Um, that's how you, you deal with the backlog. You have dedicated capacity to deal with those matters. I think that in that way, it would uh, alleviate the, the backlog. And as the deputy public protector, currently how many people are reporting to you? I've got about seven, seven, eight senior state advocates. Uh, how would you deal with a state advocate or with this executive manager who fails to check the quality of the work or even does not disclose the whole section uh, rule 53 record when you are taken to court? Dealing with a, a non-compliance or that in that situation, one is to investigate the reasons for non-compliance or the, the, the quality of the work that you get. And if it is something that relates to training or capacity, then you would, I would capacitate the individual. But if information is withheld with ulterior motives, then that, call, that calls for disciplinary action. I will take those steps. Coming to the deputy public protector, would you go on in public, because you are delegated to work by the public protector, and dispute whatever the public protector has said or a decision which the public protector has taken? That would be an improper conduct, I would not do that. But if I'm not happy with the public protector, I would engage the public protector and air my views rather than go to the public. The public would not solve anything. Thanks. The section six, subsection nine of the public protector. Currently the public is complaining that the public protector office is closing a lot of matters because they are saying, no, this matter happened two years prior the incident. But the public protector has a discretion to do that and knowing the issues of uh, unemployment, issues of uh, illiteracy and all those. What would you do to make sure that these investigators are not, or their managers are not just closing matters willy-nilly to the detriment of the public? Well, you, in as much as the public protector is entitled to refuse to take those matters, but you also look at the merits. Uh, you don't just say, no, it's uh, two years and uh, so on. But I would consider the, 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 the merits. And also, what is important is the communication. Make people understand your decision and ensure that you are able to explain your decision. That is what I would do. Thanks, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? <laughs> uh, no, thank you very much, uh, Advocate uh, Bumuzana. Thank you very much for availing yourself. Uh, did you find the interview to be fair? 
It would be fair if I am favorably confident. <laughs> <laughs> but on a serious note, yes, I'm, I'm quite happy. And, and were the questions fair? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for really for availing yourself and once again apologies for the delays and the inconvenience it caused. We know that it is not nice to stay the whole day with that levels of anxieties. We really apologize. Thank you. Thank you very much. My excuse. Thank you. Members, I think uh, it will be proper that uh, we deliberate next week after we have received that considered legal opinion. I think that is our decision in the morning. Honorable Engelbrecht. Uh, I was trying to get your attention. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I was proposing that we deliberate next week uh, after we have received that legal opinion as, as we requested in the morning. Uh, Honorable Janji. No, thanks, Chair. No, I firmly is suggest therefore that that meeting be on Tuesday, that deliberations. We're receiving it on Monday um, so that it doesn't stay open-ended. I don't know what's the date on Tuesday, uh, but the sooner we do it, the better. There seems to be some logistical problems for Tuesday. There is a plenary in the morning, and there uh, a debate on the Human Rights Day. And in most cases, they would ask some of the members in this committee to debate the Human Rights Day. And then uh, there is also questions to the president in the afternoon. Tuesday. And we also have to look at this request, in fact, uh, from the speaker. No, I'm, I'm bringing the two matters because I think both informations are important for us to make a, a decision. Um, because um, I think members received that invitation from the minister for the, what is this thing, uh, the human, the 30 years of uh, a human rights. But subsequent to that, then there was a request from the speaker uh, that, certain, that uh, certain members should accompany her to, to that uh, meeting whatever it is, universal or whatever it is. Um, it is on Tuesday, no? Yes, it's Monday and Tuesday, Wednesday, Ah. Huh. It's the, the workshop about the human rights issues. The workshop about the human rights issues is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So I thought that I must bring all of those things so that members will have a, an informed discussion. Um, we have already received um, Apologies from Honorable Horn, Honorable Bredenbach, Honorable Engelbrecht, Honorable Swart, that they will not be available for that particular workshop. 
but generally, even in case if we receive more apologies, the expectation, especially from the speaker, is that the chair must be there. So I, I thought I must bring everything so that uh, people can have an uh, uh, we can have an intelligent discussion. Yeah, I support that. <laughs> and, and whoever is available, that you can receive my apologies. But now it has got a bearing on the discussion. That is my that is the main issue. That's what you say. It's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then on Tuesday, do we have a sitting in the morning? Wednesday? On Wednesday? Wednesday is open. Wednesday is open. Why, so why not Wednesday? Yeah. So if you don't have to be there all the days on Monday? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's different. Yeah. Yeah. So if we don't sleep Tuesday, the dinner is until five. So if you give me a seat Tuesday. Okay. Okay. Can we have deliberations on Wednesday? Honorable uh, Janji? I support that, Chair. Yes. And then, so we will meet on Wednesday. It's a virtual meeting. Yes. Uh, it will be a virtual meeting. Uh, I know that there are people who would like to go to, to their human rights anniversary or workshop. Uh, can we deal with that matter outside of the meeting so that we don't imprison people who, who, who would not want to? But what it means is that uh, people might need accommodation, so the Secretariat will deal with those things. We'll identify how many people are going there, and the Secretariat will deal with those issues. Um, then. Are we fine with this one? Uh, we are fine with this one. Then the other challenge that we have experienced is that we have been informed that on the 26th, uh, we will not be given permission to sit because the house is sitting in the morning. In the morning. And for the rest of the day? So we are only there on the 27th. The following week, it's a good Friday, and then the only open day is the 27th. But then we have to apply for the city all day on the 27th. But then we have to apply for the The challenge that we have um, is that we will not be allowed to sit on a Wednesday. Tuesday. Okay, six. Tuesday. Tuesday, the house starts in the morning. Uh, it will be dealing with a number of bills, including the Division of Revenue bill. So it's a whole. So it's a, it's, it's for the whole day. Uh, then we only have the 27th. Uh, that will be before Good Friday. Um, so we would like guidance from the meeting. 
remember the, the, the decision of the meeting is that you must have a two-day meeting for the Tabo Pesta matter. Um, already on the 26th, it's out. It's the 27th. And then on the 28th, it's question to the deputy president and the house starts in the morning. I don't know which program, because the one I'm looking at, unless it's, I don't know, but it's a recent one. 26, it's a hybrid or four, in general, or two. And then, unless I change it. And then, the place where we start, nine o'clock, the deputy, the deputy, the deputy, the deputy. They will require, I think there's an updated one. Um, afternoon members, we have been alerted during the course of the day that there's a change that's going to emanate from Thursday's programming, uh, influencing the Tuesday of the 26th to have a plenary in the morning, but that program is not out yet, hence the 26th is then out. So it's only the 27th that is now available for, 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 for us to see, because on, on Thursday, that same week, the house starts in the morning and then it's Good Friday. So if the available time now is only Wednesday in the morning would have most likely applied to sit during the whole day. But that unfortunate event we were I was informing Chess that if we adopt next week the this report it might be scheduled in one of those days for members to to debate this report about these interviews that we've just had held. So we don't know when will they be tabled. That's the unfortunate position I enjoy. Uh, Honorable Ramulu Beng is suggesting that we meet on a good Friday. <laughs> 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 so, 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 can we then uh, check uh, on the two days we budgeted? Is there any single day that is available to us? Because we could then stretch that day and deal with that, what we would have dealt with in two days, we'll stretch that and have a longer day like today and, and be done with the issue. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen the new program, but the previous program said that Thursday the 28th, it's the morning until half past 11. Has that also changed? Because otherwise we could meet on, uh, on the 28th in the afternoon, but it's a day before Good Friday, so I don't know. Honorable Breckenbach. Uh, I can see that the TA is having a very uh, hilarious caucus there. starts on the 22nd of March this year and runs until the 30th. What is that? Pesach. It's the it's Jewish Passover. Okay. Yeah. So I have, I have difficulty on some of the days, not all of them. So, for instance, the 22nd is impossible for me. Yes. Uh, and the 29th would be, well, no, the 30th is impossible. The rest I can manage. 22nd and 29th. Are they important? The rest I can work. Yeah. 
and uh, from the evening of the twenty rather the evening of the twenty-second. Then the issue would be how do we ensure that we have a program that is going to accommodate all of us one way or the other. Because those are, those are I mean, we, we, we know uh, that that uh, is an important religious holiday uh, days for you. And Honorable Ramulu Beng's Good Friday is important for her. Uh, then how do we ensure that this program with all these things that are outstanding, uh, it's adjusted. Well, Jay, for most for most part, you can ignore the Jewish holidays because Jewish holidays start at six o'clock at night, and not during the daytime. So it's from six o'clock at night. So it should not affect the program. Okay. Um, but we might. Uh, the reality is that now we might have one day um, for the type of pastor matter. Yeah, we stretch the day. Jay, we can't compromise on our work. We need two days for that matter. No, People must suggest where are we going to get it. Still Parliament, no. the, still Parliament that Chair, they can't interfere with we, the work we, of the committee. The, the table pesta matter has been programmed with a, a, a properly an itemized and, and, and so I mean, I've seen in the emails that the uh, the, there's a, a letter from the speaker about issues of summons that is requested or from the yeah. from G4S. Yeah. So we've got to attend to those issues as well. But I, depending on how we structure that program, because remember we discuss and we we agreed on the, on the areas of focus, uh, which has already been sent has been sent to all of them to prepare. Uh, yeah. Before such a meeting, all of those submissions will be with us. And so for the day, you're going to be left in focusing on, on issues and gaps that are not as part of those answers. So it might not even need a, a two-day because we have agreed on those areas. And I, don't, I, I can't see them not happening uh, uh, in an extended uh, one day. Uh, can you hear him at the back? The issue is that uh, his, uh, the, I think his argument is that uh, we are going to be sending information or requesting information beforehand uh, because we have adopted the focus areas and people need to come to and reply to those specifics and submit. Um, was the issue would be that after the 28th, we would need approval from the chief whips to sit, because generally the house would have been adjourned for campaigning. And generally, chief whips don't, I mean, we have been, we have traveled this road before. It's very difficult. In fact, it's near impossible, especially now that uh, people are required to be on the ground doing the campaigning. So these are the challenges that we are faced with in terms of the program. I think all of us here would want to finalize this matter before we adjourn. And that's why we had uh, pro uh, program it for the 26 and 27. And we are told now that we can't for that state because of the Division of Revenue Bill that starts in the morning uh, and is for the whole day. They won't allow us to not to be in the house. Um, Honorable Horn, Honorable Engelbrecht. Yeah, Chair, on that last issue, I don't even think that it's feasible for us to, even if permission is maybe given, to conduct this business after Parliament has risen, because this Parliament is 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 is, um, is dissolved by the time of the election, so there will be no further opportunity to take that report to the House. Um, 
I don't know whether that matter has been considered at all. Uh, I think as we are raising issues, but let's let's make proposals and suggestions as to how we move forward. We are in a fix now. We would like to get uh, solutions on our behalf. Mr. Chair, since there seems to be no other dates available and we would like a report to serve before Parliament before it rises, um, maybe because it is exceptional circumstances, we can apply to um, sit on Monday the 25th. And I know normally we don't sit on a Monday, but then we'll have a Monday. The 26th we can't sit, but the 27th we can. So there's a day in between that, you know, you can go through your documents or whatever, and then the 27th we can conclude our meeting and maybe there'll be still some time for a report to go to Parliament. I don't know. My only difficulty is if it's Monday the 21st, it's Human Rights Day. Okay, Monday the 25th. Um, there's, there's a program for Monday the 25th. Mm, good morning. Good morning. Okay. There's a proposal of Monday the 25th and and the 27th. Uh, Honorable Mola. Thanks, Chair. Then, oh, sorry, we, uh, sorry, we Honorable Yano. Uh, yes. uh, I think he will cover me after hearing what Honorable. Then, Honorable Yano is bringing a different discussion which we forgot about. Because we have all been discussing on when to visit mm -hmm. and forgot on when to we then report to the house. Mm -hmm. And it does look like che, there is no time at all. I'm not sure we'll die if we defer this thing to the seventh parliament. No, you won't. Well, who's going to die? Nobody. <laughs> I think... it, 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 the more we discuss, the more it becomes practically impossible. Even if we go and deliberate on the 27th or the 26th, still it won't go to the House. Mm. Still it will be deferred to the Seventh Parliament anyway. Mm. So who's going to die, Chair? Honorable Pretemba. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> She's going to die. Boom, <laughs> <laughs> boom. Boom, boom. Would you like me to come give you a slap? <laughs> Do you think that I can't give you a slap, little man? <laughs> <laughs> let's sleep on it. Le yeah, let's sleep on it. I can see members are very tired. Let's sleep on it. No, let's let's sleep on it, member. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. No, let's let's sleep on it. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I can see. Uh, with the levels of discussions, we, we can't take matter fa these matters further. <laughs> Let, let's, uh, next week, I think we'll, we'll finalize the issue. Uh, uh, members, um, for go those going to want to go to Johannesburg, uh, they will conduct the secretariat, the meeting is adjourned.